Good morning. This meeting is now resumed. Members, please join me in a moment of silence to remember Nicholas Brooks. Thank you. We have a presentation this morning to recognize the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Tokyo 2020 Paralympic medalists from Toronto. I would like to call upon Mayor Tory for the presentation. Well, Speaker and uh, colleagues, good morning. Uh, I'm honored to welcome some very special meetings, uh, special guests today to our city council meeting and I very much regret the fact, as I think we all do, that uh, we're not able to uh, welcome you in person, uh, but you are welcome uh, nonetheless and perhaps we'll find another occasion in the sort of fully post-pandemic uh, period to have you come and uh, visit with us and uh, to be able to sort of be in the same room as each other because it would certainly be our honor to have you. Uh, in the same room as us. But uh, we had, as, as I think you probably know, members know, uh, an unprecedented number of uh, Torontonians who uh, were Olympians uh, in this past uh, Olympics, who traveled to the Olympics and represented uh, our country, but were from uh, our city. And that is for both the Olympics and the Paralympic uh, Games. Um, each of the athletes joining us virtually today have called Toronto home uh, and brought home a medal for Canada. And so, and they're not uh, the complete list of all of those who fit into those categories for the Olympics and the Paralympics, but they're those who are able to join us today and we're very grateful for the fact that you have. Uh, and uh, as I say, regretful at the fact that it has to be in this uh, rather odd manner that we're doing a lot of things nowadays, but I'm sure for you as well, in terms of some of the celebrations you have or have not been able to experience, uh, some of them have been this way, uh, just because of the prevailing health circumstances. But uh, nonetheless, would you please join me, uh, members of council in welcoming Aaron Brown, a uh, bronze medalist from the men's 4x100 relay team, uh, Jenna Kyra and Joey Lai, members of the bronze medal winning women's softball team, uh, Paralympian uh, Marissa Papaconstantinou, a bronze medalist in the women's uh, T64 100 meter sprint, and Sydney Payne, a member of the gold winning uh, women, women's eight rowing team. And I will just say that the main purpose of this uh, is to, uh, in as far okay, way as second. we can, in these circumstances, uh, say congratulations once, yeah. on your outstanding achievement. Um, you have made us proud, and in particular, made Toronto proud. And I hope if you're able to be uh, connected to us in the proper manner and see us, uh, you can see us uh, give you a round of applause because I think that, that is, uh, those are accomplishments, you and your teammates, that are um, well worth um, us uh, celebrating, and in particular, making this city celebrating because you were and are people who have a connection uh, to Toronto. Um, what I'd now like to do is to share a short uh, video uh, showcasing these athletes and a few other medalists from Toronto that could not be with us today. And after that, we're going to hear from one of these athletes that will represent the others in saying a few words uh, to us. So let's have a look at that video.
So thank you for that. And I think as members of council can see, uh, these athletes achieved extraordinary accomplishment, uh, accomplishments uh, on behalf of our country and on behalf of our city during what were extraordinary times. If you think about the postponement of the games uh, and all of the other complications that arose out of uh, the pandemic period that we're in, and they emerged uh, to stand uh, on the podium uh, in many cases. And of course, you've seen those who were not able to be with us today uh, joining those who are able to be with us. Just earning a place on the Canadian team, I think as members of council will know, is not an easy feat. In fact, it's an incredibly difficult thing that involves years and years of training, countless hours of hard work, uh, and uh, sacrifices for many years to become a world-class athlete uh, eligible to go to the Olympics, leave alone one uh, who achieves success at the Olympics or the Paralympics. I know that the uh, Olympics and Paralympics this year were particularly difficult in the middle of a pandemic and it brought about a whole new different set of challenges which I can hardly imagine. We saw some of it on television, uh, but I want to thank you, uh, the athletes that are here with us today and through you, the others who represented Toronto and Canada at the Olympics and the Paralympics for finding the determination and the resiliency and the courage and the stick to itness um, to power through all of that and to compete and to uh, achieve uh, what you did uh, on your own behalf, but also on behalf of our country. Uh, Team Canada brought home 21 Paralympic uh, medals and a record 24 Olympic medals from Tokyo. And in fact, these medal winners are part of a historic uh, moment for Canadian Olympic sports as Canada won the most medals this year since the 1984 Los Angeles Summer Games. And so um, I want to just say again to you on behalf of us all, and on behalf of a very grateful uh, and appreciative city, um, the three million people who live here, because you have a connection to our city uh, that makes us even more proud of you than we would have been if you'd come from anywhere else, because we're proud of all of our Olympians and Paralympians. Uh, congratulations, and I would like to invite uh, Jenna Kyra uh, to say a few words on behalf of the Olympians that uh, we have here joining us today. Jenna, I hope you're out there and connected and have managed to hear all this, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Hi, thank you, Mayor Tory. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with you and members of council today uh, and be joined by my fellow Team Canada athletes. Growing up in Ontario, I had the opportunity to play softball and travel to different communities around the province. Many of my fondest memories take place on the field, as I'm sure many of the other athletes here can relate. Sport gives us a chance to create wonderful uh, friendships with people. And if you're lucky, uh, play alongside them at the highest level. I have known Joey Lai, a member of our women's national team, who is here today since I was 12 years old. We even played together at the 2015 Pan American Games in Toronto, where we won gold. Our province and our city rallied together to create one of the best international events I have ever been a part of. COVID-19 may have made these last couple of years difficult for many, uh, but one thing that it did for our athletes was to push us out of our comfort zones and think outside the box. We pivoted and looked at obstacles as challenges to make sure that our dream stayed alive. But as we all know, it takes a village to reach our dreams. And Toronto stepped up once again for my teammates and I to ensure that we safely had access to training accommodations when possible. The Olympic experience was a dream come true, regardless if it may have looked a little different this time around. Team Canada athletes and support staff were proud to represent our country and knew it was a privilege to be in Japan during these unprecedented times. Even without fans, we felt support from Canadians back home and continue to have that feeling as we get to celebrate here together today. So thank you for your continued support in high performance athletics. It is an exciting time for sports in Canada as more medals are won. Uh, it is the commitment from our government and our fans across the country that helps make our dreams come true and to achieve those things. Thank you for your dedication to ensuring that high performance sport continues to compete and flourish while inspiring our next generation in the years to come. Thank you. Jenna, thank you very much for those inspiring words and for those words of, uh, of, of gratitude because uh, we, are, uh, stand, we do stand as a city behind you and all the other people who are striving to become 
uh, athletes and uh, and uh, of, of of world recognition. And speaking of which, uh, it is now time to hear from Marissa Papa Constantinou, uh, and she is going to speak on behalf of the Paralympians who also uh, did us so proud. So, Melissa, Marissa, rather, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mayor John Tory, and uh, I just want to say that throughout the entire experience, um, myself and all of my fellow athletes, we've felt the amazing support back from the city. I know that when I was off competing in Tokyo, um, I definitely felt that that love and that um, support, even though there weren't able to have any fans um, at the games. And, you know, of course, that it it was definitely a very challenging experience trying to navigate high performance sport during a pandemic and, you know, ensuring that we were the best prepared that we possibly could given the different challenges. And, you know, I uh, want to say thank you to the city of Toronto, of course, for realizing the importance of high performance sport and putting us in the best position to uh, be able to prepare for Tokyo while all of our high performance facilities were able to remain open during the lockdown. That was definitely um, a huge relief when uh, we were trying to train. And so uh, just given, again, all the challenges, I think that Canadian Olympians and Paralympians were really uh, actually well prepared in a sense for this games because we throughout the pandemic learned how to adapt and we learned how to be really flexible with different challenges when they arose. And I think that just when that came down to competing at the games, uh, regardless of what kind of popped up along the way, we were prepared the best way possible. So I just want to thank you all for your support and uh, just having a whole city behind you means means a lot. And I'm very proud to have, be a born and raised in Scarborough. And so, uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you again. Marissa, thank you. And uh, we're very proud of the association that all of you Olympians and Paralympians have had with uh, the city of Toronto and proud that you represented uh, we like to look at it that you represented our country, of course, but represented our city as well and did so well. And we want to just again congratulate you on your remarkable achievements. And it's wholly inadequate. I just feel this is all inadequate, but it's the best we can do right now to to have you together in this way as opposed to here with us at uh, Toronto City Hall. But, and this is wholly inadequate too, but I hope you can see on your screen, uh, if you can, uh, the gallery view of uh, all of us and we'll just give you uh, a round of applause right now for what you've achieved so that you know uh, that that's, that's the best we can do uh, in the prevailing circumstances. Um, I think not only will your accomplishments stand to your own credit uh, as Olympians and Paralympians, but they will inspire uh, young kids across the city. Uh, who are today taking up a sport, which is so important to us, and we're, we try to be as supportive of it as we possibly can. Uh, and I think that's true in this city, but it's also true across the country that your achievements will uh, inspire them, and you inspire us. Uh, so thank you very much again for taking the time to join us today, and uh, we wish you good luck, and we will continue to support you in your endeavors and all of your teammates uh, as we go forward, because it's very important to the well-being of our city and our country and the people who live here. So thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Members, we will now review and confirm the order paper. There are 70 items left on the agenda, including 47 member motions. Council will consider the member motions run through at 2 p.m. Council has decided to consider item PH 2510 on new framework for multi-tenant houses as the first item after members' motions. I will now take the release of holds. Please put your name on the list if you have an item to release. So I, there's a couple of items that Councillor Robinson has asked me to release. Uh, one is EC 2414, Toronto Fire Services uh, service level. On favor, show of hands, carried. And another item that Councillor Robinson has asked that I released is IE 2411 Blue Box Regulation. On favor, show of hands, carried. Councillor Bailao. Speaker, I can release PH 26.1. I do have a motion 
put some amendments um, that staff had asked me to place. So if that can be considered a quick item, I'm ready to release it. Um, I'm sorry, which item was it? PH 26.1. It just sent me. Madam Chair, can you ask members to read out the title of the item for the rest of council and for the public? I'm sorry, Count uh, Deputy. Oh, okay. What is the practice of uh, council and of members to read out the, the full title of the item so the public knows what we're talking about and so members know what we're talking about? Yes. So just let me, hold on, let me just. So Councillor Bylaw, can you read out the title? Um, I, I can't because, well, let me see if I can go. Okay, never mind. Oh, sorry, Madam Speaker, my, I'm just having problems with my computer just rebooting. Gonna have to give me a second. Yeah, so it's PH 26.1 Community Improvement Plan for the Renovation of Commercial Properties. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, the motion is on the screen. Okay, on the amendment. On favor, show of hands, carried. Item is amended. On favor, show of hands, carried. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Mr. Speaker, I can release uh, EC 24.5, proposed new film permit fees and amendment to City of Toronto Municipal Code Chapter 441, fees and charges, if I can simply say a few words about it. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that uh, the film board has endorsed introducing charging for permits and it will be used to support the current workforce development initiatives in the BIPOC communities. These initiatives have the unions and the guilds firmly behind it and are a strong part of it. We were recently introduced uh, a program, the mayor was in um, North York to do that at the IATC headquarters. As well, it will be used to enhance the greening of the film industry, power drops to be used on downtown streets and parks rather than diesel fuel, and two of them will be installed this year. With this, we can add more. And uh, as the industry grows, the film board recognizes that workforce development, more permit coordinators, greening of the industry, and increased community in uh, outreach are essential to the industry's success. It will keep us competitive here in Toronto, and I very happy that we've done the work to get the support in the industry for this because there wasn't support a number of years ago and this will now allow us to be even more effective as a tremendous industry that has a production volume of 2.2 billion dollars in the city of Toronto and employs 35,000 people and has managed to go through all of COVID COVID free except I think for one uh, one person so this is great uh, thank you very much to the staff and to the film board members for their work on getting us this across the finish line. Thank you, Speaker. With that, I'll move it. Thank you. On the item, all in favor? Show of hands. Opposed, if any, Recorded, please, uh, Speaker, sorry, could I get a recorded vote on that? Thank recorded you. Recorded vote.
Councillor Matlow, could we have your vote verbally, please? Thank you. Yeah, it didn't show up on the screen. I'm in support. Thank you. Councillor Mantos, could we have your vote verbally, please? The affirmative. Thank you. Speaker, the uh, item carries unanimously. 23 in favor. Thank, thank you. Do we have any further releases? Okay. Um, I would like to move um, uh, timed item, um, GL 2519, no fault grant for basement flooding following the item for the framework for multi-tenant houses. All in favor, show of hands, carry. Thank you. What was the motion, Speaker? I'm sorry, I missed that. Don't have this. Uh, GL 2519, I'm moving it that we deal with it uh, following the framework, framework for multi-tenant houses, following the, uh, um, I see. the member's motion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning. Um, I had requested this Friday that uh, after your, your motion there, uh, 3636 Enhanced Street Replacement Stretch for Dwight Avenue Sidewalk Installation. Can I move that we move that after your item uh, this afternoon? Yes, yeah, so uh, Councillor Grimes, once we get to the member's motion, then you can move that. Oh. Well, I'm going to hold it down, Madam Speaker. I'd like to a question that. So, can I deal with that after your item? Okay. So, what we, do, yeah, two o'clock when we go through the members' motion, you can hold the item down, and then move that we deal with it following the, those motions. Okay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor of adopting the order paper, show of hands. Opposed, if any, carry. So we'll now deal with um, NY 25.1. Councillor Carroll, you held the item down. Uh, zoning bylaw amendment uh, for 625, 627 Shepherd Avenue East and Grand Briar Road. Council. Yes, Madam Speaker, and, oh, sorry. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, the, uh, the, the motion that uh, we were waiting for should be with the clerks now. Yeah. Essentially, it, uh, uh, Monica, do they have the motion? Can you just come in and get me back on CFP, please? Oh, there it is. Uh, it appears on the portal now. Madam Speaker, this is a, a, a long motion, but essentially so that uh, councillors don't have to speed read it. Essentially what it is is that uh, legal agreements have now been achieved with the addresses on which there were hold provisions. And so those legal agreements are replacing some of the holds. Okay, the, um, the amendment is on the screen. On favor, show of hands. Opposed, if any, carried. Item as amended, all in favor. Show of hands, carried. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The next item is ZC 24.3, status of supports for the retail sector. Councillor Wong Tam, you held the item down. Do we have any questions? You can put your name on the screen. Council I just put my name on the screen, Madam Speaker. Yes, I just see it. Councillor Wong Tam, questions? Uh, yes, thank you very much. And through you to staff, uh, thank you very much for, for this report. Um, I just want to have an understanding uh, regarding the impacts that we have seen across the city and region uh, with respect to the COVID pandemic, uh, especially for uh, the retail sector. Has it been evenly, uh, is, is the impact of COVID uh, evenly distributed, or are there are some areas that are disproportionately hurt, or are there are some sectors that are disproportionately hurt. 
And good morning, uh, Councillor Wong Tam, and through the speaker, um, there are grounds for measured optimism, as we have seen that yet there are indeed uh, impacts that are different across the city. But of the six of, six of the nine case study areas that we've been looking at through our retail Main Street study, um, there were some improvements that we saw in July. Hospitality has been hard hit, as many people will, will have noted, and you've also noted yourself on Friday uh, Friday's council. Um, but we are seeing that there are some improvements. However, the downtown core has still been hit harder than um, than out of our out of our nine case study areas. It's been hit harder, and therefore we are working at looking at ways to make sure that we mitigate those impacts in, in our planning for recovery. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cheryl. On uh, on Friday, there was a report that was released from the Toronto Region Board of Trade. Uh, this is specifically regarding their economic uh, blueprint institute. I think you you may have seen uh, some of the the articles that came out of that. Um, the the innovation corridor, as they see it, which includes um, Oshawa, Toronto, Hamilton, Gulf, uh, Guelph, sorry, Kitchener, Cambridge, Waterloo. Um, they have identified that the those cities. Uh, along the innovation corridor seems to be uh, lagging behind economic growth uh, and recovery from the from the uh, uh, from the from across the country. Can you share with us, um, you know, whether or not um, we would be able to recover uh, without those cities, or is it a matter of bringing everybody on board so our recovery can be fast and accelerated as the innovation corridor? the speaker and thank you for your question uh councillor wong tam uh, people are continuing to work from home so we are seeing that you know there is a uh, a slow return to the downtown core in terms of the offices coming back online but we, we we really do feel that there is an opportunity for recovery for the city of toronto to continue in a in a positive way and certainly some of the support that we've received from the canadian federal government and in terms of uh, our recent 18 million dollars committed to the city of toronto Will be part of that recovery plan. Uh, so we do believe that you know, whereas each city will have its own path for recovery, Toronto is moving in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, within that blueprint um, report that came out, they also identified within the five business districts within the corridor. So each city has its own uh, centralized business district. Um, they 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 stripped that out and said, you know, even within the corridor, which has been disproportionately impacted. Within that, uh, there seems to be even harder hit economies. Um, the financial district right now is uh, is fairly empty. Uh, all the businesses, well, many of the businesses along the path um, have, have had some difficulty reopening. Um, and even if they were to reopen, there's just not enough business um, to go hand in hand. Um, do you, can you share with us when you anticipate that we could see a full recovery of the downtown core where the office towers would be back up and, and running, where TTC would be, you know, back repopulated with riders. Um, can you give us a sense of when you think this might be? Thank you for your question, Councillor Wong Tam, and through the speaker. This morning, the Globe and Mail reported that, you know, banks are delaying their return to office to and slowing it down due to, to early 2022. Uh, I think right now, many people are contemplating the realities of the winter season and potential impacts of COVID-19 through this period. So it is hard for me at this particular point to uh, provide an estimated time of return and recovery for the downtown core. But what I would say is that everybody is very focused on this idea that we are building towards recovery. And we do see that there is continued growth in different sectors, including tech, including film. And we are making sure that through our investments at the City of Toronto, that we are really preparing ourselves to be uh, ready to support you know, a full return to operations in offices as soon as it's safe to do so and, and folks are comfortable moving in that direction. Thank you. And my final question is, would you um, would you agree that for some of our businesses in the in the core, especially along the path, is that for 18 months that they've been locked down, there's never been an opportunity for reopening? Uh, through the speaker, and thank you for that question. I think certainly through the path, I, I know folks have been responding to the directions of public health, and certainly if they haven't been able to reopen, it's certainly due to those um, compliance points. So I think, you know, at this particular uh, point, we understand the path uh, and businesses have been hard hit and our team in economic development and culture is working uh, very hard to make sure that we are responding to the challenges facing downtown. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Are there any further questions on the item? Okay, to speak. Councillor Wong Tam, did you want to speak on it? Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do have a quick motion I'd like to put on the screen if the clerks can do that for me. Um, the motion is to direct the general manager of economic development and culture to consider implementing a tiered distribution model to recognize the different areas of the city that have experienced higher levels of disruption as a result of COVID-19 and a slower uh, recovery rate. Um, Madam Speaker, I've spoken about this issue um, consistently now since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we recognize that uh, it is going to be very, very difficult uh, for the downtown to recover. We were the first ones hit, and it's not just this downtown in Toronto. It's literally all urban centers across the country, uh, largely because we are, um, you know, international cities, and uh, we require, rely, rely on tourism. And when the office uh, sector hollows out, it just means that that symbiotic relationship between office employment and the employment clusters, whether it's retail or hospitality, uh, that really much, that pretty much came to a grinding halt. Um, so I think that the studies that have been put forward by, whether it's the Toronto Region Board of Trade on the Ontario Canadian, uh, sorry, the Ontario uh, Chamber of Commerce and a whole host of other business uh, advocates, what they've been saying is now absolutely true. And uh, they've actually been reinforcing each other's message. Uh, their studies have all come to the same conclusion is that it will take uh, downtowns and the core of cities much longer to recover. So not only were we the first ones impacted, we'll be the last ones to dig ourselves out of this, um, uh, you know, uh, COVID imposed uh, recession. Uh, it's been heartbreaking, Madam Speaker, to speak to many of the business owners because they are doing everything they can to try to stay afloat. And certainly there is a lot of gratitude for the uh, federal, especially the federal recovery uh, supports, whether it's uh, commercial rent uh, subsidies or wage subsidies. Um, I know that everyone is doing the very best that they can. Uh, but there is um, an important need, Madam Speaker, for us to recognize uh, that we are going to just take a lot longer to, to get out of the COVID uh, recession. Um, and uh, there will probably be some businesses that have tiled their doors and they will never reopen. And those businesses, of course, uh, means uh, the loss of income, but also the income generation that's needed to support families. Um, so, Madam Speaker, not only are these businesses, um, of course, closing, but these businesses are also um, devastating family incomes. And that means that as oftentimes major employers, uh, people are going to be permanently laid off. And sometimes the recovery is, um, is not going to be a smooth and easy path. I've got Massey Hall reopening with 2,700 uh, seat new concert venue. We're very proud of that. We have the Mervish Theatres opening up with, again, hopefully with Come From Away, as well as the Harry Potter, um, you know, major extravaganza production. We have Little Canada that's opening, which is going to be a major tourist draw. And there is a lot of uncertainty about the future. Um, so we need to do everything we can, Madam Speaker, to lift the core. Um, I recognize that uh, there may be um, perhaps some questions about you know, whether or not the core deserves it. And I can say, Madam Speaker, uh, the core is a contributor to the GDP of this, uh, not even just the city, but to this province and the country. And if the downtown doesn't recover, then it's gonna slow down the recovery for the Ontario region, uh, as well as, uh, as the country. And right now, with respect to unemployment rates, we are still sitting higher uh, than the average. Uh, we are also sitting higher as a city along the innovation corridor, uh, as I have noted. And uh, if you think that the, seat, the subways and the um, uh, and transit system is still uh, sitting relatively empty, that's a very good indication of when we will come back. Um, so if revenues for TTC are down, that is going to be tied directly to whether or not we're going to be able to kickstart our recovery at, uh, as well. Um, so Madam Speaker, that's why I want to raise this uh, motion. I hope that we can get the support of, uh, of City Council. And, uh, and I hope that, um, you know, all the services and the supports that are coming in across the city, including those that are coming into downtown. Uh, I'm really hopeful that uh, we continue to support our businesses, give them the tools that they need to, to survive. Uh, it has been extremely difficult for all. Um, and, um, and if 2022 is going to be any indication of what 2021 and 20 is going to look like, um, even though we're optimistically hopeful with the vaccination rates going up, 
with uh, protocols being implemented, uh, but with the new hybrid uh, working models, as well as um, still seeing a, a decrease of uh, pedestrian traffic. Um, many of the industry uh, experts are forecasting that our recovery is going to take another three to five years at minimum. So we're in it for the long haul, but we'd love to see our businesses supported. And thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for the, uh, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Councillor Thompson to speak. I thank you very much, um, Madam uh, Speaker. Uh, I want to speak in support of the motion that um, uh, Council Wong Chan has, Wong Tam has just put forward. Um, and, and while I support it, um, it is to say that there's been a lot of work that's actually being done to look right across the board with respect to, obviously, we know the varying industries who've been impacted, the cultural sector, and certainly the downtown core has been hollowed out, if you will, as a result of COVID and so on. There's been a lot of work that's being done. Uh, specifically, uh, the work that's been led by the um, Janda Silver and the Board of Trade. Uh, three specific areas, the downtown core, which the mayor has chaired with uh, Mr. Silva, the um, airport area, which has been chaired by Mayor Crombie from Mississauga, and uh, the Scarborough Center area, area which I've co-chaired with uh, Mr. Silva. It's been a lot of work that's being done. Um, Ms. Blackman and team at uh, EDC, have been working really hard in terms of assessing and understanding the impact of COVID, COVID on small, medium size and large businesses because everyone has been affected. Um, the downtown core uh, certainly provides a tremendous um, amount of, uh, of, of economic uh, impact to the city and it expands uh, out obviously beyond the city borders, quite frankly. So many people uh, come into the city to work on a daily basis uh, pre-pandemic, and we know that it has been impacted by the pandemic. Uh, there's been a variety of different reports and studies that have been done, which we have reviewed uh, with Ms. Blackman and her team at EDC, along with the mayor and his team. We recognize the need to ensure that uh, we offer uh, in a way that is productive and that is impactful um, solutions and ideas in terms of how to bring back and to build back stronger uh, the varying sectors in our city. And certainly the downtown core is extremely important. Now, with respect to the tiered approach, I mean, obviously we're looking at um, where we get the, the, the most impact with respect to not only the investment, but also the concentration and focus and working with industry and business leader. The mayor, uh, by the way, uh, speaker, has been doing a lot of work with uh, business leaders as uh, I've been doing as well in terms of you know the conversation about when people are going to come back to work. It was only this morning uh, just uh, looking around the downtown area. Uh, I see a lot more people today than I saw last week or weeks before. So that's happening. But of course, it's, it's, it's still in a, uh, a trickle effect, if you will, not as, um, as, as robust as we would like it. And certainly the pathway uh, has been hit um, immensely. I mean, it's, it's a ghost town there. And uh, those small uh, businesses, the Ma and Pa type of facilities have been hit and they have been uh, impacted certainly with respect to their pocketbooks and so on, save and except. Uh, certainly it's been very helpful that, uh, you know, some of the government resources have been helpful to, uh, to help um, obviously these individuals. And so uh, it's a work in progress. And yes, uh, it will take some time. It's not going to happen overnight. But I, I want to ensure that members of council are fully aware that we do have our pulse on, um, you know, the, this issue. And uh, we recognize the, the work that needs to be done and the collaboration that needs to take place in order for us to, to bounce back. The city manager as well is, is, is in recognition of this. I've had discussions with him, uh, both the tour report and the building back stronger report from economic development. Uh, and of course, the Toronto Regional Board of Trade report, uh, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce wrote, all of these things are being done. Um, I had a discussion um, just on the weekend with the Premier uh, around economic development and around the things that are uh, going to happen with respect to Ontario. And of course, um, as uh, the city of Toronto goes, so does the rest of the country and certainly the province. There are brighter days ahead. 
and clearly we have to work towards that. I want to leave members of council with the understanding that that work is actually being done, the assessment and the approach that we need to take in order to ensure we get full value uh, for the resources that are coming from the federal government and the collaboration that needs to take place and so on. So that work is being done and, and um, you know, this, this, this motion is, is helpful, but it is not that it was not being considered and or the recognition in terms of where the hardest hit areas have been, but it's important that we have this discussion and this, um, this dialogue at, at council and there's a full understanding in terms of our approach. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll be supporting this motion. I think that the, the downtown core definitely needs its help and, and our assistance. Uh, as somebody that takes public transit, I take the GO train in and then I walk up uh, from Union Station to City Hall. You can definitely see um, the incredible lack of pedestrian traffic uh, in our downtown core. And that certainly has had a huge uh, impact on our businesses in the downtown core. I, there was a study last week that uh, was in many different media platforms uh, that our downtown core is lacking behind, lagging behind not only uh, the GTA, but the city, the country as a whole. Um, so it needs our help. Um, but as I spoke at economic development, uh, I represent an area in the southeast corner of Scarborough that has many uh, mom and pop businesses. Uh, we only have three business improvement areas in uh, Scarborough, which represents uh, a quarter of the population of the city. Um, I'd like to see more BIAs in uh, in Scarborough. Staff are well aware of that. Uh, I'm not always sure those mom and pop businesses get heard uh, in some of the studies that are done. Uh, yesterday, I had the privilege of being at the Scarborough Business Association uh, Business Appreciation Day with Deputy Mayor Thompson and Councillor McKelvey. A uh, very well-run event by the Scarborough Business Association, but an association, you know, trying to represent all of Scarborough, uh, but not getting a lot of assistance from the City of Toronto. So, um, as I said, I will be supporting this motion, but I just want to make sure that staff are well aware. Um, I think there are a lot of businesses out there that still need a voice, and uh, I look forward to their support on that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak to speak. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. When I see a, a motion like this, I'm, I'm, I'm very ambivalent because this is not what we need at the City of Toronto, uh, where we're leaning dollars towards one sector over another. The answer to the road of recovery for the downtown is not in the hands of government. It's actually in the private sector, encouraging their workers to come back uh, when it's safe, when it's opportune, on a rotation basis, on a gradual basis, and that has been moving very slowly. Um, I took the subway into City Hall uh, this morning, and I can tell you with some confidence that it is certainly uh, building itself back. Um, the downtown has many advantages that some of these areas across the city, whether it be Scarborough or Etobicoke or North York, have suffered greatly um, throughout the pandemic. The, the downtown has um, has the bulk of the arts and the museum and uh, art gallery uh, industry that's uh, making a, a good recovery. It has many of the recreational and sports uh, assets. Of course, it has the lion's share of Section 37 through development applications. Uh, it has the lion's share of a lot of our infrastructure money. And of course, it's received a good chunk of COVID recovery funds from all levels of government. So the answer is not more government, big government. The answer is really getting people back into the office. And I got to tell you that after 18, 20 months uh, working at home, it is hard to get people to get another paradigm shift of, of, of working back in a conventional office. Certainly it has to be safe and we're relying on the private sector in consultation with, with our various healthcare partners and Toronto Public Health to, to make it uh, safe. But uh, I can tell you that uh, if you go through the inner suburbs, whether it be Scarborough or Etobicoke or North York, you can see great harm caused by the pandemic where small businesses uh, were hurt, where infrastructure uh, is crumbling, where projects are slow to roll out. We need help too. And uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's in order to really gear it uh, towards the um, 
the downtown. I think it has to be spread across the city in an equitable fashion. Uh, and, and if the word wasn't consider here, uh, then I would vote against it. But it is considerate, uh, but it's not something I would probably support uh, in the future. I think, once again, to sound a little repetitive, we've got to get the private sector to get their employees back into the downtown. And we've got to get our public sector back into the downtown as well, back at City Hall and back at Queen's Park and back into the federal buildings. That's the answer to an, an economic uh, recovery uh, in downtown, not, not spending um, more uh, public money. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any further speakers before we go to the last speaker? Okay, Mayor Tory, the last speaker. Well, uh, Speaker, thank you. And uh, I uh, appreciate all the comments that have been made and, uh, and the uh, reports back from uh, Ms. Uh, Bernard. I um, uh, want to just say, first of all, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Councillor Pasternak kind of presents it as an either or choice. And what's being asked for here in a motion that I too will support by Councillor Wong Cam is simply this study of the feasibility of a tiered response, because I think it is fair to say that while every area of the city has suffered, including small business in all areas of the city during extensive periods of lockdown and whatnot, um, the downtown and in particular, um, some of the smaller retail have suffered uh, disproportionately simply because all the people that, um, that uh, normally would patronize those businesses have just not been there. And so to, to that extent, I, I agree with, with uh, you know him as well though that the key rests with decisions that are going to be taken by the private sector in the end to fill up the office towers again i think they're running at about 10 percent now and uh, I, i've been engaged in meetings together with deputy mayor thompson and others uh, on a very frequent basis with them to kind of monitor their uh their intentions uh, on a go-forward basis i will say to you that um you know they've had an ongoing dialogue with their own employees and while in the end obviously the employer has the right to set policy in that regard they're anxious to do it in a way that has their employees stay safe and healthy obviously but also to stay confident um, and that has caused them to um, be perhaps a bit slower than some of the discussions we might have had say in the spring um, and uh, the, the 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 current intentions they have and, and by the way i should say uh, echo the comments of my colleagues in saying that uh, jan de silva and the board of trade together with grant hume and the financial district bia um, have done an excellent job at, at kind of working with us to have various plans to answer various of the practical kinds of questions whether it be everything from an elevator protocol through to uh, various other things that are all in place but the two things that need to be in place based on all the research they've done all the discussions they've had with their employees and so on are first a sort of confidence and and degree of willingness knowing that in the end the employer could just say well you know i want you to come to work today um, but i think it's better if it's done with a sort of consensus that people want to come back to work and feel confident coming back to work um, and secondly uh, confidence in the transit system and the uh, public uh, information campaign that is on now among many other things that is going to be done that are going to be done to restore confidence in the transit are a part of that overall effort but I just wanted to say, really, I guess, in response to some of the comments of Councillor Wong Tan, we've been actively engaged and in a way that puts particular emphasis on the downtown throughout. This is not anything new that's happening today. Um, in fact, the money that is coming from the federal government uh, came directly as a result of the discussions that I've had with uh, Madam Jolly uh, in response, in turn, to a concern we both had about the downtowns, which are uniquely put together of both Toronto and Montreal, because they have these extensive underground and underneath the sort of financial district uh, precincts that had been harder hit because of people not coming to work at all uh, for lengthy periods of time. And in fact, some of the money that is coming that uh, that uh, the councillor is moving should be dispersed in a certain way is only here because of those uh, kinds of discussions. Um, the Board of Trade continues to work hard, uh, as, as do I with them and with the Financial District BIA and all the partners to try and keep that process moving along of, of people coming back to work in the downtown office towers. Uh, to be candid. Uh, I think it will be into the new year before we're going to see significant uptick, although I'm encouraged to see that there is increased uh, transit ridership that we have seen. This is one of the indications we can get of more people, um, you know, coming back to work. It's gone from the sort of mid to high 20s to the mid uh, 40s, um, which is significant. And I would remind people who question about some of the money that's being spent promoting uh, the safety of the transit system that every percentage point in ridership that we get back 
uh, is about worth about $12 million in terms of, of revenue that will come into the coffers of the TTC and be money that the governments don't have to find to subsidize uh, its operations to the historic extent, extent that they have. So I think what we have to do, and, and on this notion of does the core deserve it or not, if you look at any objective examination of the facts, the contribution made by the downtown of Toronto, and that's not at the expense of or to the detriment of anybody else, the contribution made by a full, active, healthy, dynamic downtown to the Toronto and national economy is gigantic. Therefore, the sooner it's back in a state of good health, the better for everybody, but in particular for uh, those um, smaller businesses that have been so hard hit. I should just say one positive note uh, at the end here, uh, and, and, and that is that People from abroad who are looking for places to locate business, uh, businesses in Canada continue to pick Toronto. Last week we had Stripe, a multinational global payment uh, sort of processing company with offices in four or five different countries headquartered in the U.S. Uh, after a search process, they picked Toronto and uh, located their head office, which will begin with 100 employees. It will be located uh, in the downtown. And this is just one of many that have made that decision during the pandemic uh, with lots of involvement by Toronto Global, by our EDC people and by me in just uh, kind of holding their hands as we've gone through it and convincing them that all the good things that had Toronto women before the pandemic have continued. And we continue with that work with Deputy Mayor Thompson as well. So thank you, Speaker. And I would urge people to support Councillor Wong Tam's motion and the item uh, as previously on the books before her uh, amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, do you have a question for the mayor? Yes, I do, Madam Speaker. Okay, Councillor Grimes. Councillor Grimes? Can, can you hear? Yes. But maybe he should turn his camera off there because he's just freezing up. And... Uh, okay. Okay, Count. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. Uh, mayor Tory, in your meetings with We can't hear you. Councillor Grimes, we can't hear you. Madam Speaker, on a point of privilege, it's Stephen Holliday. Councillor Holliday, point of personal privilege. Yeah, I think a few of us are having a hard time with uh, the video connection today, uh, self-included. Um, would it be okay to stand this item down then and allow Councillor Grimes to reconnect? You still can't hear me, Madam Speaker? We can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Tory. in your meetings with Councillor Thompson, the downtown core, the office towers, I know they're kind of, you'll have probably a phased approach coming back, but what's your sense? Uh, you know, we've heard some members of council say three to five years recovery. What's your sense of seeing these office towers kind of get back to full capacity in, in your discussion with the banks? Thank you for the question through you, Madam Speaker, to Councillor Grimes. Uh, my sense is that they now look as a, because we're talking to them very regularly, at having a kind of a complement back at work of, of, in the order of, say, 50%, you know, by, uh, by early winter. Uh, so not quite by the end of the year, but by early winter. Uh, and it'll sort of hopefully phase up from there. Now, the 50%, though, is... Uh, also going to be to some extent tempered by the fact that that 50% will be in some cases based on a hybrid model where people won't be coming to work five days a week in the normal fashion that they would have before, but might be coming, say, three days a week. Um, but my sense is there's a fairly clear resolve on the part of employers to have more people back by the end of the year, starting at sort of in, in all seriousness at the end of the year. Some have set thresholds uh, before that. Um, I think what's important to note is that um, because of the hybrid um, and, and because there are a number of business premises that are empty, achieving that kind of full recovery that uh, Councillor Wong Tam made reference to that you've asked about, you know, will take a longer period of time simply because you will have to have people make business decisions to relocate in some of those empty premises, even if uh, the uh, occupancy in the downtown towers and other places gets to be back upwards of 50, 60, uh, 70 percent. So. I think it's fair to say we will probably see some modest improvement between now and the end of the year. You'll see that track with the uh, transit ridership that has been ticking up slowly. Um, you will see hopefully more improvement, all things being equal on the health side, happen in the uh, winter months. Um, and that will continue on a trend that will take through a good part of next year, but that it won't be 100% back to normal because of the hybrid uh, aspect of this and because uh, even when 
people are back to patronize these businesses, there aren't as many to patronize. In other words, there are empty premises as a result of the uh, damage done by the pandemic. So I think it's going to take a while. I'm not sure I would say it's as long as Councillor Wonkam says, but it's going to take a while. I think we're going to have to be patient and do everything we can as a city government to encourage it to happen. And really that involves building up confidence among the employers and among the employees to the extent we can as city councillors and building up confidence very importantly in our transit system as a safe way to get around. I've been using it a lot in recent uh, weeks and uh, you can see the traffic is up. You can see people are wearing masks and it is functioning as well as it ever did. I was on it yesterday and there's just no better way to get around. Thank you, Mary Tory. Those are my questions, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So on the amendment, uh, Councillor Wong Tan. On favor, show of hands, carried. Item is amended. On favor, show of hands, carried. Thank you. Our next item is IE 24.6, red light camera systems. Councillor Bailao, you held the item down. Do we have questions to staff? Actually, Councillor, I'm sorry, I, 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 Madam Speaker, I should have released that. I'm, I'm good. I've dealt with it. Oh, so Councillor Wong, uh, Councillor Bailao is releasing the item. On favor, show of hands, carry. Our next item is IE 24.7. Uh, Councillor Wong Tan, TO Core Strategy. I'm Speaker, I'm still working on the uh, motion. Uh, if you can just hold that down, hopefully I'll be ready in about 15 minutes. Okay. Our Thank next, you. Our next item is IE 24.13, Lakeshore Boulevard East Bridge and Public Realm Project. Councillor Fletcher. I'm sorry, I'm just getting some more information on that. Could we just go past that, please? Thank you. Okay, because we're following the agenda, so we can get this information. That speaker. But thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. IE 24.14 updates on Wellington Street Capital Projects. Councillor Wong Tam, you held the item down. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I do have a, actually, Councillor, sorry, Deputy Mayor uh, Holiday now has a quick amendment, which I'm supportive of. Uh, okay. I will relinquish the item to uh, Deputy Mayor Holiday. Well, first of all, are there any questions? Are there any no. que questions from members of Council on IE 24.14? No? Okay, we'll go to speakers. Councillor Holliday. Thanks, Speaker. Um, my amendment is tiny. It's just to route the report through the audit committee uh, instead of the INE committee. I just dis discussed it with clerks and the Auditor General, and we felt that was the better route. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Wong Tam. Um, Madam Speaker, I, I won't say much uh, more. I've, I've, I've said my piece during the committee, to be quite honest, and I do recognize that this is a, we still have a long uh, agenda before us. Uh, I support the motion that uh, Deputy Mayor Holiday has placed and hope everyone can support it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll to speak. Uh, Madam Speaker, my, my intent was to ask a question of the mover, but I couldn't figure out how to indicate that in the portal. Okay. The, the mover of the amendment. All right, Councillor Carroll, you have a question to Councillor Holiday. Go ahead. Clarification. Of yes, I, I just wondered if, I wondered if you could expand and clarify on your comment that you, you've spoken with clerks and you've spoken with audit. It, it is a bit unconventional that, that, you know, the item is now with us, with works. It is now, uh, 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 a direction to staff, um, it, you're, you're basically seizing audit with a matter that is now in the hands of council. I'm wondering if that doesn't uh, uh, threaten the independence of the Auditor General. You're, you're sort of driving her work plan then. Did, did you get comments on that? 
from clerks and from the AG? I did, Madam Speaker. Um, I actually uh, spoke to the auditor, well, I exchanged an email with the auditor general on this. And uh, I guess the, the thought was the auditor general uh, usually reports through the audit committee, all the reports route through there. And I consulted uh, with clerk staff as well. Uh, look, I'm, I'm happy the auditor general is doing the work and it was just uh, which committee is the right one to send it back through. And the consensus came back of, uh, it was better to go through audit. Um, and I, that's all. Okay, um, uh, I, I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll end the questions there and maybe we could have a chat offline. I, I'm just, so, it's, it's unconventional as I'm sure you can appreciate um did you get that did you get that sense from from staff no i got the the reverse sense was that it was unconventional to have the auditor general report to the IV committee um I think true. They can, that's true yeah. okay okay yeah okay I, I would love to have a conversation offline thank you madam speaker for that indulgence Councillor. Okay, Councillor Pasternak, do you have a question to Councillor Holiday? I do, yes. Okay. Just a question for the mover. Councillor Pasternak, question. Yeah, so um, usually we have the Auditor General look at uh, financial improprieties or, or, or strange uh, financial uh, shenanigans. Do you believe those have taken place here? Councillor Pasnanek, I really don't know. Um, the committee has brought up a, a question, uh, whether it goes through the fraud and waste hotline or it goes through uh, council as a recommendation to the auditor to add it to the work plan. I don't think it matters as long as it's brought to the auditor's attention. And I'm quite um, confident in her ability to independently assess if there's an issue. And my only point on um, the amendment is that usually the auditor general reports to the audit committee instead of a standing committee. So uh, that's the reason for the change in committee. So I would say that um, we spend the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes of every infrastructure environments committee meeting uh, approving uh, additional funds for almost every contract we let. Um, I don't know why these are not coming in uh, on budget or, or certainly not on time. Um, do you think this is just one of many that are that are really in that in that basket of problems where maybe companies are underbidding to get the job and then they their scope creep and then it goes up in costs or or is or is this unique because if you're going to look at this one you might as well look at you're going to have to look at just about everyone councillor pasternak if you, uh, uh, just question for clarification of the motion i Would you, you know to to reiterate madam speaker i i don't know um you know the genesis of this motion i i presume it was put before the committee by a member. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think there's harm in asking the auditor to look at something that happens every day. And as I said, there's a number of different gateways and whether the, the, the subject counselor of the motion could have sent a note through the fraud and waste hotline if they thought there is an issue. I'm not here to judge. Um, I'm just happy that there's a process for these things to go through. And if you think it should be expanded, by all means, add to it. Um, I just am concerned with the governance and how it runs through the committee and who reports to where. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam, do you have a question of the mover? I do. Just to help Councillor Pastor and I'm going to ask this question. Um, to the Deputy Mayor, uh, when it comes to engaging uh, the Auditor General, uh, she, of course, looks at the financial impact on contracts, but also the processes that are followed that sometimes um, creates adverse uh, financial impact. So therefore, a project can, can lengthen, not just with respect to, to delivery of, of timeline, but also um, uh, financial outcome. Uh, is that not correct? Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Wong Tam. And my experience uh, being on the audit committee, and maybe that's part of the joy of uh, reading the reports is that it goes well beyond just the financial. I think the auditor takes a very, very high level view of the concept of value for money. 
Uh, and most, most importantly, the, the outcome I've always seen is it, <clears throat> it creates a catalyst for change if there's change required in process. And uh, it, it helps to boost public confidence. So if there was an issue, any type of issue uh, discovered, then the auditor may add comment. You know, it's also possible the auditor may look at this and not report because they, she may not find something. But I've never seen a, a harm in bringing something to the auditor's attention. I mean, that's what they do every day. And they, uh, they look at these things and they, upset, they assess them objectively. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go back to the speakers. Okay, Councillor Wong Tam, do you want to speak on the item? I'll now take a few minutes simply because I, I hope that there's not a lot of confusion on the floor today. Um, the genesis of, of this original motion in the letter was, was simply because we have uh, had a heck of a time getting the Wellington streetscape improvements uh, implemented uh, in the St. Lawrence Market neighborhood. Um, and there were a number of issues that uh, the city staff, as well as the contractors and subcontractors and utility companies ran up against. Um, and I think that, you know, for, for all intensive purposes, uh, there was, um, as, uh, as noted in the staff report, uh, some shortcomings. Um, but I also think that it was critically important that not only did this project get delayed by literally years, um, this project began well before uh, I got to Ward 13, and it certainly uh, began all the way back with uh, Councillor McConnell with her uh, working with the local community to make sure that this was a street that was going to see uh, the, the investments that it deserves. Um, the, the other thing is that the BIA had put this plan uh, before um, city staff as well as the, the previous local councillor's office, my local my office, um, and we were all working to what we believe was a good outcome, which, which is that you know, when it comes to old parts of the city of Toronto, and this is the original 10 blocks of the city, that means everything you can imagine that's buried under there is buried under those, those, uh, th those roads. And, and sometimes there are su um, surprises. So that may be utility locates being in places that they're not supposed to be, but is not properly recorded on a map. Uh, it also could be, you know, buried oil tanks, which is certainly something we found. And sometimes it's archaeological digs. Thank goodness we didn't find that. But all that being said is that, you know, the businesses and the, and the residents of the neighborhood have had to live through a period of construction start and stop. And of course, with Cafe Teal that was implemented this year and the previous year, uh, businesses were, were literally trying to survive at the same time being worked around by, by a construction. If there was a way for us to, to learn from what happened that went wrong, to make sure that we don't do it again, I would like to see that. So I'm not on a, on a witch hunt per se, I just really want to find out if there's a better way for us to coordinate construction, especially when it relates to multiple utilities and service providers. So therefore we have one project manager, we dig once, and then we restore the street to the way we found it, and in this case with superior um, uh, streetscape improvements, which I wish upon every neighborhood, and that's what we're trying to do. I know that the Auditor General um, is incredibly busy. I have spoken to her in the past about things that, and I've picked up the phone or I've, I've emailed her and said, this is something I've seen. If you think it's an issue, I'll give you more information or perhaps I'll, um, if it's not that big, especially on your very busy work plan, I will drop it. This one was a multi-million dollar project that went years overboard and created a lot of frustration to the community. And I'm just really hoping that we can learn something from this fiasco, and I would call it a fiasco, so that we don't repeat this experience anywhere else, not in my neighborhoods, and certainly I don't want it for your neighborhoods. So thank you very much. Thank you. Ca Councillor Carroll, um, I see your name on the list. Do you want to speak? Uh, no, thanks. That was when I was trying to get on to question the mover. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Pasternak, do you want to speak? I see your name on. Was that just to question? Councillor Pasternak? Okay, so let's put the, uh, the motion on the screen. Okay, motion by Councillor Holliday. Amendment on favor, show of hands. 
Opposed, if any, carried. Item is amended on favor. Show of hands, carried. Thank you. Our next item is NY 26.2, the final report for 966 Mills Road. Deputy Mayor Min and Wong, you held the item down. Do you have questions of staff? Two. Hold on just a sec. Oh, I also have, oh no, I'll have a deferral motion as well, but I'll, I'll do that in a minute. Um, so if I, so, um, there has been, uh, we're looking for a deferral because there has been an offer made um, by uh, Cadillac Fairview and Lantera, is that correct? Who's, who's answering? Okay. Do we have staff on the line? Okay. Uh through the, through the speaker, uh, Deputy Mayor, are you directing that at City Legal or City Plan? Oh, okay. Well, I I noticed that one of your colleagues, Mr. Andrewski's um, manager in North York's on the line. Uh, maybe he might be able to answer this. Go ahead, John. Sorry, Deputy Mayor. Could you mind repeating the question? I was just connecting with my audio. Okay. So um, this is an arrangement where we're seeking a, um, a rezoning to amend the Section 37 agreement on 966 Don Mills Road, but I'm placing a deferral motion because um, this matter is uh, in front of the Court of Appeal right now, and the developer and and, and the developer has uh, made an offer. Uh, that the city has been involved with. Is that fair to say? That is correct. The developer has put forward a, a proposal for some community space at 169 the Donway. And we also have a, a community information meeting set up for October 13th to present that proposal. But the, 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 the genesis of this arrangement, this offer, this isn't really something that they that came out of the blue. This is something that you've been working on for quite some time and presented the genesis of this arrangement to them at the very beginning. Isn't that fair to say? Staff have been involved for, for about a year on, on this, on, on this version of the, of the proposal. So yes, it's been, it's been about a year we've been working with, with uh, Cadillac Fairview and Lanterra and planning in the parks department. Yes. And this essentially was the proposal that you presented to them. Is that fair to say? It, it's a proposal that, that we had worked collectively as a group with staff. Yes. Okay, and so this arrangement is an arrangement where the community will get um, uh, will get nineteen thousand square feet of community space for fitness, for meeting, um, any type of things that they want to do, plus a walking track. Is that an accurate summary? That's an accurate summary. Yes. Okay, and so, but the city has a point of view that you know, to accept this offer that um, the uh, the DMRI, the local community group that who originally um, took this matter to un un the Ontario Superior Court and lost very badly, and who's now taken this to the Court of Appeal, we're asking them to drop that appeal. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Part, part, of, part of our consideration of this would be that uh, community space would be at 169 the Donway not at 966 uh, Don Mills Road. And so um, the reason why, um, the reason why, why do you want, why is it so important this, that this appeal um, be, be dropped by the DMRI? Staff's point of view. Um, the, there, there, the, the result would be we, we are, we're negotiating the, the community at spa the space at 169 the Donway. We also have the Celestica development down the road about a kilometer to the south, which is again going to be one of the largest community centers. Um, 
in, in Toronto and then having uh, potentially a, a, a an additional community uh, center there uh, would be sort of an over provision of, of, of community space within within the area. So what you're essentially saying that is if this appeal went on and and the uh, the local community group won the appeal, then we'd have three community centers very close to each other and that's not an arrangement that the city can have. It would also mean two community centers within 500 meters of each other, which doesn't make sense either. Is that, fair? Is that a, fair, um, a fair analysis? I believe that's a fair analysis, yes. I think Arcs Department could elaborate on that, but that, that's potentially the case with Celestica a kilometer down the road in these two facilities about 350, 400 meters apart, which is about a, a three to four minute walk of one another. And, and if um, if the if they don't drop this appeal, um, and uh, the offer is not taken, so so if 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 the DMRI doesn't agree to uh, um, let go let go of this appeal, um, then uh, and the offer is only open until around November 11th, the next council meeting, the community will be left with nothing because the DMRI would would not have agreed to set aside the appeal. That was Is your that last a fair question. Analysis? Yeah, that was your last question. I, I, I believe I mean, the, the offer is set to expire, I believe, at the next city council uh, meeting. Uh, I would, uh, we need clarity from Cadillac and Lanter, but I, I believe one option is yes, there would be no community space potentially at the shops of Don Mills. Right. Thank you. Okay. Are there any further questions? Okay, uh, speakers, Deputy Mayor Minnawong to speak. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I have a motion. Okay. Okay, do you want to read it? Yeah, the consideration of this item be deferred until the November 9th and 10th uh, 2021 meeting of city council, um, uh, members of council. So the re so we, uh, a couple of years ago, we made a decision to, um, build the largest community center, um, in the city, right in Don Mills, uh, two swimming pools, two ice rinks, um, a gym and community, um, and other meeting space next to a two and a half acre park. Um, most communities would be very happy with this. Um, the executive of the local community, the DMRI, do not like this because it's 800 meters away from the previous location that they wanted it to be. And that would have been a smaller location. This is a better location, but um, they don't like this arrangement. So um, the local community association, the, D the DMRI, uh, sued the city in Superior Court. Um, they lost very badly. Um, and so now they've decided to appeal this uh, to the Court of Appeal. Um, and this is all delayed uh, the building of this community center that everybody wants. So um, in the interim, we've uh, been able, the city has been able to work out arrangements with a local developer, Cadillac Fairview and Lantera, to build additional uh, community space uh, along the Donway where uh, many residents want that community space to be built. Um, the offer expires at the next council meeting. The city requires, uh, will require uh, the DMRI to withdraw their appeal because if they don't, and uh, we think we have a very strong case in the Court of Appeal, but if we, lo if we lose that, um, then we'll have two community centers within 500 meters of, 500 meters of each other. And that's not a it's just not, an, that's not city building to have, um, you know, potentially three uh, community center locations um, so close to each other. Um, so, and uh, because the, this offer only goes to um, the middle of November, um, if the DMRI does not agree to this and they lose at the Court of Appeal, the community could be left with nothing. So we're having a community meeting between now and the next um, council meeting to discuss this with the with the with the neighborhood and 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 uh, I hope 
that the DMRI comes to their senses and accepts uh, this, this offer and agrees to drop their unnecessary waste and wasteful litigation so that we can get on with building a community center for the city in Don Mills. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Carroll to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I don't, I don't think Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong will mind my speaking uh, uh, just as another North York Community Council member. I feel that I, I do have to speak uh, to put a fine point on, on uh, the support that needs to go um, to both Council, the description Councilor, of what should. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Councillor Carroll. So we're speaking on the referral right now. So you have two minutes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'll finish that sentence then. Both to the description of what should happen to to uh, to this item going forward, and to the deferral, which is an extremely uh, uh, generous thing for the local councillor to be doing right now. This matter has become quite nakedly political in this neighborhood, up to and including the most recent federal election. And what the local councillor is trying to do, what our Parks and Recreation Department are trying to do, and what our Planning Department are trying to do, is to think beyond the period of a mere election, to what would best serve this growing community as a result of the Anglican Crosstown for the next 50 years. That's, that's the role of a councillor. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And that is what Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong is presenting to the community. What best serves the quality of life, not just in the shops of Don Mills, but Don Mills, the Crosstown community, what best serves us all, all of our children, all of our seniors, everyone living in this neighborhood. And so the deferral is a chance for the community to put politics aside and decide what they want to do about this offer. And I sincerely hope that given the period of the deferral that they will. Those are my comments. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. On the deferral, on favor, show of hands, pose the penny, carry, thank you. Our next um, item is NY 2615 construction staging area for 1408, 1420 Bayview. Councillor Robinson held the item down. It's my understanding she's she's willing to release it. So, but it's here without recommendation. So, Councillor Pasternak, as the chair, would you like to move it? The staff rec. Councillor Pasternak. Madam Speaker. Yes, Did you call me? Yes, Councillor Pasternak, would you be willing to move it? The staff rec? Uh, yes, yes, I'd be happy to move. Okay. There it is on the screen. On favor, show of hands. Opposed, if any, carried. Councillor Wong Tam, are you ready to go to your item, i.e. 24.7? Um, I have sent my motion, Madam Speaker, to the clerk. If the clerks can confirm that they are ready, then I am ready. Still working on it. Councillor Fletcher, are you ready with your item, i.e. 24.13? I'm waiting for the motions, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank We're you. Working on it. All right. So let's go to the ni next item, SC 26.22, permit parking, Jolly Way. Councillor Perks, you held the item down. Do you have questions? I held that as a courtesy for Councillor Carroll, who wasn't here for the agenda review. All right, okay. So, Councillor Carroll? Uh, yes, I had some questions of staff. Okay. If you can put your name on the screen, please. Okay, go ahead. Questions of staff. Yes, it's a, a question for transportation. I was interested in reading this report to, um, because it's it, it a similar thing comes up uh, in various places throughout the suburbs 
similar to, to this street, often it, it happens as a result of new development. Some of our designs keep generating this question about permit parking. But as I understand, our staff are, are planning on reporting back on this in the near future. To the speaker, to Councillor Carroll, uh, it's Barbara Gray. Uh, we are, in fact, coming back with a parking strategy. Uh, we're going to be coming back with a scope and consultation approach to council in the December cycle. Um, and we will be focusing our efforts really on residential parking programs overall. So we will have the opportunity to address uh, sort of the policy and strategic uh, goals for residential parking programs, which I know haven't been looked at in a while. Um, I think that there's probably going to be uh, between now and when we're actually done with that program, which probably won't come back to council until uh, the end of 2022, beginning of 2023. There are probably going to be a number of um, smaller projects and issues like this one that come forward. So um, we'll we'll continue to to respond to these individual proposals as well, but we all we will be doing a broader strategy analysis. Was there so is there is there a strategy for the one ofs to to does adopting a one of frustrate the efforts of the of the eventual report? Um or or can we do the one ofs and then they'll 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 be addressed somehow in the in the later report. I I I guess what I'm getting at is should we refer all of the, the requests to that review or or can we adopt them? Well, Councillor Carroll, I, I think that um, there will probably be some urgency on some things that might, between now and when we're done with the program, might want to be looked and and also are the purview of of the community council. So I think some of these one-offs are probably time sensitive. Um, I think that generally our work is to look at parking programs citywide uh, as as a strategic look and bring an approach back to council that's informed by data. We're doing some workshops right now with uh, peer cities across North America to uh, to look at other residential and commercial permit parking programs. We have a, a working group that includes um, the TPA uh, planning uh, a number of T, uh, create to a number of organizations <laughs> across the city to inform this work and it, it is multifaceted so we will be bringing back a report in december yeah, so to the council that lays out what we think an appropriate scope will be and give you an opportunity to comment on that as well as a consultation strategy okay and and last question just one more madam speaker uh when i when i first saw this knee-jerk response i was like ah don't do this it might be a problem for me but i looked at it on the map Turns out to be quite close to. It. I drive by it all the time. It turns out, um, but it this is a very contained little neighborhood. You know, sitting under a trestle bridge and all that. I, I see uh, the local councilor nodding. Um, so the thing is this: in in my answers to my own constituents, where this comes up, am I able to say because this is a very contained neighborhood, it doesn't bleed into other streets, other residential streets. It's very much on its own. Can I therefore say that that this is a unique uh, example? And if this comes up in my neighborhood, they're different because they bleed into other residential streets. We refer them to your report. Can we use that distinction? Are you comfortable with that? Uh, I am, and so is my staff. Uh, Councillor Carroll, I think that there's uh, there's lots of different scenarios for residential permit parking, as you know, and as you described, this yeah. one is quite unique. So I would agree with you. Okay, thank you so much, and and I and I hope I hope I didn't cause the local councillor any anxiety there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holiday. Questions? Thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, councillor Carroll inspired me to ask Ms. Gray a couple of questions about the report coming forward, uh, because this is something that's sensitive and I think a lot about. Um, if uh, Ms. Gray is available, there. Yep, perfect. Um, are you going to be working with planning as you work through what the future of uh, parking could be for residential areas? Through the speaker to Deputy Mayor Holiday, absolutely. We have a working group that we've put together, and I uh, I agree with you. This is not only critical work, but it's also quite complicated and has lots of facets. Uh, we can go, I think, and look at any number of down any number of different rabbit holes. So I think our approach, uh, similar to some of these other citywide analyses that we've done, like for surface transit, is to do some initial work back 
to the council as a as kind of a review of what we plan on doing as well as a consultation strategy and then get your feedback on that we'll do that at the end of the year and then we'll go off and and do the work uh, and do the consultation in 2022 and come back probably in early 23 is the plan right now with a with a strategy uh, we have a number of different parking there's lots of different uh, entities in the city that deal with parking uh, emergency services yep. um, create to uh, the TPA ourselves um, planning absolutely and, and a number of others and so we have a pretty robust working group that we've pulled together to start to look at this work and as I mentioned we also are engaging peer cities that have very progressive parking programs just to see what we can learn so that that's our that's our plan okay um, I'm gonna highly paraphrase it but our official plan speaks to the concept that when you build a development um, you do everything you can to internalize the services that is it doesn't spill out into the neighborhood it's all self-contained right garbage you know all that kind of exciting stuff uh, and you know one of the concepts is is that you internalize right. the parking requirements on oh, the site right. um, um yes no i have to do pastor next sounds like he's helping with the answer <laughs> councillor holiday can okay. we just talk about the item that we have before us please yeah i'm getting a little bit of sound uh, overlay but yeah so i just Again, uh, the back to the concept about internalizing the parking, is that something you're going to look at in your study, um, which I guess would speak to an area such as this one? I, uh, through the speaker to Deputy Mayor Holiday, uh, pretty much everything's on the table right now where there's pressure, okay. and I know that there's pressure there. We're seeing it with a number of developments that come forward that are restricting the ability for those residents to be in the permit parking, and I also know that there's um, a, lots of impacts of uh, parking in on properties, but then also, conversely, there's also impacts on the neighborhood uh, and, and people's behaviors when we, um, when we have too much parking. So it's always a balancing act. Okay, and then I guess my final question is, you know, in a neighborhood such as this one with your parking study, um, part of the city council decision often buried deep in the report is this concept that uh, um, visitor parking would occur on the street. So if we made a change to the road uh, and, and filled it with cars, you know, the visitors may have no place to go. And I, I can't say here nor there if that affects this particular site, but would you include that concept as something that you would review in your parking study? Uh, and again, Deputy Mayor Holiday, I, I think that all of those things are quite relevant and I think the visitor parking in particular is something that residential neighborhoods are quite passionate about and we see in some areas of the city where we, where we do have permit parking, the visitors uh, comprise, you know, there, there's pressure on uh, on the existing spaces, we have waiting lists, etc. There's, there's lots of impact, so certainly we would, we would look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So if we have any speakers, if you can put the na your name on the list. Okay, Councillor Carroll, you held the item down to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I held the item down because initially my knee-jerk response was, ah, don't do this, I'm waiting for the report. I need a change such as this to happen in, in some of the areas of, uh, of our war, but there's so much work to do with the community beforehand. But with a little research, I'm satisfied that, that Jolly Way is so contained that, that I think we can say it truly is anomaly in, in terms of going forward. It, it's very anomalous in that it's, it's so uh, bounded by a rail and, a, and, and then a, a, an industrial belt. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't have a knock-on effect more than likely but i will say this we we do need to look at this because because i have very similar places to this and in our new developments we do all sorts of work we do careful work to make sure that we've got the parking requirements right we 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 ask for for generous visitor parking because where we where we're hoping for transit non-car oriented development um often the uh, the visitors become the problem the weekend uh, really loads the place up and what's happening is a more and more casual approach and we're seeing a lot of overnight parking and people think oh with permit parking that would get worse here's here's a new phenomenon um people are buying units in places uh, this is this is in fact a ground related townhouse development but we're seeing around some of our, our high-rise and mid-rise development people are buying a unit with one parking spot, or in some cases, renting a unit with zero parking spots. 
knowing full well that they're bringing a car and thinking they'll just take their chances and park on the street overnight. And, and we just aren't able to apply the resources to go after overnight parking constantly. So here's the interesting thing that happens with permit parking. It's not free. <laughs> you can choose to pay for the, the parking spot that we've actually built into the building to park your car on, or you can pay to have a permit. We're leaving no free option that way. And the, so some of this sort of, I think I'm gonna game the system and not pay for any parking spot anywhere, that begins to go away. That's why I'm interested in looking at this in a, in a measured way in some of our growth areas in the suburbs. But I, I look forward to doing it via the report. But I, I'm uh, happy to support uh, uh, what the local councillor is looking for here, having looked at this sort of pocketed community uh, and, and <laughs> discovering that it's, it's right across the street from a dad's long-term care home. <laughs> and <laughs> I realized that it's contained in such a way we can call it truly anomalous and, and, and move forward with it now. Thank you. Those are my comments, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Perks, your name is on the list. Did you want to speak? Uh, no, Speaker. Again, I, I only held this as a courtesy for Councillor Carroll. Thank you. Councillor Holliday to speak. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be very brief because I'm not going to dive into the details of this particular site. Uh, Councillor Thompson, I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about it only that uh you know on a larger scale i see this from time to time we've all seen this as members of council uh, i find it highly frustrating that um, the appropriate amount of parking is not getting built with the developments and it ends up spilling over onto the street so instead of being a property owner's issue uh, or a vendor's issue so somebody that's selling a development uh, it becomes the city's problem and the taxpayer's problem at the end of the day because of the, the cost of looking after these roads and implementing these systems. Uh, we know the city's not necessarily making uh, money off of on-street parking. Uh, but moreover, uh, the official plan talks uh, about it a little bit, um, about the character of our neighborhoods and how, uh, you know, the, the, there is sort of a way the streets are and how development is supposed to be internalized to the site. So, you know, I take issue when, um, things come forward and try to change them after the fact because good planning wasn't implemented at the start. And I don't mean that uh, against our planners. I just mean, generally speaking, no one thought out all of the parking pieces and maybe even the people that buy the properties purchase something without planning where they're going to put uh, their multiple vehicles. Um, so I, I struggle with these sorts of things and I look forward to the report coming forward by transportation. I hope they talk to planning about that uh, and some of the concepts and in the questions that I asked. And uh, I think as a council, we should turn our minds to this issue because um, it's changing the city around us and it's not necessarily making people happy. Um, so thank you very much for allowing me to speak about this. I do think it's an important issue. Thank you. Councillor Thompson to speak. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank um, certainly Councillor Perks for holding this on behalf of Councillor Carroll. And thanks uh, to Councillor Carroll for her attention to this matter, and along with Councillor Holliday. Uh, Speaker, I can tell you that um, if you could uh, hear my frustration probably about three years ago when this particular application had come forward, I had seen it, recognized it was going to be a problem, brought the concerns uh, to planning and transportation and others, but um, to no success. Um, the reason why I brought this forward was just to the east uh, at Zezelway and Quinier, which is another site. We had a similar situation and um, recognized it at that point and uh, tried to work with our planning team and so on. And of course, that didn't work out. It also uh, comes down to the fact that we have um, you know, developers, property owners who are selling um, units in, in these uh, development sites. Uh, where um, not enough uh, planning uh, efforts has been made towards ensuring that there's sufficient parking on site. Um, and in fact, at the same time, uh, those who are actually buying in these developments, and I think Councillor Carroll, I think, pointed out, and, and where, you know, they say they have one car, but in fact, they have four, um, and or the properties are rented out and so on uh, to people who have multi multiple cars and so on, and it creates a huge problem. Um, I, I'm 
you know, in, I'm, I'm encouraged by Miss Grace um, uh, uh, comments about the work that's being done and that the work actually is being done. Um, this has been a very difficult um, situation, both in terms of the Jollyway and Quinier Zezelway area. Uh, my staff and I, we have looked every way in which to find alternative options for people to park. Uh, to the east, there is a green pea parking that's under the overpass there, and uh, we had formulated uh, an arrangement with uh, green pea for the residents and so on. Some took it up, and most didn't, and of course, it also becomes a matter of uh, community safety, where people are parking, parking in laneways and uh, garbage trucks are not able to get through, fire trucks are not able to get through and so on. So um, we have resolved um, to try to bring a solution. And uh, this, uh, regrettably, is the only solution that we could bring forward. Um, and as Council Carroll has pointed out, um, you know, this is not free. And in fact, uh, this will be a process that we will go through with the residents. Uh, next month, the report will come forward with respect to the details surrounding this. We're asking for the approval today in terms of the exclusion of the exemption with respect to you know the uh, chapter 925 to permit parking on Jolly Way and so on. Um, this is the third of this kind that has taken place uh, in the ward. And, um, you know, I've continued to talk with our planning team and our transportation team and so on. I hope that this to be the last. Um, I loathe this idea that simply that after you build it, then you find a parking solution. Well, you shouldn't find the parking solutions before. And this is something that we have been talking with uh, the staff about and others about and so on. And um, I'm not very pleased, actually, to bring this forward to members of council and to ask for your support today. But it comes down to a matter of, this is the only option that's actually available uh, to resolve this particular manner in a safe uh, manner. Uh, you know, to get fire trucks in, to get garbage trucks in, it's it's been incredibly difficult and so on. So I do appreciate members um, sort of looking into this a little further and asking the appropriate questions which you've asked today. And I appreciate your support uh, on on this particular item, uh, in as much as uh, it it actually is not something that. I'm ecstatic or energized about because I think that we should resolve these problems before it becomes a city problem uh, because it's just left to us to resolve. You would not, I can, I can tell you the amount of phone calls that I, my office have received from residents and wanting solutions. We've had varying calls and varying meetings to try to resolve this. And so we've all faced this difficult situation and um, I do appreciate the support of uh, members of council, but. Uh, going forward, it is not something that I would be encouraging that we continue to do on a one-off basis. Thank you very much. Thank you. On the item, show of hands, on favor, pose the penny, carry. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we'll go back to item Council Wong Tam, i.e. 24.7. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. If uh, there are no questions of other uh, members, maybe we can proceed. Because I don't have questions of staff, I just want to replace one recommendation from committee. Okay, if, uh, do, do we have any questions uh, to staff on this item? It's on the screen. Okay, Councillor Wong Tam, you have a motion you want to uh, bring forward? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, my motion is to delete recommendation number five, uh, sorry, number nine, and then to replace it with an alternative motion number nine. Uh, the original motion was to have the general manager of Parks, Forestry, Recreation to report back to this uh, IEC committee on. Uh, the impacts of uh, the Ontario line on some of the public spaces, including the downtown parks. Uh, in conversations with staff, they felt that the best w approach was to have Metrolinks uh, provide us that information. Um, and the information that I'm seeking, Madam Speaker, is to have Metrolinks uh, work with the, the GM of parks to identify city projects that will be impacted by the Ontario line, uh, for them to work with appropriate city staff to reduce the adverse financial and scheduling impacts, to ensure that we can prioritize building back better uh, when it comes to restoring any of those public spaces uh, and to create a community liaison committee with uh, the ward councillors 
so that uh, we can ensure that local communities can provide some foot feedback and input throughout the process. Um, and Madam Speaker, just uh, so everyone understands that recommendation number nine that came from the committee was originally um, my recommendation that went to the committee, so thank you to the committee for adopting it. Um, it was largely after consultation with staff that uh, they felt that it could be further refined. So that is now the new motion that's being placed uh, in front of City Council today. I want to thank um, uh, the the, the Parks Department and uh, within uh, the planning policy uh, shop within the Parks Department for all their work with TO Core. Um, it's certainly not easy, uh, especially with respect to how much a city changes. I do want to recognize that it's um, it's in particularly, um, uh, there are particular challenges when you're trying to, to plan for a community, and in this case, communities and neighborhoods that are under tremendous pressure for growth. I think we can all recognize that uh, anywhere along the transit corridor, especially where you're seeing significant in um, uh, development pressures, uh, there's also the, the pressure not just on, on the transit infrastructure, but there's going to be pressure on green space, whether or not it's adequate. Uh, for the growing population uh, that uh, is anticipated. There's going to be pressure on the sidewalk widths. There's pressures just about everywhere. And as we try to build neighborhoods that are livable, that are sustainable, that are, that are human scale friendly, I think we need to be able to plot it all together. And that, uh, of course, which, which is what the TO Core secondary plan was about. Uh, Councillor Layton at the committee, I think, uh, highlighted a very important point. Uh, and that point was that when the Ford government was first elected, they took our brand new secondary plan and the city hasn't had one for the downtown in 25 years. And what they did was they lifted the minimum heights for the buildings. So all of a sudden, um, there is no limited, uh, there's no limit to the heights of what some of these buildings um, uh, are about. And we're gonna continue to see tremendous development pressure. What uh, the previous item was just debated about is just one little example of what happens when we don't plan well. So building for the sake of building, not planning for parking infrastructure, that's just accommodations for cars and drivers. That has a ripple effect when you're building a tower that's 700 units large and you've got 100 parking spots set aside. It doesn't work at the end of the day. Same thing when you're building a building for 700 units and you have no dog relief area in a park or there's no playground and or at least adequate playground for two sets of, uh, of ages uh, for the children. Where are the seniors going to go? So forth and so forth. Um, and parks are a critical part of that social infrastructure that all our communities uh, demand from us. So Thank you to staff and thank you to the committee for your support. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to this item um, and hopefully we can have your support moving forward because um, we've been planning for we've been planning for a lot of the park restorations um, and now a lot of our work is going to be put on hold, literally iced over because now we're now it's going to be disrupted with another potential eight years of construction for the Ontario line before we get back to park restoration. Thank you very much. Thank you. So on the amendment, show of hands. Opposed, if any, carried. Item is amended. All in favor, carried. Thank you. So, Councillor Fletcher, are you ready for your item, i.e. 2413? Speaker, I am. Okay, so if you, can, thank, uh, uh, if you can put your name on the screen. Do you have oh, a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I will. Apologies. Yeah. Do you have questions to staff? No, I just have a motion now. Okay. I can't get on CMP. You can't get on? Does anybody no. does anybody else have questions to staff? If you can please put your name on the screen. No. Okay, Councillor Fletcher. Uh to speak. I'm just having trouble getting on CMP, Speaker. Okay, your but, name's there. If you want to speak. Pardon me? Yeah, you can speak now. Oh, thank you very much. You um, this is uh, really just related to traffic mitigation, in particular cycling, and it has been a very difficult project. This isn't our project. This is the Gardner takedown, long awaited, long debated, 
and um, it's a project that's being done by Waterfront Toronto because, of course, they're doing all the Portland's uh, flood mitigation and development of Villiers Island. It's an attachment to that project. But so far, the steps that have been taken to keep cycling safe against a very popular trail to get across town has been very, very difficult. So the latest is just spray painted uh, on asphalt that there's a cycling detour. It's a great cycling detour. It's separated. Everybody looked at it. It's fantastic but nobody knows about it. They're all going the wrong way. So this is just a motion to basically say, get that fixed, um, which I had to hold because at October 26th, I and E, we're gonna get the update as to why those things were improperly done. But now this is to be very urgent, get it fixed. It's, I'm bitterly disappointed. I'm upset that cyclists are not being well treated in traffic mitigation here or thought about this is a popular trail. It's one of the main trails across the river. And um, it's, it, I can't figure out why for a project of this nature that the uh, contractor and Waterfront Toronto have not been more proactive in getting this sorted out. So let's get them to do it along with our city uh, staff, Waterfront Secretariat, General Manager, and give them a date, have it done by midnight, October 7th in preparation for the weekend. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor McKelvey. Thank you. Three minutes clarification of the motion. Uh, thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Um, totally appreciate what you're doing and understand why. I just wanted to know in timing, in terms of timing, if you have spoken with uh, the appropriate people to know if they could get that signage done by October 7th. I've heard that there's signage printing backlogs across the city. So just, I'm a little worried because you put a very specific date on there you know what? And, I, I yeah. could councillor McKelvey I could call a sign company and I could have a digital sign there in five minutes I could have any sign on that property the city owns it in five minutes okay five digital minutes. sorry digital was the part I, I didn't know because I know oh, I, I could have any kind I could have a mag okay. magnetic sign there that's large telling every cyclist detour can't get across the river it's so simple I okay. put them up for no, I just wanted to make sure you're amenable to by ever what it means necessary to have that sign digital by whatever means whatever, necessary. Right. And if I have to do it myself out of my councillor budget, okay. believe me, I will. Councilor okay, I'll bring an auger and I'll go with you. Okay, thank you. Okay. What are you gonna bring me? Thank you. Okay, on the amendment by Councillor Fletcher. On favor, show of hands, post if any carried. Item is amended on favor. Show of hands carry. Thank you. Our next and maybe I'll just do that, Councillor McKelvey. Our next item is E T 27.4109125 George Street and 231 Richmond. It's here without a recommendation. Councillor Wong Tam, you held the item down. If you can put your uh, name yes, ma'am. Put your name on the list. Ma'am speak. Yes. If you have if sorry. The yes, I was going to say that the item still needs to be held down because we're expecting a supplementary report from planning staff. Sorry about the echo. Okay, we'll continue holding it down. So the next one is related T twenty seven nine twenty seven point nine. So you're still waiting for that one as well. Yes, Madam Speaker, correct. All right, so we'll go to T2728, Portland's Flood Protection. Councillor Fletcher, you held the item down. Do you have questions to staff? If you can put your name on the screen. Getting back on CMP speaker, and I can't even see the screen. Hang on, please. Thank you. Okay, do you have questions to staff? Councillor Fletcher, do you have questions to staff? Sorry, Speaker. I just finally got back on CMP, and I'm asking you which one we are on. Uh, Portland, no, we did that. No, we're on T2728, which you held down to Portland's flood protection. 
Oh, no. Uh, no, I don't have that. That's been answered in the other way. Thank you. That was kind of attached to the um, to the I and E motion. I had to put them at two different committees because there's jurisdiction from Toronto East York on one part of it and jurisdiction from Council uh, I and E on the other. So I'm fine with this now. It's great. Thanks so much. So you'll release it, right? Okay. T Thank you happily. T twenty seven twenty eight. Councillor Fletcher is releasing on favor. Show of hands. Opposed to Penny Carey. We'll go to CC thirty six point two one eighty seven King Street and sixty five George Street. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, I have no questions, Madam Speaker. I'm prepared to dispense with the item now. Okay. CC 36.2, Councillor Wong Tam is releasing. On favor, show of hands, carry. CC 36.3, alterations to heritage property at 187 King Street East. Councillor Wong Tam, you're prepared to release that as well with the confidential report? Yes, correct. Moving the attachment. Hold on. Okay. So we just Okay, the motion is on the screen by Councillor Wong Tam. Okay, Councillor Wong Tam, if you can just please read it. Uh, yes, thank you Mayor, very much, Madam Speaker. The City Council amend the confidential instructions to staff and the confidential attachment one to the report August 19, 2021 from the solicitor, city solicitor in accordance with a confidential attachment to the transmittal September 1st, 2021 from the Toronto Preservation Board. Okay. <clears throat> On favor, show of hands. Opposed, if any, carried. Our next one is cease. Oh, sorry. Item is amended. On favor, show of hands, carried. Our next item is CC 36.8, 1460 Victoria Park Avenue. Deputy Mayor Men and Wong, you held the item down. Do you have questions to staff? Well, no, Madam Chair, I'm waiting for um, direction from staff because this is still ongoing and I haven't received any motions um, from staff on this. Um, my understanding is that this is still in it's still going on. So I, I'd like to continue holding it. Right. Next item is CC 36.13, 314, 15, 16, 17, and 25 Bogert Avenue. Bogert. Councillor Fitton. Um, you held the item down. I'm, uh, Do you have questions? Yes, I'm still late. No, I'm waiting for um, uh, a motion from staff on this, uh, Madam Speaker. Okay, like, well, I don't understand. We're all waiting for motions from staff. Are staff going to present these motions or do we, you know, we're following the agenda. So what do you want to do with these items? So, all right. CC 3615, request related to 311, 311 calls. Councillor Fletcher, do you have questions to staff? Yes, uh, yes I do, Speaker. Okay, so if you can put your name on the screen. Oh yeah, of course. Thank you, I'm in. I just, uh, okay, Councillor Fletcher, Jeff, go ahead. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm just uh, interested John, in another piece about, sorry, your mic's on, Francis. I apologize, just apologize, sorry. Yeah. There we go, okay. Uh, it's come to my attention that people that live outside of the city that may own property in the city don't have access to 311 in the same way as a uh, somebody living in the city is that true or not 
Hi, it's Gary York from 301. Uh, 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 through the speaker, actually, th there's two options of where you can uh, contact 311. You can dial just 311 based upon your, your geographical location, or there's a 416 number that you can also dial that you'll have direct access to 311. Uh, the oh, the uh, is sometimes, sorry? Um, do, I'll give you the example if you don't mind. Sure. So I only have five minutes, so I've got a no very problem. specific case where many people in the um, have moved out. They've gone and moved out of the city uh, during the pandemic, and but they still own property. And some people are selling property. They are trying to get in touch with various city officials in order to close the sale. Apparently, when they're calling 311, they're being advised 311 does not have them on the same priority as somebody who might be a resident of the city now. And I'm quite concerned that there's two types of and they were denied service in that way. Does that surprise you or was that correct or incorrect that that should have happened? Uh, uh, through the chair, I'm a bit surprised. And if we can uh, get the information offline, I'll follow up with that directly. That they were told to phone the phone number, 416, whatever, rather than have 311 handle their request, they were bumped off a request by 311 and in an urgent situation. What would what should have happened there? Uh, we, we don't really re reject anyone from the city of Toronto if you're a citizen or resident. Even if you're not a resident, we would still uh, relocate or, or do a transfer, a warm transfer to another location. So what other should, location would that be? What, what are, warm transfer are you talking about? For example, if someone's going uh, calling from another location, such as, oh. for example, Durham or yeah. Mississauga, uh, but they're still con contacting our in infrastructure or our system, we would do a warm transfer or a transfer to that location. So we would not just refuse service to that particular resident. This is somebody who lives, uh, somebody calling from Durham who lived in Durham, didn't have a property in Toronto, would probably get a different service um, direction than somebody who owned property in Toronto or lived in Toronto. But I think there's two standards for people that don't live in the city but own property in the city. Would you not agree with me that's a different than somebody calling in from Durham or Mississauga about a pothole they saw in the 401? Uh, uh, through the speaker, uh, actually, I don't see a difference. To be very honest with you, we deal with people uh, dealing with provincial, federal, um, and, and municipal issues uh, across many uh, territories. So we would not refuse service, and there shouldn't be a different level of service. Uh, like I said, I, I'd, I'd have no issues following up that individually uh, offline to, to default that and make sure that that's rectified in a timely fashion. Could you just explain to me again what a warm transfer is, please? Absolutely. So a warm transfer uh, through the chair, uh, a warm transfer is, for example, let's say you've called in counselor to 311. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it, you're at the city of Durham, for example, or I would say Mississauga. Uh, right now, what we've agreed to do uh, from a conceptual perspective is not to necessarily do a warm transfer, but do a transfer. Uh, there's a reason for this, uh, but in the event, transfer for, example, for what? Give me an example of that. Uh, we would transfer, for example, let's say you have a property tax or, or sorry, a, a, jurisdic a jurisdictional question. That is now that of Durham and not that of the uh, city of Toronto. We would transfer that to the 311 uh, Durham location. This is not the same. This is somebody that will not need, they, they're, they need information for their home. They need information from Toronto Public Service because they're paying taxes in the city of Toronto. That, I don't understand why they would be transferred somewhere or no, after. Transfer them. We would provide them service if they, if they if they have proof of identity, and we know exactly who we're talking to. Didn't the happen. The property within the city of Toronto. We'd provide them with that service. It did so not once happen. again, I have no issues. I could call them directly and have that conversation and make sure that he or she gets that appropriate service. Perhaps would you agree that perhaps uh, the staff don't quite understand that that you're from outside, but you own property. You're calling about your property in the city of Toronto. You are treated as a city of Toronto resident. You are not transferred to another. Jurisdiction. Is it possible that that needs to be reinforced? That was uh, through the councillor. That was your last Sorry. question. Yeah, through the chair. One hundred percent, and I'll make sure that that's rectified and communication sent to the floor in, in that manner. Thank you very much. Thank You're very you. welcome. Councillor Cole, questions. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say uh, congratulations for the incredible work that 311 has done through the pandemic, Mr. York, and please pass on our 
gratitude to the staff. I mean, it's just been incredible what they've been facing. So the question I have is, uh, uh, have we had an increase in calls uh, during the pandemic as opposed to pre-pandemic on, uh, let's say, a weekly, monthly basis? Uh, 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 through the chair, that's a great question. First of all, thank you very much for your kind comments. And in terms of call uh, calls, absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, we've had a, about a 30% spike in calls related to COVID-related issues around enforcement, pandemic-related concerns, even the vaccinations or enforcement of that vaccination. Yeah, so that's been the uh, uptick as, as a result of the uh, masking rules, people obeying the COVID protocols. So that's been the big uh, cause of the increase of 30%. 30% did you say? Wow, that's amazing. Absolutely. And uh, next to uh, COVID calls, I know my office, I would think, uh, next to COVID is traffic calls. Uh, you know, everything related to uh, traffic. Uh, what are you uh, finding at, uh, overall in the city? Uh, absolutely, because of the seasonality of it, ebbs and flows. So uh, a good example, right now we're getting a tremendous amount of calls for potholes. Um, so we're going to have that. We'll also have waste and garbage uh, uh, calls. Uh, that that's pretty consistent. So I would say transportation, the waste, uh, solid waste, or two, uh, oh, and also MLS infractions would be the three ones that we're getting a lot of on a regular basis. And if someone doesn't have English as a first language, uh, and they call three one one, how can they access a staff person uh, that uh, can uh, assist them? Uh, Let's say they speak uh, Mandarin or Cantonese or uh, Portuguese. What happens there? Uh, uh, through the chair, and thank you. That's a great question. Uh, we actually have access to interpreters in the language line. So as long as you communicate the language, even if you just said Mandarin without anything else, we'd be able to uh, immediately co uh, connect you with an interpreter and provide you services in that nature. And just, just to, to build on that, uh, we are releasing something in October with the new release of 311. And the great thing about that is, for example, when you're online and you want to, to, to communicate in French, Italian, uh, Mandarin, or what have you, you can now communicate in the city in any language of choice. Yeah, so the, the actual content gets translated so you can communicate in that language back and forth, forth. And those records also get communicated and tracked in that way as well. Uh, yes, and in terms of uh, the total number, I know I think last year or 20 or uh, i can't remember the year i think we received a total of 1.3 million calls the 311 uh, yeah, through the uh, through the chair yes 1.3 million calls and about 4 million uh, 4.2 million overall transactions uh with 311 what do you mean by transactions uh so for example uh thank you great great question so for example we have 1.3 million calls but we also have knowledge base and online tools as well so our public are actually having at least 3 million interactions through 311 through our, our portal on a year-to-year -year basis. So you wanna make sure that, for example, with the evolution of the services that we're providing, uh, for example, right now you can only do 100 of those 600 services online. As of the end of October, you'll be able to do all 600 services online and make it simpler for the, the public to connect and track uh, and hold the city accountable for the delivery of services. Anyways, thank you uh, very much, Mr. York. Thank you for your great work. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay, speakers, if you'd like to speak, if you can put your name on the list. I'm just happy to move it. Councillor Fletcher, you would like to speak? Yes, I just was very happy that uh, Mr. York indicated he would do some whatever he needs to do so that staff aren't sending off people that are property taxpayers and own houses in the city to the same route as those that don't own anything in the city are calling about something in the city, like a pothole they've seen on the 401 or something mm -hmm. of that kind or on the Gardner. Uh, on a public street that uh, they need to have a cert uh, is for them. 311 is for residents. And even though you might live away when you still have your home here and you have an urgent situation with your home, 
it seems very odd that those calls would be redirected in a different way. And I'm just I'm glad that I was able to ask Mr. York those questions and have his undertaking that that will be fixed because one of my constituents had his home closing. Somebody's shuffling their papers. I think it might be you, Madam Speaker, with your mic on there. Thank you. And he had a deadline for his closure. He no longer lived in Toronto, but he was selling his Toronto home. He had called six or seven times. He had called, he'd been rerouted. Finally, he had to call my office. I was happy to help him. But I just think on those moments, maybe it's a broken water main. Maybe it's something of that nature that's an emergency for your property that we need to be more in tune that those are people that have the a fast track urgent 311 for City of Toronto residents. And um, I know 311's been very, very busy during during the pandemic. And uh, again, uh, Councillor Cole thanked Mr. York and his staff for that, and I would agree. Uh, we do get regular updates on 311, how effective, uh, time lag and response, et cetera, to have things cleared. So that's an ongoing discussion in the city at committee, which is very helpful. But this is one that I'm happy to have fixed here today. And thank you very much, Mr. York. Okay, thank you. Are the there... recommendation, Speaker. Yeah, thanks. Okay, sorry. Um, are there any further speakers? Councillor Cole to speak. Yes, uh, yeah, no, listen, I think this is a great opportunity, uh, not only to deal with individual uh, situations, but, uh, you know, just to commend the frontline uh, workers at the city. Uh, that handle thousands of calls a day, emails, uh, and as Mr. York said, uh, I, I don't know if other councillors have uh, been logging it, but we've noticed a real uptick in uh, uh, complaints and uh, issues, especially during COVID over the last, uh, uh, you know, almost two years now that uh, uh, there have been so many uh, questions, comments, uh, people uh, trying to get interpretations of new uh, COVID rules and protocols. And uh, so, you know, and as Mr. York said, there's been a 30% increase way above and beyond the norm. So I just think as counselors, we've got to really uh, speak out and appreciate the frontline work that uh, all the staff at 311 are doing and the patients they have. I know the reports we're getting back from uh, residents at Eglins and Lawrence are very positive. Uh, like any other uh, city service, there's not 100% uh, uh, satisfaction. But on the other hand, I, I think there is a general trend of increased satisfaction with our 311 service and their follow through, their tracking. Uh, and um, I know it's a constant battle to keep reminding people that if you have a complaint or an issue, uh, that uh, you know, if you call into 311, at least uh, city officials will have a record of the number of complaints. I know we had a serious issue with Caledonia Park over the summer uh, where the park was getting out of control, but many of the residents who complained had never even called 311, so we had no sort of record of uh, the complaints. So uh, we we're constantly trying to remind uh, residents that uh, you know, when you uh, put forward that uh, issue on 311, you'd at least have a record of the number of complaints. Therefore, when we as councillors talk to uh, bylaw or the police, uh, uh, we can say that there are here are the number of complaints. It's just not one or two people. So, and I, and I think, uh, again, the reminder that 311 is available to people of all languages. Uh, uh, and I, I think that, uh, uh, they have to be comfortable with the fact is that they can speak in their uh, first language. I think that's another added feature of 311. But I, I just want to again uh, uh, say a, a big thank you to uh, all the uh, frontline people of 311 for their patience, their understanding, their efficiency and knowledge of the city. That's the other thing I'm getting back. And uh, 
people are saying, you know, the people 311 really know the issue or they know the background, they know who to direct me to. So uh, I think it's a rare opportunity uh, when we as counselors uh, get this chance to uh, uh, send on our appreciation on behalf of our residents to the uh, workers uh, in all city departments, but especially in 311 that uh, is really an incredible uh, gateway to city services and city issues. So uh, again, I, I just hope Mr. York passes on uh, our appreciation uh, to uh, the staff and to uh, just keep uh, doing uh, this uh, outstanding uh, uh, work on behalf of the residents of the City of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further speakers? On the item, show of hands, on favor, opposed if any carried. We do have two members motions that we'd like to introduce. Deputy Mayor Minnewong. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Can you put up the motion, please? Is about the Don Valley Parkway? No, no, that's not it. That's multi-tenant housing. No, no. I think hold we're dealing with that this afternoon. No, no, hold on. We do have your motion. Hold on. We'll put it on the, the Don screen. Valley Parkway one? Yes. Yes. Just hold on. Okay. Just give us a second. All the time you want, Madam Speaker. I'll give you five minutes. No, you're supposed to say that to me. Okay, there it is on the screen. There it is on the screen. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is a request for Metrolinx to do some road paving work and they have to close uh, a DVP ramp. So I'd like to introduce that, please. Okay, on favor, show of pants, carried. Councillor Fletcher, you have a member's motion you'd like to introduce? It's on the screen. Councillor Fletcher. Speaker, this is uh, really urgent because the consultation period closes on October 24th before our next meeting. Thank you. Okay, on favor. Show of hands, carried. Okay, so members, uh, just, I need some direction. Uh, we have four items um, that um, we're waiting for staff, for a staff report. And then we have two items that is, uh, um, that we're dealing with after the members motion. That was two timed items and it is 5 to 12. So I like to have a question. Should we um, su to suggest that we break for lunch now and come back at 1.30 or have an extended lunch hour to 2? What's the wish? Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd move we break for lunch now and come back at 1.30. Madam Chair, can I, uh, it's, it's uh, Denzel Minnewong, can I offer a third alternative? Um, what do people think about uh, varying the procedures and doing members' motions right now? Uh, I'm good with speaker, that. Too. I would fully support that. I'm good. I'll, I'll withdraw my motion. Uh, but it will probably take more than a half hour. I think we do as much as we can till twelve thirty. A lot of head nodding. I would even actually see where we go at 12 30 if there are three or four left like just push through but i mean i say we start members motions now and see how far we get seconded exactly okay with that okay. on a couple of moving um, and seconding I'm, speaker how can i'm um it? sorry members but uh we'll have to come back uh for the motions at two o'clock. Uh, 
Speaker, we have a Deputy Mayor Minim Wong and Councillor Perks consensus. How do we yeah. not seize that moment? I'm with Grimes. Grimes, bring back your motion. I second Grimes' motion. I'll, I'll put it back on the floor. Yeah. Speaker. Let's have a report, speaker. Madam uh, Speaker. Okay, point come on, order. come on. Uh, can you order. please, can you please calm down? Hold on, just for one minute, please. Madam Speaker, on a point of order, perhaps yeah. the clerk would like to explain what he said over a microphone so people understand that it's a clerk situation, not a political situation. Right. Okay, just one sec, please. Okay. Okay, we have a motion by Deputy Mayor, uh, Mayor Menawang to start the member's motion now to see what we can get done to, uh, to by 12.30. On favor, show of hands. Carried. Okay. Give us a minute so we can get the get it prepared for the screen. What happened to Grimes's motion? I'm okay to withdraw it if we can do the member motions. Okay, members, we'll start with MM 36.1. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Etobicoke York Committee Council, a two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands, carried. On the item, all in favor, show of hands, carried. MM 36.2, notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral, show of hands, carried on the item, all in favor, carried. MM 36.3, notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 36.4. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. 
This motion relates to an Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 36.5. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Executive Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands. Carried. On Madam Speaker, uh, Michael Ford would like to, like to hold. hold. Okay, just one sec. Councillor Ford, do you like to hold? Yes, please. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thirty six point six. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an alcohol and gaming commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 36.7. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to a reopening of item T 24.51. A two thirds vote is required to reopen that item. If reopened, the previous council decision remains in force unless council decides otherwise. All in favor of reopening? Show of hands. Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 36.8. Notice if this motion has been given, this motion is subject to referral to the Executive Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands, carried. On the item, all in favor, carried. MM 36.9. Notice if this motion has been given, this motion is subject to referral to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands. Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. Hold. Who, uh, I'm sorry, hold. I didn't hear. Who said hold? Stephen Holliday. Okay, Councillor Holliday is holding number nine. MM 36.10, notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to reopening of item T 23.9. A two thirds vote is required to reopen that item. If reopened, the previous council decision remains in force unless council decides otherwise. All in favor of waiving to oh, uh, reopen? Show of hands, carried. On the item, all in favor, carry. MM 36.11. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands. Carried on the item. All in favor? Carried. MM 36.12. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the General Government and Licensing Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands. Carried on the item. All in favor? Carried. MM 
MM 3613. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Planning and Housing Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried on the item. All in favor? Carried. MM 3614, notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the General Government and Licensing, Licensing Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. Vote. Pardon? Recorded vote. Recorded vote. Put up the motion so we can see it. it. It's on the screen. It's on the screen, Councillor Cole. Speaker, the motion to waive referral does not carry. The vote is 13 to 9. Uh, it fails to meet the two-thirds threshold. Okay, MM 3615. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried on the item. All in favor? Hold, please. Stephen Holliday. Okay, Councillor Holliday. On 15. MM 36.16. Notice of this motion has been given. Given a, a, This motion is subject to referral to the Executive Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands. Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3617. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands. Carried on the item. All in favor? Madam, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, if I may, I have a motion that was advanced circulated uh, working with Councillor um, McKelvey uh, just to uh, relieve some of the burden of staff reports on our EED staff. Um, so it's to amend recommendation one for it to be a briefing note rather than a report back. Sorry, not one. Um, so did you want to hold the, four. Councillor Layton, do you want to hold no, the it's been No, it's been advanced circulated. Do we, do I know we, we have a busy meeting. Do we have it? Okay. If we can show it then. Okay, there it is on the screen. All 
On the amendment, on favor, carried. Item is amended on favor, carried. MM 3618, notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. On favor of waiving referral, carried on the item on favor. Madam Speaker, I'd like I need to, hold to it. I, I, I'd like yes, to hold if, it. if one of us could hold this item down. Okay, Councillor McKelvey or Councillor Layton? I'm happy to hold. Councillor McKelvey. MM 36.19. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Executive Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands. Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 36.20. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Executive Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3621. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral <coughs> to the Planning and Housing Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? All in favor? Carried on the item. All in favor? Carry. <sighs> MM thirty six twenty two. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to reopening of item T24.10. A two thirds vote is required to reopen that item. If reopened, the previous council decision remains in force unless council decides otherwise. All in favor of reopening? Show of hands. Carried on the item. All in favor? Carried. MM 3623. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Planning and Housing Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried on the item. All in favor? Carried. MM 3624. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Executive Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor? Recorded vote on the re recorded vote on the waive referral motion, Madam Speaker. Sorry, I, oh yes, that's right. Okay, recorded vote on the referral. Yeah. Because you have no options after that. You, you, if you will, if we want to refer it. Councillor Fletcher, please. And Mayor Tory, your vote, please. Speaker, the motion to waive referral carries. The vote is 20 to 4. And Speaker, I'll, I'll hold the motion then. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Carroll can hold it. That's fine. So, Councillor Carroll, you're holding MM 3624? Thank you. Didn't Councillor Thompson second that motion? 
Yeah. Yes, he did. I did. I did. I voted the wrong way, but I won't ask for a, a re-vote on it. So it's fine. I don't want to waste council's time. I am in favor of uh, the referral. So do we? Do we? Do we need to take? No. Okay. No, no speaker, I'm I don't still need a re-vote, I think. Madam Speaker, I have, a, I have a quick amendment that I think is friendly. I may be able to release it after lunch. It's friendly. MM3625. Notice that this motion is, has been given this motion subject to referral to the Executive Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. On favor. Madam Speaker, can I get the, Madam Speaker, may I get a uh, recorded vote on, on both uh, if, there's two, if there's two votes? Okay, recorded vote. What's this vote on? What are we voting on? It's on the screen, Councillor Cole, from to waive referral. Waiving referral. Like, thank you. Actually, if it's waived, I'd like to hold it, please. Speaker, the motion to waive referral carries. The vote is 19 to 5. Hold, Min and Wong. Hold it, please. Min it's and Josh Wong is, is, is holding it. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, I, I really did previously ask to hold it. Madam, Madam Speaker, point of order. Sorry. Councillor Peruzza. Sorry, Madam Speaker. I, I voted the wrong way on this one. I, I'm sorry, I made, I made a mistake. So, please do recognize that I that I did ask. Are you to asking to, for us to vote again, Councillor Peruzza? Please. Okay, motion to reopen. Councillor Grimes, you. on favor. Let's okay. Let's let's redo it to waive referral. So, Madam Speaker, may I please hold my motion? Yes. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate both. that. Speaker, the motion to waive referral carries. The vote is 21 to 3. Um, Madam Chair, I have a point of order. Deputy Mayor Minnewong. I recognize that you've sort of given the, you, you've let Councillor Matlow hold the item and, and I don't, I won't challenge that, but you just did something that we haven't done before, which anyone can use next time, which is you've allowed a hold before the vote has been announced by the clerk. And so next time around, if someone wants to call a hold out before that time and use this as an example, you might have to do that. We typically always wait until the clerk announces um, what the vote is on whether an item is before us or not before you accept uh, someone to speak out and say, I'd like to hold that item. You did it this time and, and you've actually created, I think, some confusion for the future. Yeah, I believe that Councillor Matlow, when uh, we put the motion on the screen and asked uh, for recordable for referral, it was at that time that he asked he hold the item down. Can, can we can we just be clear that a member cannot call for a hold until the clerk announces the vote? Is that your is that still your ruling? Yes, that's what normally the ruling is. Okay. And. 
No, no, it's just for the future because then no, everyone I know. will call hold. I know, but, it, but, but Deputy Mayor, you know that when we go through these members' motion, you have five or six members of council yelling at the same time. Um, no, I'm it, not, it, it's I'm not saying difficult. you don't have a hard time. It's very difficult I'm not saying you for us to monitor. Um, I know you have to pick. I just want to know for the, in the future that I, that I can't, that no member of council can call okay. it beforehand. Th thank you. Thank you, Deputy Stop Mayor. Stop this, please. It's insufferable. Pardon me? At M M M Major point. MM3626. All right, Speaker, uh, on a point of order, uh, I would just like to get clarification when, uh, on, on the point that the Deputy Mayor raised, uh, just because it's, it's, it's good to know what the rules are and that those rules continue to be in place, because uh, I think I, I heard it all, and I, I commend the Deputy Mayor for not actually tying us up in you know, him objecting to all this, but I just think it's important we know what the rules are going forward uh, on this, because in this case, it seemed to be two different things were done in, within the space of one minute on this. So it's just if we wanted, just if somebody could clarify, perhaps the clerk, what the rule is with respect to when you can hold this. And, and just so for the future, it's very clear on the record what the rule is, whatever happened now, because the deputy mayor is not disputing that. And I thank him for that. Madam Speaker, my advice to you is that uh, uh, holds should not be announced until council has decided whether or not to waive referral. Uh, so until council has decided to waive referral, the um, council has not decided whether to add the item to the agenda and consider it today at the meeting. So therefore, uh, it, my advice to you would be that members should wait until the results of the vote on waiving referral are announced. Thank you very much. MM3626, notice the <laughs> Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Planning and Housing Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands. Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM3627. Notice that this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Planning and Housing Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the Chair. All in favor of waiving notice? Carried. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM3628. Notice that this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Economic and Community Development Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice? Recorded. Recorded. Recorded for to waive notice? Okay. Recorded vote. Yes. Madam Speaker, is this on the motion to waive referral? Yes. No, Thank it's you. no. This motion is to waive notice. Speaker, the motion to waive notice carries. The vote is twenty-two to two. Hold, please, Councillor Perks. Okay. Well, hold on. We haven't introduced it yet. We, we just we just went through that. Um, okay, on favor of waiving referral, show of hands. Recorded vote. Recorded vote.
Just stand by for the vote screen, please, members. The voting panel is now open. The motion to waive referral carries. The vote is 20 to 4. Hold, please. Councillor Perks. Ma'am 3629. Notice if this motion has not been given. A two thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Planning and Housing Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice, show of hands, carried. All in favor of waiving referral, all in favor, carried. On the item, all in favor, carried. MM. Cool. MM 3630. Notice of this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Economic and Community Development Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice? Carried. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a point of order. Point of order. Um, do you think it can we uh, test uh, members' will to complete the notice of motion and extend to complete the notice of motion? And then extend. I'm the, happy. To, and then extend. I'm happy the, to move that motion. And then and you can extend the lunch. Sure. Hold on, please, no. please. It's hard. You want to move a motion to extend to complete introducing the members' motion. And then extend the lunch hour. Correct. So why don't? So what I'd like to move, Madam Chair, is I'll just simply move to extend to complete the uh, notice of motion. Okay. Motion by Deputy Mayor Min and Wong. On um, favor. I mean the rundown, not the debate. That's right. How many more are there to go? Can, I, can we have a can we have a recorded? Yeah, vote? recorded. So about fifteen. That. Sorry. Call. Madam Speaker, how many more are there to go? We're on 20. We're on 30. Nine. We're on 31. 30. And we have 40, 49. So 16 more. Yes. Uh, yeah. Some of us have lunch meetings, so recording oh, vote, please. Okay. I agree with you, Councillor Fillion. There's been a we request for on. a recorded vote. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Recorded vote on. Motion by Deputy Mayor Min and Wong. Come on, guys, let's not do this. Just stand by. We're just preparing the motion, members, for the vote. Just. Madam Chair, can I, I know we're not in a vote yet. I'm happy to withdraw my motion. It seems like a lot of councillors have other lunch commitments and I don't want to get in the way of that. Yeah. Okay, so Deputy Mayor is withdrawing the motion. Or Councillor Lai is eating already. She's so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you know how difficult it is when everybody is speaking at the same time? I would really appreciate that everyone, they don't speak at the same time. And we will have strict rules on members of council holding the item down. 
I would not recognize you into the motion has been, um, we, we've had the vote on moving referral. Recess to two o'clock. Enjoy your lunch, Councilor Chilai.
Council this meeting is Okay, thank you members of council. This meeting is now resumed. Members, uh, we will now resume the members motion run through. Following the run through, we will consider item PH 25.10 uh, uh, on framework for multi-tenant housing. Next members motion is MM 36.31. Notice of this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Planning and Housing Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the Chair. All in favor of waiving notice, show of hands. All in favor of waiving referral, show of hands. Carried. On the item. But I have a re could I have a court recorded vote, please, Speaker? Re Thank recorded you. vote. Councillor Bailau, can you enter your vote, please? Thank you. Councillor Fillion, are you able to enter your vote, please? Sorry, I'm having some technical problems. What uh, What are we voting on? We're voting on members motion MM3631. We're voting on the item, um, strengthening tree protection. Uh, in favor? Speaker, the item carries unanimously 22 in favor. Thank you. MM3632, notice of this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Planning and Housing Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the Chair. All in favor of waiving notice, show of hands, carried. All in favor of waiving referral? Recorded vote, Madam Speaker. On the, vote. on the referral? Recorded vote on the referral? Hello? Vote, Madam Speaker, on the vote. Okay, okay, let's, okay. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands, carried. On the item, recorded vote. Speaker, I don't know if it's just me, but I have a different motion uh, showing on the portal. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Councillor Fillion, please. Thank you. Oh, okay. Councillor Cole, are you uh, present in the meeting? Councillor Cole, please. Are you are you nearby? 
Madam Speaker, a vote has been answered by Councillor Cole, but I do not see him in the meeting. So uh, we will, oh, there he is. Thank you. Speak, speaker, the um, item yeah. carries 20 to one. All right. MM 3633. Notice of this motion has not been given. A two thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Planning and Housing Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice, show of hands. Carried. All in favor of waiving referral, show of hands. Carried. On the item, all in favor, carried. Okay. Go ahead. MM 3634. Notice that this motion has not been given. A two thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice, show of hands. Carried. All in favor of waiving referral, show of hands. Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3635. Notice of this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Etobicoke York Committee Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice, show of hands, carried. All in favor of waiving referral, show of hands, carried. On the item, all in favor, show of hands, carried. MM 3636. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda and is before council for debate. Oh, Grimes. Okay. Um, Councillor Grimes is holding. And point of order. Yes, point of order, Councilor Grimes. Uh, Madam Speaker, as requested on Friday, I'd like to deal with this after your item, after the mayor's uh, um, motion uh, item, and then your item. I'd like to deal with that after your item. Okay. Thank you. Like to vote on that? Yeah. So on Councilor Grimes' motion that this item be dealt um, after the my uh, timed item. On favor, carried. MM 3637. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is subject to reopening of item GL 2411. A two thirds vote is required to reopen that item. If reopened, the previous council decision remains in force unless council decides otherwise. All in favor of reopening the item? Carried. All in favor of the item? Carried. 
MM 3638. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item, on favor, carry. MM 3639. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item, on favor, carried. MM 3640. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item, on favor, carried. MM 3641. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to reopening of item T24.5. A two thirds vote is required to reopen that item. If reopened, the previous council decision remains in force unless council decides otherwise. All in favor of reopening the item? Show of hands. Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3642. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item, all in favor? Show of hands, carried. MM 3643. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is subject to reopening of item T26.8. A two thirds vote is required to reopen that item. If reopened, the previous council decision remains in force unless council decides otherwise. And Bill 787 and 88 have been submitted on this item. All in favor of reopening the item? Show of hands. Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3644. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is subject to reopening of item T24.4. A two thirds vote is required to reopen that item. If reopened, the previous council decision remains in force unless council decides otherwise. All in favor of reopening the item? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3645. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3646. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3647. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3648. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda as before council for debate. On the item, on um, favor. Get a recorded, please. A recorded vote, please. Recorded please. vote. Thank you.
The item carries unanimously, 22 in favor. MM 3649. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agendas before council for debate. On the item, on favor, carried. Okay, we'll now go to item, timed item, PH 2510. Do we have any questions to staff? Yes, just, we're just waiting for the portal, Madam Speaker, to put our names on. If, if we have any questions, if you can please put your name on the list. Uh, yeah, wait, just one second. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm having trouble getting to the list. I don't know if I'm the only one. Ms. On, Councillor Carroll, questions? Yes, Madam Speaker, my first question, before we get to questions of staff on the proposal, I have a, a, a procedural question, and I'd, I'd rather it not be part of my timing. Um, as we proceed through this item, I understand there are a number of motions that have to do with the, the subcommittee from the last time it was deferred to now, some improvements to be made to the proposal, but I understand there may also be a referral motion. So I'm wondering if we could understand procedurally should we still put those motions on the table? Would they go with the, would they, would they stay with the item if the item was referred? Okay, if you can just give us a minute. Thank you. Madam Speaker, uh, of course, if um, if an item is referred, then the amendments that have been made um, are not voted on. Um, the mover of a referral motion, I suppose, could uh, add the instruction that the uh, proposed amendments be forwarded to or uh, forwarded to the receiving body with the uh, with the item but uh, they would have no status, of course. Okay, thank you, thank you. That clarifies it for me. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Um, so my, my question of staff have to do with, with some of those improvements and, and uh, maybe as a result of questioning, uh, that can come to light. I'm wondering if we could ask, one of the most important concerns we heard from the community was concern that that in fact staff would not be able to to provide the level of enforcement to make that conversion and so there was a lot of discussion uh, about improving um the uh the staff complement for the for the first three years i'm wondering if staff would comment on that you were supportive of that request uh, uh were you not so thank you councillor carroll for the question yes um, the report has in it for additional resources and throughout the discussions over the past uh, few months, it's talked about speeding those in those resources up. We have it included in our budget uh, submission and we also have the posting on board that went up last week uh, for additional bylaw enforcement officers. 
Okay. And you've had a chance to review the the, the confidential uh, report, the the legal report. Do you agree with the the uh, the solicitors on that evaluation? Uh, so through the uh, through the chair, uh, I've had a chance, and yes, I do agree. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. One of the things that that is the biggest topic of conversation is the power of entry. Um, where there are illegal homes uh, in, in North York, Scarborough, and Etobicoke, where where we have nothing but illegal rooming houses, the challenge is power of entry. And and while there's always we've made multiple requests to the province to help us with that, they've made only uh, small changes through through City of Toronto Act and such. If we move to a legal licensed framework. Um, can you include the ability to get into that house in the licensing framework so that essentially it's an agreement between yourself and the operator of that rooming house? So, so now you are able to get in to do your inspections and such? Absolutely. That is the most significant improvement that this framework brings forward. It's beneficial to both the tenants uh, so that they're living in a safe condition and have annual inspections. And it's also beneficial to the landlords because the landlord now has clear guidelines on what they need to do. They need to follow the building code, the electrical code, the fire code, and it ensures uh, that the housing is up to the standards that the city uh, demands. And it, it's, it's again, it's good for the tenants, it's good for the community, and it's good for the landlord. So would you say that, you know, we can include that again today. We can continue to ask the province for the the power of entry in a private home that we suspect is rooming house. We can keep asking them to change provincial law, uh, but the fastest route by providing a legal license framework, uh, we take that power on ourselves and we have it right away. Is, am, I, am I reading that right? So that's correct. We, we can continue to ask the province and I believe there's a motion uh, potentially coming forward on that, but uh, I'm, I agree with you that the framework that allows us to, to have the visibility on these homes, to have the annual inspections, gets us into these buildings to ensure that they're safe for the tenants and they're, they're adhering to the city standards, uh, that the landlords are adhering to the city standards. Okay, and I just have a couple more minutes. I, you might, I think you're familiar because I, I, I uh, worked on that uh, deferral subcommittee. There is, a, there is one uh, challenge that we face in the, the, the proposal for the suburbs. Um, unlike the downtown core where, where an apartment neighborhood could include, you know, stacked uh, old Victorians and things like that, larger uh, homes. Um, I took a good look at the map, both in Scarborough and North York, admittedly not so much Etobicoke, but, but where, where we have a, a zoning called apartment neighborhoods, basically inside those, all I could find was, you know, 60s and 70s cement slab apartment buildings and the townhouses that surround them. I didn't find large homes that, that would make a, a home for 12 or 25 uh, rooms or a, or a hotel for that matter uh, within those zones as it's drawn in the official plan right now. So would you be prepared to uh, to go back and revisit the, the 12 to 25 homes in the suburbs until you've had a real good look at what's in an apartment neighborhood zone in, in the suburbs? Uh, through the through the speaker, uh, Councillor, the, you know, the, the idea of multi-tenant, as you point out, would manifest itself differently uh, depending on the built form. And as yeah. you point out, some of the larger homes uh, may readily accommodate more than six rooms. Um, I, I right. think you will find you would find that in the suburbs, uh, they would be more purpose built. It would be more about something new, and, it, and it's likely where uh, uh, you know a residential multiple might be permitted, like on a main street or in a commercial residential uh, main street condition. So that, oh, that okay. is likely where you might find the propensity to have a larger uh, 12 or 25 would be on a on a commercial strip oh, rather okay. than so rather than question. in a rather than in a neighborhood. OK, so last question, if it stays in there, really, it's more, uh, you know, if someone was applying for a three bedroom townhouse because it's in an apartment neighborhood zone, the licensing process would likely say no. But if someone came in to apply to do that purpose built within that zone, that would be that would be a different answer, probably with a different kind of review. I, I would I would say there would be an entirely different kind of outcome and, and and process of review. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank. Thank. Thank you.
I just have one question um, to uh, staff, Tim Ellis. Um, so I, 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 as you know that in the city of York, we have legal and illegal rooming houses. Um, do you have a list of all the illegal rooming houses uh, in the various wards and the challenges that you have as far as enforcement? Do you have a list of them? Um, so through the speaker, um, we have complaint data. Uh, we don't have a list of legal versus, uh, we would have the list of the legal. We do not have a complete list of illegal. It would purely based on complaints and those complaints would need to be substantiated to determine whether they are illegal or not. Okay, but you also, with the complaints coming in, you also, uh, you have a list of all the ones that uh, that are illegal, uh, that you've seen complaints that you haven't been able to enforce? Um, so I, I would say that we have, uh, we have about 80 that we are aware of and that we are working through to bring through compliance. We have issued charges, we have issued notices, and we were working through through the process to bring them into compliance. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fillion, questions? A follow-up question of um, Mr. Lintern. Um, yeah. I agree with you that, that if someone were to want to build um, a legal rooming house, if we made them legal in uh, outside of the downtown, they would probably do it as new builds on main streets, so if I understood you correctly. Um, so, if that's the case, and um, in places like Willowdale, the land values on the main streets, uh, like Finch Avenue, are actually lower than they are in the neighborhood, uh, why wouldn't somebody just build um, purpose-built, um, basically affordable housing um, at... Um, you know, with um, with a small bathroom and and kitchenette, it can't cost that much more to include those things. Why wouldn't people just do that now? Because they there certainly are permissions to create that type of housing. Uh, through the speaker, uh, Councillor Fillion, you, you you point out uh, different alternatives that could manifest themselves. I would say that the twelve. 12 unit uh, rooming house would only be permitted in a residential apartment zone. So it's a, it's a much more restricted area and the 25 only in a, in a uh, residential apartment commercial zone. So there are geographic limitations uh, proposed in the bylaw. Um, I take your point that people could choose to go all the way and build dwelling units like small dwelling units as a, as an alternative and they could very well do that so we're you know we're working on a, trying to you know create a, a toolkit here of, of housing options um, that that bring more permissiveness to these types of housing forms whether they be a dwelling unit as you point out with a kitchen and a bathroom or Monica, just a dwelling room it on my, my computer. or just a dwelling room that has shared uh, kick, uh, cooking and, uh, and bathroom facilities so again, I think I think from a planning point of view, we we want to see as many different, uh, more affordable housing options materialized as possible. And a, a question of Mr. Grant, I just want to clarify a point. So um, obviously, um, if we create legal rooming houses and people choose to convert from illegal to legal, we will have. Uh, accomplish something there, but am I correct that there is nothing in the proposal before us that makes it any easier to um, crack down on illegal rooming houses? It makes it no easier to where you have illegal rooming houses who don't want to become legal. Um, we have, um, there's nothing in here that makes it any easier for us to um, deal with that. I think we may have lost Mr. Grant. Hello. Yes. Carlton? I, it, 
It's Jenny 80 here. I can step in. I think Carlton's having connection issues. Um, so thanks for the question. So we have included a number of new enforcement uh, tools uh, in the report, including increased fines, more resources, which would go a long way, as well as new tools for remedial action, which helps us uh, take action on problematic properties. But if we are, and I will say in my experience, um, and not necessarily our fault uh, because you can't get admission, if we are at the moment pretty much completely ineffective in getting rid of illegal rooming houses, um, having more of the same, like what's in here that's new that would cause us to be effective where we are currently ineffective? Uh, so through the speaker, I would say uh, currently part of the challenge we have is we don't have a pathway towards compliance for those illegal rooming houses. Uh, the new framework would provide that pathway towards legalization and compliance. And that's really key to success with these illegal rooming houses to bring them into compliance. In well, addition that's, to sure, that's if people choose to comply. I'm talking about where people choose not to comply. Okay, that was your last question. Do we have an answer? Uh, sorry, I, I, to answer that, I guess, uh, I think I would say the enforcement strategy laid out in the report does include additional tools, more resources, more fines and remedial action, as I had mentioned, which would all kind of come together to uh, allow us to take uh, more uh, enforcement action on those who do not wish to comply, especially with a focus on problematic properties and high risk properties. We'd be working with Toronto Fire and other partners to take action against those uh, problematic properties. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, questions? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I have a situation my ward I'm trying to look for answers on. Where a person came in, <clears throat> bought a rather large house, and was put in uh, what is a renovation. So they went into buildings, and I think they built eight rooms, eight different washrooms, eight different heating systems, air conditioning units. Uh, the neighbors were all up in arms. We called in to say, listen, we think someone's building a rooming house here. We sent staff out, I think MLS went out there, and they said, no, everything's fine, but he's not applied for whatever he's going to do there, but he got the permit to build this. And then we found out later it's going to be an Airbnb. So what is the difference between the multi-tenant house and the Airbnb? And does that not raise flags when they come in and apply at buildings for a renovation that they're putting in eight rooms with eight different washings? And does that not trigger a process there? Because when we sent staff out, they were saying, oh, this is fine. He's not done anything wrong. He hasn't, he hasn't applied for anything. But... Should they get that permit to do that without uh, that raising a red flag? Uh, through the speaker, uh, you know, Councillor, you, you're pointing out a specific situation. I would only comment that what we're trying to do with, with introducing a definition and the regulatory framework is create clarity around uh, different kinds of land uses, whether they be uh, a, a multi-unit dwelling or uh, a multi-tenant. And, and the more that we can uh, separate those definitions uh, and, and put a regulatory framework around this uh, for licensing and inspection purposes, uh, the better off we'll be. There will, there will always be uh, these situations you raise that, that uh, bring up a little bit of a gray area. It will need um, extra work to understand uh, how, they're, how they're actually being constructed and coordination certainly between us, Toronto Building and uh, MLS. Okay, so the way it's set now, that wouldn't raise a flag for buildings. They would just give the permits and where you go until they apply for either a rooming house. All right. So what's between Airbnb and a rooming house? Well, uh, through the speaker, Air, Airbnb, Airbnb or, uh, or the uh, short-term rental uh, is, has, a, has a different definition under the zoning bylaw and a different regulatory regime uh, that uh, Carlton's group oversees. The... Uh, the, the uh, different rule book, if you will, around the length of stay and the owner occupancy uh, requirement is in place for those. So you either own a unit and you, you, uh, you short term rent out uh, to a certain limitation or you, uh, or, you're, or you rent a unit and you short term rent out. But those, you, it does require the principal residence condition 
uh, in order to uh, in order to be regulated. So if somebody came in right from the get go, was going to build an Airbnb again, if it was a renovation or a rather large home, this would not trigger any red flag you know, for buildings until they came and applied for an Air Airbnb. But they could go ahead and build it and apply after. And, and a short term rental uh, cannot operate out of a of a dwelling room. It must only operate out of a dwelling unit. Okay. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, questions? Thanks, Speaker. I think my questions are for the Chief Planner. Um, there's some terminology in the report. I just wanted to understand. So the, the term housekeeping unit pops up. I wondered if you could help me understand what a housekeeping unit is. Well, I, I'm not quite sure exactly where you're referring to in the report, Councillor, but in general, a housekeeping unit would be uh, providing um, cooking and uh, like a, a, a self-contained dwelling unit. So it would be providing um, uh, cooking and, and washing facilities, if that's what you're referring to. I just honestly, it, it, it shows up in a few different spots in the report. I'm just trying to differentiate the, the terminology. So I. So it sounds like um, a fully contained, like that would be a dwelling unit, right? Like an apartment. Yeah, again, uh, I think it, it depends on exactly what you're referring to in the in the report, because there are there would be situation in a in a rooming house or a, a multi unit dwelling where people share in housekeeping duties. Um, but, you know, in, in a shared living environment, for example, if they had a shared kitchen, they would share uh, housekeeping duties in in managing that kitchen, uh, but I believe you're referring to uh, the use of the term in the report around uh, a dwelling unit, which is a self-contained uh, habitable unit which has a kitchen and its own bathroom. Does the term uh, household have a meaning in our zoning bylaws or even in the policy? Is household different than a housekeeping unit? Or does uh, it yeah, I might ask uh, Mr. Missy if he's on the line there to help out with that, just to clarify. I don't want to misspeak in my answer. Uh, through the speaker, household itself is not a terminology. It's not defined. Uh, the bylaw is based on uh, typology of building, not the type of people that may habitate the building. So you have detached, semi-detached, et cetera. But uh, the, the term household is not defined. Okay, does the organization though within the building matter um, in all of this policy? I understand we're trying not to, to regulate people, right? Like, like that's different, but, but the, the way that they work or live together, does that matter? You know, like uh, do they split the rent? Do they pay rent any, any rent at all? I mean, I don't know. Does one own it? Does one not own it? Do those things matter? The speaker, strictly speaking, no. Uh, the bylaw is based on the type of use and building typology, but not who's in it and necessarily how they may interrelate. You do have circumstances like short-term rental where the principal residence has to be uh, part of the equation, but in this scenario, no, to answer your question. Now, how about, like I can, I can rent a room in my house to a boarder, but we're not talking about that here, I don't think. I think borders are, excluded from this discussion is that right for the speaker that is correct rumors or borders are up to three dwelling rooms this is a specific new defined term multi-tenant housing for four and greater as per the numbers we've outlined 612 and 25. okay does the residential tenancies act and how it applies to the organization of the structure and the people living in it have anything to do with the policy in front of us. So for instance, if I've got this right, the Residential Tenancies Act doesn't apply to borders because of the arrangement, but it could apply to a rooming house or it definitely would apply to somebody with say a, a, a basement apartment or an additional dwelling unit in the house. Does that, does that figure into this at all? Uh, through the speaker, that, that's a bit of a gray or complicated question and answer. It does depend on the agreement you enter into in some cases, but generally for uh, small numbers of dwelling rooms, like Rumors and Borders, for example, the Tenancy Act doesn't apply in the same way. 
for it all. If I am residing in a building and I'm sharing a kitchen and I have my own washroom, but I don't pay any rent at all, I'm just there. Would I, would that be like a rooming house or do we not stipulate the, the, the description of the property or the licensing or, or the regulation of it under zoning if I don't pay any rent? Okay, that was your last question. For the speaker, uh, in, it, anybody could have a guest in their house. So it's, it's not clear, I'm sorry, it's not clear what the question is in terms of the striation you're looking for here. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fletcher, questions? Oh, sorry, my, my video is just coming on. Uh, speaker, uh, we got a confidential attachment that came out on September 23rd. And I'm wondering if I want to ask questions about that, how will we do that? If you have any questions on the camp confidential report, we would have to go on camera. Okay, so uh, I have public questions and I have confidential questions. How, how do we do that? Okay, so do you have any public questions? Yes, and then I'd like to go in camera as well. Yes, I do. Um, shall I start with my public questions? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to ask, um, who has right of entry into what's considered to be, you know, if you think that there's a dangerous situation or there's too many people living in a house or it might be an illegal rooming house. I know where we have licensed rooming houses that it uh, is only the fire department that can go in to check in how many people are there. So through the speaker, uh, that's if we need to gain entry, we would need the tenant's uh, approval to let us in. Uh, but Toronto Fire has greater authorities if there is a health and safety uh, issue. So currently, Toronto Fire can go in. You can't go in. Uh, we can, we can go in, sorry, just to clarify, we can go you in. And, and that it's a licensed building in the former city of Toronto or parts of Etobicoke or York. Where we can't go in is the, um, the North York, Scarborough, Etobicoke, uh, Etobicoke examples that have been raised so far. And would any of the, this report and your proposed actions give you greater access? Absolutely. That is the intent of this, is to provide a framework to license these, which then gives us Toronto Building, Toronto Fire, the Electrical Safety Authority, the ability to enter uh, annually or as requested or as required to ensure that the tenants are living safe and that the uh, landlord has built it in accordance with the building code, the fire code, and the Electrical Safety Authority code. And I just want to approach the issue of licensing because it's apparently, it's unless you understand it, it's hard to understand. There's a licensed rooming house. There is a um, renewal. It's an annual renewal. The owner uh, is required to have it renewed. How often? Uh, it's annually. Annually. And the councillor is advised that that is coming up for renewal. And are there any problems with this particular location? Correct? That is, we're advised in that. Absolutely, that's correct. And that provides you the opportunity if you've had an issue with a certain property, you could bring that to our attention. We could look at it as part of the renewal, uh, go to the licensing tribunal uh, or the, sorry, the uh, licensing commission on this, on sorry, the rooming house commission. Sorry, I'm getting mixed up with the licensing tribunal. Right. But yes, it, it offers the, the local councillor if you've had issues with a certain property to bring those into add conditions and to have those approved by the. So the example that Councillor Grimes brought up that you'd have an Airbnb that would become a rooming house that uh, it, if it's licensed, um, there's a, it's a di very different regimen from what exists today. That you would either uh, force it to be licensed or it couldn't be, or they couldn't put people through there, that they were living there for four and five months at a time. Yeah, that's correct. And within this licensing regimen, um, there is the opportunity for the licensing commissioner, uh, and this is a proper tribunal, just as if you were a business with a bad 
track record and you got brought to that business licensing tribunal, the license could be overturned. It could be denied or there could be conditions placed on that that if they weren't lived up to, then that could be denied in the following renewal period. Do I have that right? Uh, so at this, through the speaker, yes, Councillor Fletcher, you have that correct. So I'm just reading one of the emails from last June uh, is saying, my experience with this type of housing leads to congestion, unkempt properties, cars parked on lawns and streets, and they're typically eyesores in the neighborhood. That writer, I think, would more than likely be referring to the illegal rooming houses, not the licensed ones, because you would have the, they would have the requirement not to have unkept properties, cars on lawns and eyesores. That would, or do you have a lot of licensed rooming houses today that meet unkept property, uh, cars on lawns, all those kinds of things, or would that be pretty swiftly dealt with by your staff? Um, so uh, we receive about 800 complaints per year. 81% uh, are about illegals and only 19% is about legals. And we do have the tools, uh, again, if it's a property maintenance issue, a waste or a garbage issue, we do have the tools to deal with that uh, quickly. And many times that uh, from rooming houses where I've had neighbors will call me and say, this is out of control, something's going wrong here. It generally gets fixed pretty quickly because the person wants to keep their license. Would you agree with that? That was your last question. So through the speaker, uh, again, Councillor Fletcher, you are correct. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lai, questions? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, you just mentioned uh, Mr. Grant about uh, there are 800 complaints, 81% illegal and 19% uh, legal. What is a typical action the city does if, well, we got a lot of calls to our office suspecting that is an illegal rooming house in on what street, and we tell them to call 311. And what does 311 do? What does the city do as soon as they get the call? I just wanted to understand it a little bit more clearly. Sure. And uh, through the speaker to Councillor Lai, uh, of the complaints that are about illegals, it's, it's mainly a, a zoning uh, complaint. Are they permitted to be there? And so those types of complaints and understanding how that property is being used, who the tenants are, who the landlord is, what's happening, are very extensive, extensive investigations, and we do take the necessary action to bring them into compliance or to, uh, to issue them appropriate charges, and we have had success in the past. What this does is it provides a framework for those to, that want to be legal, to be legal, and to provide housing, a, a much needed form of housing in all parts of the city, uh, in, a, in a regulatory uh, framework that ensures that it's safe. Okay, so we do, uh, the city does take action if we suspect that is a rooming house, illegal rooming house. Am I correct uh, to say that? Yeah, absolutely. Through 311, we do take the call, we do uh, inspect, we need to validate. Oftentimes we validate that it is legal, that it is a border, that it is a, it, it is a base. I'm sorry, you're, you're breaking up. So, but, Councillor Lai, you're breaking up. Can you ask the question? Councillor, can you turn off your video? Can you hear me better? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I think it's... Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, my next question, sorry. My next question would be, uh, there seems to be some problem uh, when we're asking whether, whether we can limit the number of rooming houses per street. Can you elaborate a little bit on it, why we cannot limit a certain number of uh, rooming houses on per street? Through the speaker, perhaps I could jump in on that. Uh, essentially, that amounts to Im Im 
implementing separation distances. And generally the principle is if the use is permitted, then it's permitted and we don't limit the number in an area. Uh, the city has over the last few years uh, gone to great lengths to take away that kind of limitation, for instance, from municipal shelters, group homes. So uh, if it's permitted, it's permitted is the general principle. And you're saying that, for instance, if there's people uh, going to apply for less liquor license or something, you know, if there's too many on the street, you, you do not approve that. So how, how do you explain that? Would it be something similar to that? Through the speaker, I, I, I couldn't really comment on liquor licensing control issues. I'm sorry. Um, All right, my, 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 my next question would be the number of units there and uh, we've proposed, and you, you set it for six units, and uh, there's, is there a reason why you cannot reduce it to four units? Uh, through the speaker, uh, we have suggested it be six dwelling rooms, and that number is based on longstanding experience that we've had in the former city of Toronto in particular, but also the former city of York and Etobicoke, where uh, multi-tenant housing has been permitted for decades. Also, that six number is relatively consistent with allowing for a number of rooms in a detached house, for example, without requiring any physical, ex you know, any expansion or physical change to the house. It's a natural fit into the existing context in terms of the buildings that are there. So we feel pretty comfortable that six is about the right number. I didn't hear you saying the city, uh, North York or Scarborough. Is there a reason why you did not include that in your, when you're saying that? It's just part of Utopico, but it, um, do you think that it, this will work? It's, uh, this is your last speaker, question. What, what I was referring to is that the multi-tenant house use has been a permitted use in the former city of Toronto, Topico, and York for decades. It's currently and hasn't been permitted in Scarborough, North York, and East York. What we're bringing forward would regularize multi-tenant housing across the city in an even way. Okay, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the, for the answers. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, questions? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I'm wondering whether or not staff can indicate to us where there is a jurisdiction where we've seen best practice in terms of rooming houses being um, instituted. I would say the, I'll start and I know Abby wants to join in or Greg, um, the most successful is the former city of Toronto and the Parkdale uh, project. Uh, again, when they were enabled, we've had very few issues and we were able to bring in, I think the number is 88 uh, that were non-compliant into compliance. So the former city of Toronto and particular Parkdale in Council Perks Ward is a uh, has a successful model and again we have significantly fewer complaints and issues uh, with those that are licensed have we seen any element of gentrification that has occurred as a result of um, uh, those properties being utilized for your rooming houses and you use the example of uh, of parkdale but I, I have some studies that looks at uh, other jurisdiction which doesn't really uh, support the comment you just made for example, there is a Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation report uh, a titled Regulatory Factors in Retention and Expansion of Rooming Houses, which looked at 11 cities around uh, Canada and so on. And it's actually shown that the actual number of rooming houses have actually declined. And what we've actually seen is that um, those particular properties have been uh, retooled, if you will, and or redeveloped. So, to, 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 to address the issue with respect to compliance, we have seen a, an opposite impact, an opposite in, in effect. I'm wondering if you've actually studied that at all to, 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 to determine whether or not this, what's being proposed, would be successful. Uh, through, the, through the speaker, uh, well, I'm not specifically familiar with the study that you pointed out, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor. The, um, there are many forces of gentrification in Toronto, as we all know, and uh, yep. I think that the, the main point with this exercise is to put in place a regulatory framework that allows for someone to operate a multi-tenant home in a safe 
way that people can rely on going forward, whether or not they choose to make that uh, an investment or whether or not they choose to uh, acquire property for that purpose or continue the use of a property in a legal one and make it legal. Uh, Fair enough. As, as I said, I think there are many, many forces at play around gentrification. Thank you. Um, some of the um, research that I've done, I've looked at Vancouver, and they have actually put in bylaws to regulate alterations, conversion, and demo demolition of rooming houses and so on to prevent displacement. Is that something that we would be putting in place as well? Should we decide that uh, this is something that we would do? Um, through the speaker, maybe I can speak to that. So the um, Vancouver example that you relate to specifically rate, relates to single room occupancy hotels rather than rooming houses in particular. Um, and it is in relation to the protection of those hotels as existing um, ha affordable housing for low income residents. So it prevents those Ms. homes. Ms. Vaughan, Ms. Vaughan, sorry to interrupt, but that's not the information I have. It actually relates to rooming houses, not specifically to hotels. We did see the hotels, but also there was actually a rooming house as well. Okay, my apologies, uh, Deputy no Mayor. I'm not sure what um, bylaw you're sure. referring to. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I, I might comment that the city is where we have had a pressure on some of our rooming house stock, mostly in the center of the city where they're permitted, is uh, right. on redevelopment sites where number of dwelling rooms might be threatened. And we put in sure. place replacement policies for that, which are currently sure. under appeal. Sure, thank you. Uh, Ms. Vaughn, I'll direct this question to you because you have Vancouver experience. So in Vancouver, they have the crime-free multi-housing program, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which was actually in place um, in, in the, I guess it came from Arizona, from Mesa, through a, a program that they had, which was in 44 states. Vancouver implemented that and they actually hired someone who was actually responsible for that program. That program was essentially terminated because of lack of funding. So my question to you was whether or not you're familiar with that and then a follow up to that is whether or not we would actually uh, run the risk once we implement varying, uh, if we were to implement this uh, policy that we would see a, a situation where we invest initially and then we pull that investment back what guarantee would we be able to provide to the public? That was your last question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Ms. Wand. Um, through the Speaker, again, I'm not sure exactly the bylaw that you're referring to. In terms of um, the discussion in the report that is before you, we staff are working on an incentive program to assist with mitigation of the cost of bringing rooming houses into compliance. Um, and so we feel that this would be combined with the enforcement, this would be a successful approach. Uh, but I would have to follow up with you separately regarding your question around the, uh, the, the bylaw that you refer to. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, questions? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Through, through you to staff, um, Affordable Housing Action Plan 2010 to 2020, um, on page 15, staff were to reach out to uh, the owners of illegal rooming houses and try and get them to buy into a licensing agreement to, to invest and, and, and make them conform. Um, how successful uh, was that um, of all the illegal uh, rooming houses that you approached, how many actually reinvested in the property and, and had the license? Uh, through the speaker, I think I mean, Abby and, and Carlton can add in, but the approach here is to create an environment where, where the use is permitted first. It's hard to have a conversation with, with people if we, we don't have a platform for, for um, making the use legal, if you will, from a zoning point of view. So that's the, that's an important pillar here is, is getting a, a zoning regime set up and then um, proceeding as Abby pointed out earlier with the conversation around uh, uh, bringing, bringing uh, practice into conformity with regulation and incentives. It's, it's kind of a three part package that, uh, that staff are proposing to make sure that we transition the, the rooming house environment into a modern safe and, uh, and uh, secure a housing situation for right. residents and for neighbors. Yeah, no, the, the plan, the action plan was to only approach uh, the operators and owners of illegal 
uh, rooming houses where the zoning conformed. Uh, so you already had the zoning in place. And uh, my question was how many actually uh, agreed to go through uh, the expense and rigor of converting their units uh, into, into legal, legal rooming houses. And I guess there's no, there's no real data on that. Um, I guess the other thing I would ask is uh, during this whole process, and uh, uh, there's been a lot of expenditure of staff resources, um, how many conversations were held with the, the actual owners of uh, illegal rooming houses in the inner suburbs? And uh, to what degree did they seem open to investing in their property to make it conform to a new uh, licensing uh, regimen? I don't know if Mr. Mitzi or others want to comment. I know there was a stakeholder meeting for uh, rooming house operators. Uh, others on the call may w wish to comment on that meeting. Through you, Speaker. Yes, just to add to Greg's point, we actually held 11 stakeholder meetings, and one of them did include owners and operators of multi tenant housing. I can't comment on whether all of them were legal or, or some illegal, I can't comment on that, but we did reach out to owners and operators of multi-tenant housing. So some say there's, there's a trend that if you approach um, someone who is, who is operating an illegal rooming house that they'll kick everybody out and, and, and sell the house. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that, that we're actually gonna make homelessness worse by, by this plan? Um, through the speaker, um, I think the the pathway to compliance is an important way to keep people housed safely and affordably. We we know that rooming houses generally offer lower rents; they're more affordable, which is why you know many first time renters seniors on fixed incomes, people who otherwise may be at risk of homelessness choose rooming houses as a, a place to live. Uh, and so it's, a, you know, legalizing rooming houses and having people be able to access them safely is a much uh, fairer and um, potentially more cost effective way to deal with the pressure we see in our rental housing system than having people kind of um, be unable to find or keep somewhere affordable and therefore have to rely on our shelter system. So when we have a, a, a legal rooming house, how often do city staff go back there to inspect and, and make sure all the rules are, are being followed? Is it, is it an annual inspection or twice a year or once every couple of years? Or So through the speaker to the Councilor Pasternak, it is, uh, it is annually. Um, but again, if we are receiving complaints, we would go out uh, and respond to those as well. And if we took on um, a larger, high, higher volume of, of rooming houses, as is this plan, would we have the resources to, to make sure they stay safe? That was your last question. So through the speaker, this, uh, this report incorporates additional staff of 28 in MLS and I believe 16 in Toronto Fire. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Minnawong, questions? Thanks. Um, uh, so you, <clears throat> I think Councillor Lai was asking questions about <clears throat> allowing so many rooming houses on the street and then there was a reference to, I think by the chief planner or Mr. Mizzi about separation distances. So. It, there are separation distances for places of worship. Is that correct? Anyone? I don't believe uh, through the through the speaker, Deputy Mayor. I don't believe so. Uh, the issue with separation distances, as from a from a human rights code point of view, historically no, no, in the no, last ten. Talking, sorry, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm not talking from a human rights point of view. I'm talking from the, our zoning bylaws say that, at least in North York, I'm not familiar with all the other zoning bylaws, but there are separations that keep <clears throat> that that keep uh, places of worship separate, so that one you don't have five churches next to each other. Uh, through the speaker, deputy mayor, I don't. There may be some legacy separation distance provisions. I'm not aware of any for 
places of worship. There may be some for uh, legacy industrial uses, but they are being uh, gradually phased out. So we can have like, places of worship next to each other, like 10 of them next to each other. There's no problem with that where they're properly zoned. Well, theoretically, that's possible, but there are no longer a separation distance provisions in the bylaw. Fair enough. I, I didn't know that. Thank you very much. My second question um, <clears throat> is a licensing question. So, uh, Mr. Grant, what's proposed is we're going to license these rooming houses, correct? Uh, through the speaker to Deputy Mayor Minor Wong, that's, that's correct. Okay, fair enough. Um, so we're so we licensed uh, Airbnbs, correct? Uh, or, we uh, short term rentals. Let's call them short term rentals. Let's not call, use the brand. Let's. So yes, we license we license the various companies, and then we uh, provide registrations for the operators or the hosts. But each home has to be registered, right? That's correct. Which is one step removed. They they in fact are, have to be licensed through the company, correct? Correct. They need to have a City of Toronto. Uh, registration number in order to advertise on right. with any of Fair the enough. companies and and to be an airbnb um, home they have to be owner occupied correct uh, that is not correct they need to be their principal residence fair enough so could we require from a licensing point of view it seems consistent that if um, if uh, airbnb's principal residence You'll, if, you, if you're involved in Airbnb and you have a home and you're, you're required to have your principal residence as that Airbnb um, address, we can require rooming houses that their principal address also be the place where they are renting out that, that, um, that rooming house uh, arrangement. Is that consistent? That's fair to say? And um, if not, why not? So uh, I believe it's different. Um, How? These, these are the homes uh, can have, you know, again, six to 10 people living in them without the owner uh, being there. They are providing uh, important housing types. I'm sorry. Is, if the print, maybe, um, Carl, maybe legal respect yeah. Intent, yeah. intended, I, th I think my reasoning is fairly sound in comparison. Maybe um, our lawyers can tell me where, where my, where I'm off on this one or whether, whether my, my analysis is correct and where 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 the mistake is for you madam speaker uh, the difference is that with the short term rentals the requirement for um, them to be occupied is for the purpose of maintaining housing supply whereas in this instance these are already residential uses maintaining housing supply why why can't we use that same arrangement to apply them we're maintaining housing supply with uh, rooming houses, are we not? Yeah, th that is that is correct. However, and having the um, having the owner occupy it would not be for that purpose. That's that's the distinction, as I understand it. Are you telling me we can't do that, or is that what you're telling me? Well, certainly that the same rationale does not apply. Uh, and okay, so the the, diff the, uh, the other question that I would ask is. Uh, can't Councillor, that was your last question. Councillor, that. that was your last question. That was your last question. Thank you. Fair enough. Thank you. Councillor Peruzza. Thank you, Speaker. Just a couple of questions to sort of get it clearer in my head. I, I have, so I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, when a rooming house um, is um, essentially considered a rooming house. So, so I have um, just south of the university, York University campus, a uh, development um, that was built out by Tribute. Uh, 800, they, they built someone, um, they built exactly 800 single family homes. And these homes were essentially, you know, they started off being single family, but uh, then, you know, they were, they were bought up and now, um, I would say, you know, almost 100% of them house mostly students and, um, and house, for example, I don't know, eight, nine, 10, 15, 20 students per household. Um, 
but they're students. W would those be then considered grooming houses if, if the bylaw under, the defini under this definition? Uh, through the speaker, uh, Councillor Prutza, if they are dwelling rooms uh, where, where they only have access to a bathroom or a kitchen, then they would be considered rooming houses. The, uh, you know, you cite the number of, of rooms and that could be variable depending on how many students might be um, living in that accommodation, but we okay, don't. So when is it not, not considered a rooming house? Councillor Peruza, Councillor Peruza, yeah. please allow the staff to answer the question, please. No, I, I understand, but I'm still not, I'm still not under, okay, sure. Go, sure, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, if the rooms are rented separately, then it's a, then it's a multi-tenant or a rooming house. Okay, the fact that it's students, uh, it doesn't matter. We don't zone for people, counselors, so it doesn't okay. matter. All right. So, so if you have a um, a house, uh, a three-story home, you know, with the basement, basement, ground level, second level, each one has sort of uh, been converted to an apartment. I have these situations, and then in some of those cases, uh, those apartments, you know, they're 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 let out to a specific individual or family, and then they also sublet to other people would that be considered a rooming house under your, uh, your under your definition hello the the uh the situation you mean subletting so i mean a a, a room could be sublet i don't think there's anything that prevents something from being sublet depending on whether or not the rental agreement between the owner and the uh uh, less he uh, restricts that or not. So, so if they're three separate apartments uh, and uh, rented to, uh, to to individuals or families, that would not be considered a, a rooming house under this definition. Again, uh, we, we we're trying to bring some clarity to this around dwelling rooms versus dwelling units. A dwelling unit would have its own kitchen and bathroom. A dwelling unit would have its own kitchen and bathroom. Okay. That's correct. But okay, fine. But so so it has a, a kitchen family, and and let's say you have a family there, and then they rent out uh, uh, one of the rooms or two of the rooms, uh, but they they live communally with those people, and they use the same bathroom, same kitchen. Okay, you, they you they have a, they have access to the bathroom and to the kitchen. Would that be considered a rooming house? Uh, through the speaker, I mean, you're you're identifying a kind of a hybrid. I think if I could. Put it that way, Councillor. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to understand it. That's all. Yeah. yeah. Again, a, a single a single unit would not be um, a room. It would be a unit. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, lastly, if if um, if you had a dwelling that that basically met the definition of the bylaw as you're prescribing it, uh, and the and the individuals. Uh, made it, you know, um, uh, apply, sort of made it um, or uh, converted it to your licensing standards. That means they made all the safety, health and safety changes or improvements that they need to make, but do not apply for a license. Uh, what would you, what would you have at your disposal then to require them to apply for a license? So they met, they met the definition. Uh, they were running a rooming house. Uh, they built it to the standard that, that your license would require, uh, but they don't apply for the license. So I'll take that one the, through the chair. They knew uh, if this is approved, the regulatory framework that is provided to them gives them a pathway to apply for a license and gives them guidelines on what they need to do uh, as far as a safety from a building code, electrical safety, fire safety, and allows us for annual inspection. So. Um, this gives it the path pathway for those um, at New York University example to to come into compliance. Thank you, Councillor Baila. Thank you, Madam Madam Speaker. My first question for you is to fire. Can you give us the latest statistics that you have on fires in rooming houses? Good afternoon, Deputy Mayor. Um, through the speaker, uh, I'm going to ask Deputy Chief Coco, who has those statistics, to respond. 
Thank you, Chief. To the speaker, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, since 2010, Toronto Fire Service has been involved in 16 fatal fires. Out of those 16 fatal fires, 14 of them were located in unlicensed rooming houses, or 87.5%. So since 2016 fatal fire, so there's probably even more, but fatal fires, you had 16, 14 were licensed rooming houses, correct? That is correct for the speaker. Okay, thank you. Through you to licensing. Um, so there was a question about cracking down on illegal uh, rooming houses. How many, how much staff do you currently have to go to respond to the 800 complaints that you received? So our dedicated team that works on uh, multi-tenant houses right now is a team of six. And what is the report proposing? The report uh, proposes an additional 28 uh, with the appropriate supervision, as well as an engagement coordinator to, to, you know, to engage with landlords and tenants and really get that education out there of what... Uh, what and Carlton, you are part of the work that we've done over the summer, and you've seen the motion that increases this number even higher, correct? Uh, through the speaker, uh, that's correct. That's correct. So would you, so you, you're going to have significantly more staff. I think we're going to be going close to 50 staff versus six that we have today, increased fines. Would you also say that um, the cooperation that you'll get from people that live in illegal rooming houses will be significantly different given that they know that there's a pathway to continue to have housing for them? Uh, so absolutely, that's correct. And we've had great relations as we've worked through these, as we work with tenants to advise them of the rules. And just want to make one point of clarification. I, I use the number 28. It's actually 22. I was getting it confused with another program. Sorry. Okay. Um, with regards to, so if we don't have a pathway to legalize uh, the rooming houses, uh, what what is the um, the price, the average price of a room that we know right now in Toronto for rooming houses? Um, through the speaker, uh, it's between um, four hundred and six hundred dollars a month, and so up to seven hundred, I would say. Up to seven hundred. And uh, is there anything else that these people would be able to get other than a room in a home at that price right now to ro today in Toronto? Um, through the speaker, um, with the average with the average rent at around eleven hundred and fifty, I would say it's incredibly challenging for anyone who's Ontario Works or Ontario Disability Payment or on a fixed income to find rental housing at that rate. And you're certainly looking at shared accommodations, I would say, of some kind or reliance on the shelter system. On the shelter system. So if we don't have, if we just enforce, what we're going to be doing is increasing people into funneling into our shelter system because it will be very hard for anybody to find accommodations in our city at those levels. But we also know that by having a path that the cooperation to have them uh, legalizing, wanting opening the door for us to go in would be higher. Is that correct? Is that why you came in with a, both an MLX approach and a housing approach to this and zoning? Uh, I would say yes, this this report is authored and signed by six different divisions. It is very comprehensive uh, and it is uh, the path forward that we believe is the, the best one. Okay. Um, I understand that there is an appeal right now for our zoning on this. Is that correct? Yes, uh, through the speaker, it's an outstanding appeal from the city's uh, harmonized zoning bylaw. So, Greg, if the, uh, when this appeal is dealt with, will they be uh, making decisions that involve six divisions like we have in here and have a comprehensive approach that involves MLS, housing, uh, uh, zoning, and all that? Or are they only actually going to dictate to us what the zone is going to be? Uh, through the speaker, I really can't speculate on that other than to say that uh, it's our, typically uh, if we got a comprehensive piece of advice for City Council, it would be our preference for City Council to make the decision about the path forward and not uh, be in the hands of the Ontario Land Tribunal. 
And through you, Madam Speaker, if I can add, the, the tribunal would not dictate a licensing regime, for example. It would not, right? So we would be it would we would not. be opining on the zoning, everything else. So this comprehensive approach that we have right here in front of us would, would not be what would be dictated to us by the Ontario Land Tribunal. That That's was, correct. That was your last question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, it's my understanding that we have a couple councillors that want to go in camera to ask questions on the uh, on the confidential report. Okay, it would, Councillor Fletcher, you wanted to go in camera. Yes, I did, but the city. Oh, sorry. Um, hold on. Another name was added on for questions. Um, Councillor hey, Perks. I just want to be. Councillor Perks, Perks question. Clear. Yes. I, I'm quite happy to go in camera and then to ask my public questions after that. That's fine by me. Okay, wait. Um, you're the last one to, on as far as the public questions. So why don't you ask a question and then we'll close off the public questions and go in camera. Okay, uh, well, thank you. Speaker, Speaker, can I just interrupt? I'm sorry, Council Reports, but uh, sure. Deputy Mayor Bylaw started down a road of talking about the appeal, and I'm wondering how far we can do that in public, because I just, I'm just wondering if you don't mind giving us that answer or having our city solicitor give us that answer, because I thought we couldn't start to discuss that. Okay. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, my answer was that we're very, uh, we're very general. However, if Council wants to go into detail about the confidential advice, I would recommend going in camera. So we can't ask about anything to, to get into detail, whether on human rights side or zoning side, we should go in camera and hear more fulsome opinion from you. Is that what you're saying? That would be my recommendation. But you could answer questions on both of those things and then tell us if we're stepping over the line. Uh, I, I certainly could do that. It is, um, it is council's um, decision. Uh, council has discretion to handle any matter with a few uh, limited exceptions in public. So can, but this is one of the types of things that council can go on camera for, of course, because it's legal advice, but council can always choose to have its legal advice in public. I'm sorry, we can choose to have our legal advice in public. I would, I would recommend the council going to camera for this legal advice, but it is not a requirement. Because it's not a, like a, a okay, can, sorry, this is new information to me. <laughs> I know my, you're giving my, us uh, a legal opinion um, there. Uh, I just done Madam clear. Speaker, can I ask a point of order? Okay. Uh, point of order, Councillor Carroll. Uh, my question is uh, to do with legal strategy concerning that opinion, and I think that's the difference. Uh, I, I think I do need to be in camera to ask my questions. Okay, and, and I know I was willing to go in camera, but Councillor Perks was ready to ask questions in public, and there was a point of order. I'm, I'm happy to, to wait to ask my questions until after the in-camera session. Oh, okay, I'm so let's go in camera. Let's put the motion on the yes. screen and go in camera. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Solicitor. Thanks, Wendy. Councillor Fletcher will move the, the motion. Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fletcher, if you can read it, please. Yes, I'm happy to. That Council recess its public session to meet as Committee of the Whole in closed session to consider PH 2510, a new regulatory framework for multi-tenant houses, reason for confidential information, litigation that affects the City of Toronto or advice or communications that are subject to solicitor client privilege and litigation privilege. Thank you. Okay, on favor, show of hands, carry. Okay, so if you can give us at least five minutes or so, so we can go on camera.
Okay. City Council has completed its closed session consideration of items PH 2510. No motions were placed in closed session. We will now proceed with the public debate. Um, when we were in public asking questions, there were two councillors that had public questions. Councillor Perks. Um, thank you, Speaker. Uh, first to Mr. Grant, and I'm just looking for a bare bones answer here. Have we consulted with fraternities and sororities on this? The chair, the short answer is yes. Have we uh, uh, got something in the report that looks at working with universities to find other forms of help for their students? Uh, through the speaker, the short answer is yes. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, there's been a discussion about various motions to look at changing the number of parking rate parking places to a rate of 0.5 spaces per dwelling room. You're aware of that? Uh, I'm aware of that, but parking is really uh, yes. my colleagues in planning. Okay. Through the speaker, yes, we're aware of that. Okay, and and uh, you would find that acceptable as a, a compromise to try to get this through today? Uh, yes, we'll look at, we would look at any standards in order to move this forward, yes. Okay, similarly, there's been conversations about uh, 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 different numbers of rooms, looking at six, you're willing to do that work, right? To get this through. Uh, Further analysis on the six? Yes, but okay. the proposal is six. The proposal is six. Um, to the city solicitor, does the city of Toronto have the ability to uh, say that uh, a property, someone who owns a property in the city of Toronto has to reside in Canada? No. No, we do not. Okay. Um, similarly uh, to Mr. Grant, uh, I believe Councillor Carroll has pre-circulated a motion looking at enhanced uh, enforcement. You're aware of that, and that's something that uh, I believe you would be prepared to have budget discussions on? Uh, through the speaker, yes, that's something we've dealt with over the summer and working very closely with Councillor Carroll and are willing to uh, continue that, uh, that dialogue and through the to, budget process. To the city solicitor, the issue around right of entry uh, for municipal licensing and standard staff, that's not something that the city has authority over. That that rests with other orders of government, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, the uh, proposal in front of us does contain provisions to report on uh, the success of the implementation of this going forward. That's correct. Thank you very much. Uh, those are my questions. Thank you. Councillor Layton, I believe that you had your name on. You were the last I one. did. Thank you. Okay, I Council did. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Councillor Layton. I'm going I'm to be very careful with the questions I ask here because they are of a, a legal nature. And please, if the solicitor feels uncomfortable asking them or answering them in this venue, I, I, I understand and we'll change the line of questioning. Our current regime of uh, of rooming houses is being challenged at the OLT, correct? That is correct. We could also be challenged at the Human Rights Tribunal and through a, a divisional court. Well, I can't uh, uh, sort of predict that sort of thing. It's certainly uh, not impossible, yes. Certainly what impossible. would the timing of a hearing at the OLT look like? I am. Um, I'm going to ask Amanda Hill to respond to that. So, as as set out in the the public component of of the confidential report, there are um, there are two appellants um, who have uh, challenged the the rooming house provisions of five six nine twenty thirteen, um, and those appeals have been outstanding for some time. Um, the, the OLT could could schedule uh, a hearing of these matters at, at any point in the in the near future. 
And what would a time frame for a, um, a human rights tribunal uh, to, to hear a case if it was brought against the city? I'm going to ask Antonella Chetia to respond to that. Um, Councillor, at the human rights tribunal, if uh, an application were initiated, it would probably take, at the rate that they're dealing with complaints that are backlogged, it would take probably two to three years to get to hearing. And if we went to a hearing in any of these forums, what would the possible consequences be if the city was to lose? I can answer on the human rights one if the city solicitor. Um, yes, please. I'm with that. Please. So at, uh, on, in a human rights tribunal challenge, you would have the human rights tribunal, let's say they didn't agree with the bylaw hypothetically, um, after a hearing, they would make a decision that it did or did not discriminate. If they find that it does not discriminate, uh, they could go further and uh, impose orders for future compliance. And that may be specific. We need you to do A, B, C, D and return to the tribunal. And the tribunal would be seized perhaps of the city's actions and what it was doing. There would be direction on when and what it should consider. So, so they could specify what our regime should look like. Yes. They could specify guidelines for what should or shouldn't be included in order to make a bylaw comply with the human rights code. And at the OLT, I guess that would be Amanda, at the OLT, what could the possible outcome be if the city lost? So at the at the OLT, as in very generally um, with respect to any bylaw that that is before them, um, they have the jurisdiction to to make amendments to that bylaw uh, based on the evidence before them. So they could um, they could make the amendments that they see fit um, and and put that into uh, a decision. I have one final question. Have we any experience on a similar planning matter? where the city's by existing bylaw was challenged and what was the outcome? I, uh, I can't comment on anything that's exactly like this uh, myself, but certainly the city's bylaws are, are challenged routinely in, um, at the OLT. I don't know if uh, Mr. Lintern might want to add anything, if he sees uh, a parallel between this and another bylaw, um, certainly feel free to add. To the speaker, going by memory, there may there may have been issues with uh, group homes um, some time ago that I recall. What was the what was the outcome of the group homes uh, challenge? Well, the, the city removed um, uh, distance requirements, uh, separation distance requirements, as a result of concerns around um, separation distance uh, violation of the human rights code, as far as I can recall. So the city's bylaw was not upheld by the body. Yes, I, I can't recall the exact order of events, but generally speaking, that was the outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we will now go to speakers. We'll put the speakers list up. Mayor Tory to speak. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I have placed my motion and it has been circulated for people to see. Uh, as you know, I strongly support this proposal, but I'm going to be very honest that we still have more work to do on the overall framework. I believe today that we do have a path forward that will continue with that progress because giving up uh, is simply not an option. Uh, broadening out safe, legal, affordable housing options across the city is a must for us. It's been over 20 years uh, since amalgamation and there are some things that continue to divide this council along those old boundaries. The regulatory framework for multi-tenant housing is absolutely one of those issues, but we have made progress. We are closer than ever before to moving this issue forward in a positive way. I think I've talked to almost every member of council about this issue, and I know that it is one not bound by ideology. Most councillors' views on this framework are determined by what they're hearing directly from their residents. This isn't a left or right issue. It, in fact, is what I would call a hyper-local issue. And that's why there are some here who would identify themselves as progressives, uh, to use that expression, who would vote against this today. And there are some who identify themselves as a liberal or a conservative or whatever, a moderate, who are prepared to vote for it. Council is not united on this issue, and we shouldn't push through a framework that is still so divisive. To me, that's an indication that more work needs to be done to get it right for the sake of those who need truly safe, affordable, legal housing options. 
And after many tries over the years, if you look at the uh, decision record, the decision history in this report alone, it goes back to 2008. I am willing to take a little more time to get this right. Trying to ram sensitive issues through council is not the right course on things like this. We've got to keep doing the work to gain the confidence of more people across the entire city. And it's my job to continue to work with each and every councillor, which I have done all summer and which I will continue to do to get things done together and to move things forward in a cooperative way. I want to approve a framework that a reasonable majority of this council supports and wants to succeed. I believe we're closer than ever before to having a package that will do just that and that will work. We're making progress on gaining that support that I made reference to. And I'm confident that the motion I'm proposing today will make this framework better and address many of the issues that people have raised. We've got a major affordable housing challenge on our hands that successful global cities do. We also have an illegal rooming house uh, challenge in this city, and we need to find a way to make them legal and safer and better for residents and for neighbors. I believe that if imp implemented properly, this will make these residences safer, which will protect tenants, will help eliminate many of the problems that frustrate residents and make rooming house owners fully accountable. But we've got to get the framework right. The referral, which many of you from across the political spectrum have helped to craft over the last little while as we were looking at different things that we might have to do depending on how things turned out, will ask our staff to do more work on conducting a more complete and proper public consultation, including getting some of the people that have been advocating to us from the medical and social domains to sit down with residents and actually talk to them about why this issue is important. Creating an enhanced enforcement staffing plan that landlords are held accountable and so that our bylaw officers are able to implement this and implement the enforcement expected to go with it. A communications plan so that people know what this plan is and what it isn't and developing a proper reporting plan. I want to see some of our best medical and social advisors from the community actually sit with residents and constructively, constructively discuss all of the varied aspects of this issue because I'm not sure that's happened yet as much effort as many people have made over the summer and frankly for the last 13 years. This will keep forward the progress that we are making and I believe move us to where we need to be. But I know some will say we should just try and push this through uh, today, come what may in terms of the actual result, push through to a vote today, come what may as to the actual result. I don't think that's how we unify the city. I think it only hardens the pre-amalgamation lines between different parts of the city rather than moving beyond them. And I think it actually doesn't advance the interests of the people we're trying to help here, who, who are people that need different housing options available to them, legal, safe housing options. I came to office following a period during which promoting divides between the downtown and the suburbs was sometimes a deliberately chosen approach. I don't accept that course. I haven't in the entire time that I've been here. I don't accept it today as being right, especially given all the progress we've made in bringing the city together. I think making sure that we give the staff and ourselves more time to strengthen this framework doesn't stop the progress we're making, getting affordable housing built in the city. And I know that everybody wants to get more housing built. If you just look at the progress we announced on that front yesterday, $132 million from the Rapid Housing Initiative, 233 units more of, of affordable housing, significant initiatives in Indigenous housing, uh, more than $40 million to help with 1,000 affordable rental units under the RHI program, and, and on it goes. This council is getting affordable housing approved and built at a pace not seen for a long time. And with the unprecedented support we have secured and will continue to secure from the other governments, we are making progress. But we have to make sure that that progress continues and that it will only be possible if residents of the city, in all parts of the city, uh, keep working with us and continue to support the initiatives that we're undertaking. It's been a struggle on the support of housing that I've been personally involved in every single meeting all summer long, standing up for exactly what we're here trying to deal with today. I believe this motion that I put in front of Council and the work that will flow from it will in fact produce the consensus necessary to move this vital housing issue, this vital affordable housing issue forward. A consensus that has eluded mayors and councillors for many years, but where success is clearly in sight with good faith, with more hard work and with some understanding on all sides. All sides, no matter what side we're talking about here. So I thank you for listening, Speaker, and I commend uh, this motion to uh, my colleagues. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions to the mayor, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for, for your remarks there. 
Um, in the early summer, you came to the Scarborough Business Association luncheon and you were asked about multi-tenant homes and said that there are many illegal homes in Scarborough. In your mind, the question was, are you prepared to do something about it? Um, how do you see your referral today consistent with the message that you gave residents a couple months ago? Well, I indicated to them at that time, and thank you for the question, Councillor McKelvey, and through you, Speaker, I indicated to them at that time that by uh, by bringing in regulation on those houses for the first time, uh, we will have a greater ability, though still not perfect, but a greater ability to uh, use a number of the tools that have been discussed today uh, at our disposal to uh, to uh, enforce the law and to have those uh, operate at a higher standard. And I think we can do that uh, without having those people end up uh, in, in a situation where they're without housing. Um, and I think it, uh, so I think to me that that, that the, some of the, and clearly there's more work to be done on enforcement. Uh, that's one of the things we're referring here if, the, if that re if referral is accepted. Uh, but I believe that you have to start with making these something that at law have a life. Right now, they're, they're, they're as, as I think we've heard our officials tell us today, these are just not recognized and nobody really has any power to do anything save and except perhaps the fire uh, department. And sometimes uh, by the time they get involved, uh, we're in very perilous uh, situation indeed. Um, the last part of your motion part, um, it talks about uh, um, exploration of options to create more student housing. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that more. So in our community, um, residents were against the Highland Creek pilot project. They did not want to be singled out um, as being around a post-secondary institution. So what kind of options do you think would be explored by this? Is this um, a wide range of things? Is everything on the table to look at? Is this you know, in consultation with the local community that you're looking at uh, this exploration of options to create more student housing? As far as I would be concerned, the answer is yes, uh, through you, Speaker, uh, that the all options should be on the table. I mean, the bottom line here is that we now, and you know, I was boasting yesterday in the context of uh, how great the city is and how much we owed Premier Davis for inventing the college system, that today you've got, uh, you know, Centennial College with, I think, what I said, 20,000 full-time and 20,000 part-time students. And if you break that down even further, a great number of those are international students who, by definition, are going to need a place to live when they get here. And so I think that the province, the education and college and university system, and and um, and, and with the ingenuity of the private and nonprofit sectors, have to start to take some responsibility for this and not assume that everybody is going to be housed uh, in, in these kinds of uh, uh, of, of um, what are presently ad hoc, uh, unrecognized, illegal arrangements, and and part of our responsibility, I think, is to um, to bring those within the law and regulate them so that at least while we're reliant upon them, uh, that they're legal and safe uh, and affordable. And uh, then I think we have to do more on student housing because we just haven't clearly have not done enough to keep up with the growth, as is the case in so many areas of these colleges and universities, which is a good news story. Okay, thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Do my best. Councillor Holliday, questions? Uh, thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Mayor uh, about the motion before us. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm sure, like my colleagues, uh, I've been shouting about this from the mountaintops for some time, and I've talked to many residents associations, residents, neighbours, people, businesses, anyone that I encounter. Uh, that has any interest in planning in neighborhoods and organization. Um, and yet, even as early as a few days ago, I still run into people that have no idea uh, that this is coming or um, they don't even understand the difference between multi-tenant houses and rooming houses, and the latter being something a little bit more common in the vernacular. Um, and maybe even some that have cynicism saying, you know, that council does whatever they want. They don't care what we have to say. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, some of the consultation room that you've built into this, especially the, the consultation that may be able to capture that silent majority that's out there? Well, thank you for the question, Deputy Mayor, and, and through you, Speaker. Uh, I would just say that I think a lot of this is born out of ignorance and fear. And, you know, those are the things that often, um, you know, uh, propel a lot of bad uh, public policy decisions or, or just opinions that are, you know, sort of not what they what they should be in terms of being well informed uh, on, on issues. And I do think that, uh, you know, one of the things that could be done is to actually take people, I know it sounds, um, you know, it sounds uh, like a very sort of granular thing to do, but I mean, we, we did it with regard to the modular housing and actually took people on tours of the ones that presently existed from some of the areas where they didn't yet exist, but where they were controversial. I think we've got to start to sort of bring the city together in that respect and have people come 
uh, to visit uh, downtown where we have successfully regulated and accepted and embraced and had as a form of affordable uh, housing for people uh, these multi-unit uh, uh, dwellings and explain how uh, how those fit, how the regulations that we're proposing and working on here can, can regulate them, can make them safer, can make them legal, can give us broader powers of enforcement. I think we do have to get, I mean, I had a, an excellent chat the other day with a doctor who'd written me, one of a hundred doctors who wrote me and wrote all of us, I think, saying you should bring this into force. And I said, you know, um, your, your argument isn't really best advanced to me. Uh, you should help us, and, and they were quite willing, by the way, to go and sit with some of our local residents and go through some of the social determinants of health and how having housing uh, like this as part of a broad range of affordable uh, indoor housing for people is going to help us with some of the other perplexing issues we face. So to me, it's a very wide ranging both public education and consultation campaign so that people under can understand what this regime is and what it is not, because I think there's a lot of fear out there about what it is, which is not true. And there's a lot of misunderstanding, um, you know, about that. And we've got to sort of put some of those myths uh, to rest. And I think we just need the time to do that properly, which I would say respectfully uh, as, as an administration overall, like the, with the process that has been followed, hasn't obviously hasn't yet answered those questions. Thank you. Um, and just, just on that silent majority piece, you know, not everybody is civically engaged or is a member of a residence association. I do see a little piece in here about public opinion research. Um, is there some assurances that, that that's going to be widespread and it's going to capture people that might not otherwise have expressed an opinion on this or had a chance, as it says here, to put their concern forward? Um, do you see this as a, as a robust package so that uh, we can get to those that haven't had their say? Well, Speaker, through you, I don't think we use this often enough as a tool. Um, and, and it's not so much to me to get the sort of the, what do they call it, the horse race about, you know, whether people are in favor or opposed. I think probably a good number of people across the city would understand and be favorably disposed to some of the principles involved, what we're trying to do here to make sure we can have a legal, safe range of housing options for people across the city. I think what we need to understand from the public opinion research is what is it that is causing people to have this hesitation so that we know precisely you know, what to what to address in this public education and consultation process that has to happen, because I think there's a great deal of misunderstanding and fear that has been created about what is going to happen if we regularize this in the way that I hope we will. Um, and I just think we have to do it right, though, and maybe, you know, and look, I, I think when, when things are this divided, I think then the more information we can get on why some of our constituents are telling us, and when I say our, I mean the constituents out there are telling us they don't want this and, and try to address some of those remarks, as we've done with vaccine hesitancy. I mean, we've sort of taken the reasons people have and tried to address them one by one so as to reduce the number of people who feel that way. And I think if that pressure is lessened because people are better informed, then you have a higher likelihood of there being greater acceptance at this council uh, based on what everybody said about how they feel that they should be representing their constituents. And I think I even heard Councillor Perks understanding that reality that, you know, that, that we all face. Me too. Okay, Thank you. Th thank you. Councillor Lai, questions? Thank you, Speaker, through you to Mayor Tory. Uh, Mayor, we have spoken quite a number of times in the last few weeks on this important item, and I really wanted to thank you for your leadership and uh, for, for your availability. Uh, just a couple of questions for you. Am I correct to assume that your motion will allow for a more fulsome consultation process with interested parties, just like those side majority as uh, deputy Mayor Holiday alluded to, including resident associations. Yes, I would like it to be as wide ranging as it can be, but done in a reasonable period of time, because I think we uh, we need to continue to uh, to move forward and make progress on this. But the answer is yes. And in all those community councils like uh, Scarborough Community Council, North York Community Council in the inner suburbs, I would assume. Well, I think we should be consulting across the city, but the place where there seems to be the, I'll call it the resistance to this is in the uh, areas of uh, North York and Scarborough and Etobicoke, and I'll repeat something I said in my remarks, which are that this is not an ideologically based issue. This is an issue that is based on um, on, on, on pre-amalgamation divisions that existed. That's why this uh, history is where it is, with, with a different set of laws in one place than another. And, uh, you know, remarkably, all these years later, by council after council, it hasn't yet been resolved. We're now you know, achingly close, and I want to just get it the rest of the way there so that we can benefit those who are concerned about the present illegal rooming houses which do exist and will not go away no matter what happens today and that we can move forward to make sure that we have a range of affordable safe housing for people of limited means 
Yeah, am I correct to assume that your motion will acknowledge the importance of any new bylaws would have on the built form and the character of the neighborhood in the inner suburbs? Well, I mean, it has a number of things in it that look at things like land economics and look at, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure it refers exactly to what you just said, but I mean, in the end, um, it does say we're going to reach out and discuss with the residents of different neighborhoods across the city, um, you know, their reasons for concern about this. And uh, I suspect that phrase that's often used about the character of our neighborhood, you know, I've heard a lot about that with the support of housing too, and I respect that, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're moving forward there to do what is right. Um, and that's what we're going to move forward to do here. I'm, I'm optimistic we can if we give this a chance and, um, and, and, and do this additional work that uh, people have told us, at least in significant enough numbers, uh, that uh, that's what we should do and what we need to do in order to get the confidence to, uh, to move this forward. Yeah, my last question is, uh, Mr. Mayor, is number four of uh, your 12 points that you are proposing on your motion, uh, an enhanced enforcement staffing plan. I'm just wondering, would, 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 uh, would you consider or would staff consider the, to increase the six MLS enforcement officers in the 2022 budget to deal with the illegal rooming houses now in, the, in some of these uh, areas that has many in the illegal rooming houses? Well, Speaker, through you to the councillor, I'm, I'm willing to, to look at that uh, as part of addressing something that I think would actually help us to move us forward because people see now, and I mean, it's a bit of a circular discussion, unfortunately, because people say, well, you're not out there adequately enforcing the illegal rooming houses that exist today, and a lot of them phone us to complain about those, and yet when we try to take a step to actually put ourselves in a position where we can properly regulate that and have the enforcement staff to do it, people are opposed to that. And so, uh, you know, I'm willing to look, but I, I don't, I don't, it's not an answer. I mean, yeah, better okay. enforcement now, more Fair resources enough. for enforcement will help, but we need to find an answer for yeah. this in the longer term, uh, as we've been told and as we know. Thank you. Good enough. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, questions? Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your, your initial uh, uh, support. You've been very clear. You are very much in favour of stamping out illegal forms of housing in the area I represent. That's what I think I heard you say. Well, I, to, through you, Speaker, I'd rather put it in a positive way, Councillor Carroll, which is I want to legalize and make safe and make uh, healthy and affordable uh, those a wide range of housing. And right now we have a whole bunch that is not legal because it's not recognized and it's not regulated. So I'd rather put it in the positive. But I mean, I am strongly supportive of that. And I thank you in return for the work you did over the summer, looking at different ways in which we could try to make this package uh, more acceptable to more people uh, on council and, and across the city. But, but the answer is yes, I want to see us regularize and legalize and, and properly regulate this form of housing, which m must be part of the range of options we offer to some of our uh, people that are struggling the most. Yes, and I, and, and I think you just demonstrated perfectly what, what, what the communication challenge may be. Uh, and I would include even, uh, never mind some of the communities, some of my own colleagues have uh, 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 not really seen the, uh, the difference between legal and illegal uh, uh, enough to contain their comments. When we say, when we say legalize, um, uh, you would submit that what we're trying to do is, is make sure that, that that illegal form of housing that it's the end of the block become something substantially different, something fire safe, something uh, uh, that, that, that we, we, we have some handle on how many units there are and something that is, that is uh, openly and, and internally inspected by, by our own staff. Um, so, so what we're talking about is working until we have a common understanding, community and council, uh, what's being uh, asked to be achieved here. The question I would ask is, do you think that, that your, your motion says 2022? Do you think that staff understand that time is of the essence and that uh, doing that means doing it early in the first half of 2022? Insofar as we really need to get this done before, before we get into going back out into the hustings, if we're really going to affect a decision. It's the first week of October, Councillor Carroll, through you, Speaker. It's the first week yeah. of October. 
And I would hope that work would start tomorrow morning because there's been a lot of work done already and I give full marks to everybody who's done it, including yourself and other councillors who worked on this over the summer, but we've got to keep on with this work. It's got to start again tomorrow morning, if not later this evening, uh, because there is an urgency to this. There's an urgency in, from the standpoint of the complaints we get about the presently unregulated illegal rooming houses. And there's an urgency in terms of the supply of affordable, safe housing. Uh, for people who are of uh, limited means. As I said earlier on, this is we're, we are dealing, as Deputy Mayor Bylaw said, with a housing crisis in this city, and we can't afford to be sort of just ruling options out uh, without, as opposed to doing the hard work of finding ways in which we can rule them in uh, and make them safe and make them legal and make them acceptable uh, to uh, people in terms of having their confidence in our uh, ability to regulate them. So the answer to your question is yes. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Crawford, questions? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the uh, the motion, and and I will be supporting it. And you've outlined very clearly this is an incredibly divisive issue, and unfortunately, it's it's not pitting politics politics, but more the suburbs against downtown. That concerns me. Concerns I think all of us. Um, and when I look at uh, one of my communities being out in the suburbs, there there is this people feel threatened by this, feel threatened that it's going to impact single family residential communities. Um, and when you're looking at, and what they see is the impact to the illegals. When you're looking at the enforcement, when you're looking at the power of entry, property standards, parking, um, partying and all that, this is what they see, this is what they experience. And they are not confident or comfortable that moving forward with legal multi-housing tenants um, will fix things. So how do you see us moving forward over the next you know, number of months you know, communications is a big part of that, but I think at the root of this, they're, they're, they're really worried that this is going to impact their individual communities. And I'll just end you again, when you and I were at the modular home, along with the deputy mayor a couple of weeks ago, we sort of felt the same thing at the very beginning. So can you just outline through your motion how we're going to overcome some of these concerns and threats that people are feeling? I think we have to do this uh, in a united fashion, uh, Councillor Crawford, and through your speaker, and I thank you for the question. You know, I don't think we've seen enough of, frankly, some of the people that have had a reasonable experience with this, exactly more or less what we're proposing here, uh, you know, going to other parts of the city and saying, let me sit down with you and tell you how it's worked in my area because it's worked fine. Um, I think we're going to have to do a lot more standing up, as I have certainly tried to do with the supportive housing right across the city. And I think it's we've made progress with it. But we're going to have to do that with this whole missile, missing middle issue, with the entire uh, multi-tenant housing issue, because you know what? The status quo is not an option for a city that is going to be growing at 100,000 people a year again when the borders reopen, because it will. The city's going to boom again. I'm confident of that. We have to have a full range of housing. And I think under the leadership of Deputy Mayor Bilo and myself, we've done a great job of getting support from the other governments. Not enough yet, but a great start compared to what we've ever had before to build thousands upon thousands of affordable and supportive housing units. But there's going to be more than that necessary including the missing middle uh, report that's going to come back to us, including this. Uh, and I think we have to sit down and just and, and debunk the myths and, and, and talk about the experiences elsewhere. Uh, and in so doing, uh, you know, have people comfortable, perhaps not wildly enthusiastic about the fact the status quo is not an option, but comfortable that a changing, growing, successful city and one that is fair to all of its residents requires that we have a full range of options open to us, which at present we do not. And that's leaving aside entirely the legal uh, issues that have been uh, put in front of us. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I have um, a couple of questions and uh, I will be supporting your motion because I believe we need more time and consultation uh, that would be beneficial. But do you think that when we go up for the consultation um, to the various communities, and especially in the wards that uh, are not supportive, um, as you know, in, in the former city of York, we have legal and illegal. Uh, it's important that we communicate during the consultation, as staff mentioned, um, the number of complaints to get on the illegal ones, and that it, it's a, it would be a lot easier for our staff if there were license to enforce some of these illegal ones where we get constant complaints and the condition of the rooming houses that it actually will help the community uh, than uh, what we have in place now. Could that be part of the consultation too? Because I think they need to understand the difference and if they understood uh, the problems and challenges that we have now um, that maybe they would understand and support it. 
Speaker, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I think at present, a lot of people in the areas that are not covered by, uh, you know, by, by regulated uh, multi-unit, uh, multi-tenant uh, housing, think that the reason we don't, you know, uh, deal with them and get them fixed up and so on, and, and I've been out, by the way, to see some of the ones in the su suburbs that are uh, the subject of irritation in these communities. I think the reason they think we don't move on them is because we don't care. You know, we have other things to do or we're too busy or we're just ignoring them. When in fact, what we haven't adequately explained is that the present legal regime does not allow us to do very much, save and accept if the fire department gets there. And that this kind of uh, framework that we're gonna do some further work on, I hope, uh, will actually allow us to address those complaints uh, and uh, will put a, 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 a solid, responsible legal framework in place uh, to regulate others which may follow. And I, I think, again, that's one of the fears that we have to address is, you know, what's going to be the upshot of that. But I think that the point you made is extremely important for us to uh, uh, tell people because, you know what, by doing nothing, not only do we have the, you know, potential legal liabilities that have been discussed, but we have um, uh, no change to the status quo. The complaints will just keep on coming. And I can't imagine how that moves us forward at all. Yeah, and, and it's important that we do a comparison. And I think my ward would actually be a good comparison because I do have legal uh, rooming houses and I have illegal rooming houses. And the complaints that we get are the illegal ones. And that's what my, yes. my constituents are frustrated with is that we can't enforce. And that's where the problem is. I, I, I agree with that too, Speaker. I, I, I mean, it's part of the problem. And I just hope yeah. that maybe this council, as a group of now 26, including me, uh, can work together on this and can maybe use some people who can visit other parts of the city and talk about what the experiences have been that have not been entirely negative and not uh, play politics with this, as it were. This is not an ideological issue, as far as I'm concerned, it's not. It is a, an issue that has to do with the sort of geography and history of the city and the pre and post amalgamation. And it's one of those issues, a few of them that we just haven't come to grips with many, many years later. And I just think we've got to keep working and working and working and we will get it done as soon as we can, but with the confidence of the people and the confidence obviously of a majority of the council. It doesn't do us much good to bring something forward and have the majority of the council say no. Um, you know, that will not enhance any position for the people who are struggling to find housing or for, our, for, for the legal uh, situation. Yes, and it's also important to have the councillors in North York and Scarborough uh, that are not supporting that they understand as well, and maybe they can uh, uh, communicate it to the residents. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for uh, advanced circulating your motion. It was uh, very helpful. And um, I note that you have, referring the item to the chief planner, Executive Director, MLS, Housing Secretariat, and Chief Communications Officer. Is there a reason why you didn't have a senior city staff person be the one who's going to uh, take all of that and make that report? I always find that giving no, four people uh, the giving four people the, the responsibility sometimes it just doesn't happen around this place. I, I know what you mean, uh, you know, and that, I, I mean, I, I, I share that experience with you sometimes. And so, yes, we, we could easily, uh, I, you know, have a look at having somebody as the sort of the lead person in this. For that matter, maybe it should be the city manager, quite frankly, because this trespasser, that's the wrong word, transgresses across uh, a whole series of, as we've heard, a whole series of departments and, and so on. But uh, again, the bottom line is I just want to get it done. No, I want to get you. it done properly. I get the work done and, and uh, get on with it. So I know sometimes we find that if there's not somebody that's the lead horse that takes a long time and lots of communication. So of course that would take longer. So if the city manager was to take charge of this extremely important file, because we heard of the number of fire deaths in these illegal traps. That's right. Um, you, uh, you might change your motion to add city manager as the lead to report back. But I'm yes, and I should say, Speaker, sorry, Councillor, I should just say, by the way, there was reference made early on in the debate today to other amendments and motions people may put. Um, you know, if they, if they don't get dealt with, I'm more than happy to see those uh, sent off. And, and somebody said it was possible to send them off uh, without kind of official status, but send them off to the group that are going to look at this um, to make sure all those ideas get into the mix, because I think that's very important as well, that we get I, the input of other councillors. I don't think we can amend a referral motion. I've tried that in the past. No, but just that, they said they could just send them off, up. kind of like send them off and have them received as, uh, you know, and noted as it were, that's all. It's your motion, so I'm asking you about that for the city manager. Oh, uh, yes, I, I actually would be happy to do that. Uh, and and, and just, so I'll find the words to say we refer the item to the city manager and 
ask him to, to work in consultation work in conjunction with it and then just carry on from there yes the other thing that concerns me greatly is the 2022 i've seen so many things just go into uh that black hole when there's not an actual report back date and i think even for this today we had the very explicit report back to this council meeting and i know councillor perks asked you a whole number of questions or he asked uh, no yes he asked you the questions about your uh, a to m that many of those are underway already so i'm a little concerned i i would really appreciate i think i could support this if it was uh, you know december council and that work was rounded up and brought back by then but uh, I would just say concerned. to you, sorry, sorry, Councillor, yeah. uh, I said through you, Speaker, I would just say to you that uh, I want this work to get done as soon as possible. I think uh, 2022 uh, is realistic, but you also, if you try to force feed these things, yes, so you can sort of make an argument the work gets done faster, but maybe it gets done uh, in a way that you still don't have the kind of consensus I think we need to find here. We need to find a consensus and do better than we've done. We're, we're as I say, achingly close. Um, so look, I, the motion says what it says about timing. Um, I, I will add in because I think it's constructive reference. Not that anything you've said is not constructive, but I'll add in the reference to the city manager because I think that is constructive and um, people will have to make their own decision about, about the timing, but it does say in 2022. And we did, we have, we have had advice in, in camera, but also indicated that we can discuss the fact that there are some human rights issues related to this issue itself. Does it not concern you in not having something, it concerns me, I'm sure it concerns you in not having something a little tighter as far as a report back is concerned, that it kind of puts the city in a difficult position. I did, uh, Councilor, through the speaker, I did uh, question the solicitor uh, just with respect to our uh, relative legal positions in light of various outcomes that could occur today. And uh, of course, I'm concerned about that, uh, but I'd like to see us do the work to avoid all of that. and have our own regime that people can have confidence in at this council and across the public. And that's what this work is designed to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's it for the questions. So if we can put up the list for speakers. It's two minutes, right? Yes. Speaker, is it two or three minutes to speak? Two minutes. Two minutes. Councillor Perks. Thank you. Uh, I have two points to make. The first is uh, I, sp I asked questions of staff just before the mayor moved his motion. 10, 10 of 13 points he is making are things that staff has already done, are outside our jurisdiction, or were in the motion that Councillor Carroll pre circulated as an amendment to get this through today. The remaining three are doing some polling doing a study on land economics, good luck with that, and uh, putting a limit on the number per year per ward, which frankly is gonna happen anyway because city staff already told you that it will take time to move them through and it's a three year phase in. So there's nothing in the mayor's deferral that actually advances this in any way. That's the first point. The second point is the mayor makes the claim that this is not ideological. I can think of some, nothing that is more foundationally ideological than the notion that people have the right to exclude those who are in groups that are protected groups in human right laws from rights law from living in, living in their neighborhood. That is foundationally ideological, the idea that we can somehow, those of us with wealth or who own our own homes, can seal off our neighborhoods so that people uh, whose rights are being violated have to live somewhere else. This is an ideological issue. Absolutely, it's an ideological issue. And passing it off, passing the buck again, is an ideological choice. The, the fact further that this has a, a date that runs past our term potentially, sometime in 2022, when our last meeting will be in July, maybe August of 2022 is itself reprehensible. I can't support this deferral. Thank you. Councillor McKelvey to speak, two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we need to change hearts and minds about this issue. Um, Multi-tenant homes are an affordable option for many people that don't have other options. 
And my mother is a good example of that. She moved out of Ontario housing on Blake Street when she was 16 years old. She lived in a rooming house. Uh, I was born when she was 17. They then lived in a house where rooms were rented out to all of their friends, uh, a co-living arrangement that made it possible for her to then go back and finish school. Later on, she had affordable rental housing that allowed her to go back to college. And her success story leads to my success story. And when I'm out, I, I've seen friends of my parents that, that remember us from in that house. And they're so proud that that little baby is here at Toronto Council. And, you know, I'm very, very disappointed consensus that's needed to move this proposal forward. In 2018, at the Community Association debate, I said the status quo is not working. It's not working for homeowners who are frustrated with property standards. Bring out Councillor McKelvey. Councillor McKelvey, we can hear you. Can you start? Did you hear any of it? Speaker? No, okay, if, you come, if you can shut off. You, your, you were talking about, yeah. Shut you off you got to the community meeting. Yeah, if you can shut off your video, okay. Um, so at the community meeting in 2018, uh, I said the status quo is not working. It's not working for residents, uh, homeowners who are frustrated by property and parking standards, and it's certainly not working for the residents of the multi-tenant homes, including 18-year-old Helen Goyo, who died in a fire in a multi-tenant home. So we need to continue working on this to change hearts and minds so that we can get this through. And, and that's the only reason that I am supporting this proposal today is that I don't think it would have gone forward in its current form, as disappointing that is. And I'd like to thank councillors Carol and Bailau for all of their great work on this issue. I've had many great conversations with them. It was a delight to work with them. And I'm hopeful that the next time this comes forward, we've changed enough hearts and minds to get it through. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Men and Wong, two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do want to <clears throat> thank the mayor for moving this deferral. It's the right thing to do. Um, <clears throat> it's going to come back uh, next year. I, I think it's going to continue to come back. Fundamentally, uh, and I don't think it's a hearts and minds issue. I think it, the problem here is that um, our uh, there's no enforcement. There's no confidence in our enforcement people. And this, I don't blame this on. Uh, uh, on the on Carlton Grant, I blame it on his predecessors who gutted the department. There's no confidence that if we had these rooming houses that the property standards um, would be kept up and we have to change that before we can even consider moving forward. This is about the commercialization of residential areas by absentee owners who rent out homes that they don't reside in, they don't care, um, and this erodes stable residential neighborhoods. That, that's, what, that's what people in North York and in my community are concerned about they don't keep up their property and they bring down the property values of everybody else and the quality of life of everybody on the street um you know fundamentally what we need to talk about really is what we don't talk about enough in this council is we don't talk enough about homeowners rights people who invest in the city and who live in stable stable residential neighborhoods the people that pay the taxes in the city and uh, we've got to start talking more about that if we're going to move forward Thank you. Councillor Cressy to speak. Well, thank you, Speaker. Um, we desperately need a citywide rooming house framework. Our residents desperately need it for, for housing affordability and for safety. Our residents need this, and it's overdue and it's necessary. Um, and I would suggest that there is an ideology at play here. In fact, the deputy mayor just referred to homeowners' rights. The ideology we're dealing with here is called not in my backyard. And that's an ideology we must overcome if we are to build an inclusive city, inclusive for all. Now, this matter has been deferred for years in an attempt to create a, the political conditions and I praise the mayor for his support for this file and the deputy mayor by Lau for her leadership. But today, the consequences of inaction outweigh the desire to forge a larger majority vote. The consequences of inaction are greater than the desired consensus. The right thing to do today is to approve this framework today. Our residents need it today. 
that matters more than a broader consensus. I supported a deferral in July on the express condition that we approve this today, not to defer it again. And so I cannot support this deferral. The time has come to approve this. Our residents are counting on us. Thank you. Councillor Matlow. Councillor Matlow. Listening, hi. Listening to the debate and some of the speeches earlier, um, I must say leaves me frustrated. Um, I'm hearing arguments about read suggestions that the status quo isn't good enough. If we support this deferral, we are, we are voting for the status quo. Um, I, I hear comments around leadership. The leadership that I've witnessed has been Councillor Perks advocating for years to try to arrive at the same thing and to convince me to support it. I've heard that there are human rights concerns and I've heard advice that should give us all pause before defer deferring this item. I've heard from city staff that the longer we wait, the longer we leave people's lives in peril. That it's not a question of whether or not there are going to be rooming houses. That question has been answered. There already are. There are legal rooming houses where people's lives are in jeopardy. We are leaving, we are currently leaving our own residents' lives in jeopardy, knowingly so. We are very deliberate about that. So we've got a few politicians who are scared of the political repercussions of doing what they know to be right, and therefore we're gonna boot this down the road. That's not leadership. There's just a, that, that's, that's the opposite of leadership. So there have been so many times where we have shown leadership where there have been real public health concerns. And we haven't gone out and consulted for a year or two years and asked people if they, you know, you know, how they feel, whether or not there's a pandemic or if they like fire or we get advice and we we do the right thing and, and we have the courage to explain it and we have the evidence behind us. And reasonable people understand that. We've already heard the advice from the experts and we're ignoring that today if we defer this. So I just haven't, I have not seen leadership on this. Um, aside from Councillor Perks who, whether you call it ideological or, or just like driven by the evidence that he's seen and the community that he serves, but I'm just convinced that doing anything other than moving forward with this now is, is being willfully blind to the evidence and ignoring the advice that we've heard from our staff that we will be leaving people in jeopardy, in peril. And that's just, that's not acceptable and it goes against our number one job. Thank you. Councillor Fillion, two minutes. Yes, hi. I I have a couple of amendments. Uh, if the clerk could put them up on the screen, I'm not gonna go through them in any detail because uh, there isn't enough time in two minutes, but they're just uh, to add on to the mayor's list, which I think is a good one. I don't, I think they're complimentary. I hope so. Uh, one just has to do with more options for creating legal student housing, especially on main streets. And I think that's an issue uh, we need to solve with the other levels of government and obviously the post-secondary institutions, um, regardless of whether we proceed with rooming houses. And the second one is having to do with um, um, dealing with the illegal rooming houses. Um, I thank the mayor for um, the deferral. I think he's bang on that we do not want to uh, increase the divide between uh, the downtown and the former burbs. We saw from 2010 how that works out. Um, I think this needs to be massaged. And um, if we are approaching this ideologically, we need to stop. If I've been too rigid and or old fashioned or something in my thinking, I need to re-examine that. But um, so do 
those who only see one way of doing this. Um, the area I represent is probably the most urban of the former suburban areas, and people are very divided on this, and, and they're, they're troubled, they're conflicted. Um, certainly the majority would still tilt against um, rooming houses, but a lot of people worry about where their kids are going to live, where the grandkids are going to live, um, especially when they're students. Um, you know, it, it's people feel a social responsibility, even those who are uh, more affluent and comfortable. And um, I, I think we just need to really, um, you know, remove the brackets in our brains in approaching this issue and, and focus, I think, as the mayor was suggesting, on all the things that everybody agrees on. And that certainly is that we need Th to provide thank, more thank affordable you, housing th options th in thank all you, parts Councilor of the city. Thank you, Councillor Fillion. It's two minutes. Thank you. Councillor Lai, two minutes. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, we all know that the subject of multi-tenant housing or rooming house is a huge issue, especially in the inner suburbs. It would affect the built form significantly. It would affect the character of the neighborhoods significantly. I recognize that there's a need for more affordable housing in the city and also to ensure safety in rooming houses. The consultation process for such a major policy needs to be up as broad and inclusive as possible and must involve the community councils in every former municipality. And it must be robust with stakeholders, including the residents. My constituents and I made many policy suggestions that would get us to support the proposed framework. For example, units being owner occupied. This will subsidize some homeowners with their monthly mortgage payments, not supporting those who operate them as a business. Other suggestions include limiting the number of uh, rooming houses on the street or reducing the number of units allowed. So more work needs to be done to have more re residents to be on site. I'd like to thank those constituents who had provided me with input and solutions. I understand staff have done excellent job in, uh, on this framework, but let's work together to get it right and to make it fairer for all. I did my own survey where 20% were in support and 40% opposed. So I just need more time to, to, to change more minds and to kind of, you know, to make sure that everybody's on side. And, and that being said, Speaker, I will support the mayor's referral motion. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Madam Speaker, I, I, I'm offering myself up to help uh, with that extra time that my, my colleague just said she needs with her residents. I'm here to help. I've uh, been dealing with this for many, many years. You know, Madam Speaker, I'd love to be uh, as principled and high minded as some of my colleagues have been thus far and saying, how dare we refer. But my community can't go on with the status quo of having illegal forms of housing and I need to get to success. So to say no to referral and, and then knowing, knowing full well, uh, you know, let's be grown ups here. Our community knows that we count our votes. It's, it's going to be no both times, both to the item and to the referral of the item by doing that. And then nothing happens and my residents lose because they're stuck with the status quo. Madam Speaker, so often, we miscommunicate these things or under communicate these things quietly in the in the midst of all the the covid fall to all in terms of really explaining this to the community a consultation happened called regulatory and compliance framework for multi-tenant houses across toronto what the heck is that anyway <laughs> I can tell you because I attended a couple of them. I know Councillor Bailao attended them all. They were very sparsely attended. So these 90% and 80% in these big angry rooms, they, they just have, have never been in a room where they, they truly understood what this is about. Stamping out illegal forms of housing in North York and Scarborough and parts of Etobicoke. That's what this is. That's what this is. And we haven't driven that point home. When we say we're going to legalize rooming houses, it sounds to people like we're going to legalize what they have now and nothing changes with that mess at the end of the block. And that is so not the proposal. 
But what we did here was they want more resources. The, uh, I will Councilor be moving Carroll? that motion after this referral vote. Can't, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay, members, it's um, quarter to six. So we need a motion um, if we're going to extend and finish the agenda. Um, Don't move, Madam Speaker. Councilor okay. Grimes, move to finish the agenda. Okay, J just one sec, just one sec. To finish the agenda and um, as well as there's some technical amendments that, uh, that we're waiting for from staff that have to be approved today. So a motion to extend and finish the agenda moved by Councilor Grimes. On favor? Show of hands. Carry. Okay, but what I would like to ask is that um, once we finish this item, if we can have a 10, 15 minute break that staff need, because if we're gonna extend, they need a short break. Um, uh, just ask staff, how much time do you need? We used to have a supper break. For okay, half hour. we're going to have a 20 minute break because we need staff an opportunity to go pick up something and we, we have to give the staff a break, 20 minutes at least. Um, okay, members? Is everyone okay? Uh, can you wave your hands? Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor. Holiday, two minutes. Thanks, Speaker. Um, earlier, I heard criticism of the, the phrase, not in my backyard or NIMBY. Whether it's not my backyard, not my front yard, not my side yard, not next door. Uh, I think that's a legitimate position. And I think people are entitled to take it. And we should be listening as counselors. People think this is a bad idea. And they may not be wrong. And it's okay that they said that. It's okay that's what comes forward in the consultation. It's our job as counselors to put all this together and figure it out. It's a big city. It's different in different parts of the city. These proposals impact neighborhoods differently. And my personal opinion is uh, maybe we're going too far on this. But maybe there is a solution to find the answer to what staff have pointed out, some issues with the bylaws. Um, I hope we find those. I'll support the deferral because I think there's more work to be done. I can't accept the package that's before us. And uh, I understand all the people have told me that they think it's a bad idea. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tan, two minutes. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. In the staff report, there was stipulation and uh, and an assertion from the chief planner that there is no planning rationale for the current uh, zoning by bylaw regime as it stands. Um, and I think we have we are all aware of, of the implications of what happens uh, when a human rights challenge is, is taken. And, and when that is advanced, uh, uh, the most likely outcome is that the city will lose uh, simply because we are uh, in violation of the uh, simply because we are uh, in violation of the highest land in the law. Um, and if that happens, uh, not only will the tribunal rule against the city for taking no action, inadequate action, we could be left with a new regulatory uh, framework imposed upon us without a licensing criteria. Um, so, Madam Speaker, the risk here for the city is, is quite significant. And I think that we have an obligation to actually make a decision today. So therefore, council takes a decision, even if it's a decision that, that leads us to fail, but at least we have it on the record. For us to defer it and leave it entirely up to the Ontario Land Tribunal or perhaps the uh, Human Rights Tribunal, I think would be a, a colossal error on our part. Um, and I want to just highlight one other thing, Madam Speaker. I mean, we've talked about lives at risk. We've talked about public safety. Um, you know, we, when there's even been talk about leadership, what does it say when we have three deputy mayors who are actively speaking out against this and the majority of, of the executive committee? And, and Madam Speaker, I, I only highlight that because we have 
seen this particular mayor have extraordinary success with his winnability on boats. And here we are on a matter so critical that impacts human rights laws, that impacts public safety in, in, from edge to edge of the city. And, and we have to um, for this once again after 13 thank, years thank of, you, uh, of non Thank you, Councillor Wong Your time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, there's no issue that um, this is a sound policy uh, for the city when we're looking at issues of housing. Um, I, I was one of those councillors who was not supportive of this um, report, um, but I am supporting the mayor's um, motion to move this forward. The majority of residents in my ward, in my community, are concerned about this. Uh, it may be that they don't understand fully the complexities of that, but the regardless, what they see in their communities is the impact to illegal rooming houses. They see uh, and pop up illegal rooming houses. Those are the ones that are impacted when you're looking at infills in those two to three year period, you know, of the partying, of the parking issues. This is what they see. They have not seen that this report will make things better. And I think over the next number of months, we need to uh, reach out to them to ensure that they're issues are being dealt with because they're very serious issues out in the community there that I represent. But I also had a meeting with a, a group of Bengali people on, on Saturday talking about affordable housing and the issues of affordability across the city and how important this um, report is for us moving forward. So I recognize those concerns on two different sides of my community. Uh, my hope is, is that we can bring together both these sides to really understand and to explain the challenges that are before us with regard to affordable housing in the city, but recognizing those real issues that these communities are facing when they're looking at the idea of having um, multi-tenant housing or rooming houses on their streets and in their communities, because those issues and those concerns that they have are real. We owe it to them to address these over the next couple of months, and that's why I'm hoping that this uh, referral will give me and all of us that opportunity to reach out and have those important conversations with our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I would like to speak. Uh, first of all, I will be supporting the referral. Now, to make it perfectly clear, I do support the new framework. Um, but I think, and I agree with the mayor, uh, it's obvious by listening to some of the councillors in North York and Scarborough, they have concerns, and that it's important that we do more consultation and, may, and trying to convince these councillors that are opposed to it um, on what the benefits are if you do um, uh, enforce some of the illegal rooming houses because if we don't, then you're going to have more problems than you have now because that's where the problem is. And um, with the recommendations and the motion that the mayor has made, I, I think that we will be able to reach out to these communities and as well as to some of the councillors. Now, Councillor Matlow mentioned that uh, he feels this, uh, the referral motion is a lack of leadership um, well, first of all, I think by the mayor, by moving his motion and trying to reach out to these communities that are, are not convinced and to some of these councillors, in my opinion, is leadership. Thank you. Layton. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And first off, like, I, I, I don't think there's anyone doubting uh, Mayor Tory's support for the what's being presented from from staff i think where the concerns are is that we're, we we don't seem to be gelling as a council around what is being recommended to us by uh, our city staff uh, and and what was most alarming to me was the confidential report which i can't talk about in any great d detail uh, but if you read the confidential report it it is quite clear the position that we should take and 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 uh and, and we have, as we got in the uh, in the answers to the questions, um, we have much to lose if we don't determine what the course is as soon as we can in order to move this forward. Um, I appreciate that this is a difficult position for some. It's not so much for me, partly because of the reasons why Councillor Perks outlined. Also, I live in a neighborhood with roaming houses, and it's not the problem that many of your communities may think that they are. It's just simply not an issue when they're legalized and have licenses and have to go through the process of keeping people safe, it also keeps the community safe while pro providing the much needed affordable housing. I wasn't gonna speak, 
but, but De Deputy Mayor Denzel Minen Rong said a couple things that I think we should uh, take note of. One, he blamed city staff for reduction in enforcement complement, specifically the leadership of municipal licensing and standards. Shame on you. You voted for those budgets. In 2012, you cut 12 positions. And just the next year, staff warned us in the analyst notes. I'm looking at it right now on page 20. They warned us they were from property standards and yet did not return those positions because we voted for it. Do not try to put this on them. It's on council and you supported those budgets, Councilor Min and Wong. Second is suggesting and actually perpetuating the myth thank, that homeowners thank you, are the Councilor, only ones who pay taxes. Thank you, Councilor Layton, so your time is up. To our city. Thank, thank Half you, of the people Councilor that live in our city Layton. are renters. Councilor, they pay taxes. Councilor Layton, your time is up. Thank you. Councilor Fletcher. Thanks very much. Uh, I can't support that referral. I need a date. I need it back early. I need that work to be done. So I'm sorry, I can't do that. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have licensed rooming houses when people are calling and saying, look at what's happening. My, my residents are calling. I have a go-to MLS. It's licensed. The operator is licensed. They know there's a regimen. It is a very, very good thing. It's a great thing to have. I don't know why we can't explain that to people and they don't understand Here's the license, here's the conditions, here's everything else. Here's the license taken away because they weren't doing it properly. Second, third, are human rights different in Etobicoke than East York? Are human rights differently applied in Toronto versus Scarborough? I'm very shocked to hear our deputy mayor from Etobicoke say that maybe the residents are right that they don't want these because, of course, that's people zoning. We can't support people zoning. Human rights matter. Human rights are critical. Uh, and we can't go back to the 1950s. We are going forward. There were times when people would say they weren't renting to Irish. They weren't renting to Blacks. You know what this has been like. We have to break through. Glad the mayor wants to do this. I'd like to do it today. We've passed many pieces of legislation, including the, license, the, the uh, land transfer tax by a very slim margin because it had to be done. So that's also leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, two minutes. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I will be supporting the mayor's referral motion because it is clear from the debate over the last number of hours that more work has to be done on this file. If the current package passes, it is doomed to fail. It is so many, there's too many weaknesses it hasn't received enough consultation and it is set up not to do the work that it's supposed to do. It is a mythology that this will eliminate illegal rooming houses. That is not correct. We have, we do not have the resources to make sure that eliminate uh, illegal rooming houses will be a thing of the past. We all agree that affordable housing and respectable and dignified housing is the major issue of our time. And I can tell you that hardly a day goes by where my office isn't working with many of the property development applications, the landowners and so forth, to bring in much of the housing now and affordable housing units that embed many of the applications that come up here. This is a dignified, respectable, affordable housing options. And that's something that we should support throughout, throughout uh, our city. At the same time, I'm deeply wounded by some of the comments referring to people who are worried about this report, uh, calling, uh, uh, referring to those who oppose it as uncaring or NIMBYs. They obviously don't understand the, the, the problems um, embedded in this report and making it succeed. There is no point in adopting a report that sets us up to failure because the people who need housing want to succeed and they want a housing program that works. And right now, the only option for us is to support the mayor's referral, do more work on this file, and debate it when it's ready to go. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson to speak. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, I'll be supporting the mayor's referral, and I want to thank the mayor for his leadership. This come down, comes down to a matter of lived experience, confidence, and trust. In my community, we have actually been talking about this issue all summer. We have taken polls after polls after polls, and the numbers are very high in opposition to what is actually being proposed by the staff. 
part of the issue with respect to the lived experience is that for such a long time, people in my ward have been complaining, certainly about the illegal rooming houses, and not much has been done. And the impact that uh, our residents have, um, that's, have, have experienced as a result of this um, really forms their opinion and their lived experience. And so, yes, there's more work to be done. Yes, we have a major problem with respect to housing in this city, and we need to, to fix that. We all have a responsibility. But uh, it's not today that we're going to impose that um, uh, responsibility on my community without further dialogue, without convincing them that uh, we will actually do what we say that we will do. In my experience, in terms of the research we've done, I have not found a community, a, a place, a city in, in, in North America that has got this right. And so we don't have it right at this time. Uh, the opportunity that the mayor has afforded us with respect to his referral may help us to get it right. And at that point, uh, we will have more dialogue and discussions with certain members of my committee. But I can tell you an overwhelming number of people in my community, over 90%, are not in support of what we are actually being asked to do today. And so because I represent their interests and not the interests of the city to them, I will not be supporting what it would, would not be supporting what was in front of us. So I will support the mayor's referral on this. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Bailao to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the package in front of us was a response to two issues. The illegal rooming houses that we have that many people, I don't have illegal ones, I, my, I, my community is, we have a, a system regulated, but many of my colleagues have been grappling with on how to deal with this issue for many, many years. And this uh, package is supposed to deal with that issue in the context of the housing crisis that we have in the city. A housing crisis that was one of the biggest issues during the recent federal election, where 40% of people in the GTA said this was by far the number one issue in their minds. Madam Speaker, we continuously say this is an issue that all three orders of government need to deal with. We cannot fund our way out of this housing crisis. We cannot build our way out of this housing crisis. We need all the tools in the toolboxes. And one of the tools that we have municipally and need to start to have the courage to use it is zoning. I never thought I was going to do this, but I'm actually going to quote Tim Hudak the CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association that calls our zoning system an exclusionary zoning system, and it is. And you know where you should, we should start and we need to start by changing it is with rooming houses because they exist. And putting our hand in the sand is not gonna give, it's not gonna get away. We need better rooming houses for the protection of tenants. We need better rooming houses and different rooming houses for the communities where they live in. People need to feel that they're well integrated. I hope that as we move forward, that we, we can work together as council. And I want to thank Councillor Carroll, Councillor McKelvey, and the mayor's office. Over the, the last few months, we've tried to push this forward. And I, I'm committed to continue to, to work forward on, on, on this project to have a package. But I cannot, I cannot mention that in this same council, we have a motion to bring regulations and bring MLS to for people to rent their pools and we can't find a way to find regulations and MLS for people to rent rooms for people in the city. Thank, thank you, Councillor Bailao. Okay, on the referral motion, record, yes, the amendment. On favor of Councillor Fillion's amendment? Oh. Show of hands. Sorry, Speaker, I, 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 need a, I need a ruling on uh, uh, Councillor Fillion's motion. Um, in terms of his first part, I believe it's redundant because the mayor has identical or nearly identical language. And in terms of the second part, uh, city staff have already told us that uh, we don't have the authority to, do, to uh, change our regulatory powers uh, for illegal rooming houses. So I, I believe this whole motion is out of order.
So on the first item, I agree it's redundant, but on the second part, uh, we're asking for a staff report, so it's in order. Okay, on, on favor, show of hands, carry. Recorded, please. I would like it recorded, please. I said recorded before I asked for your ruling. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Recorded vote. Mo yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Councillor Perks. These are very difficult circumstances. Okay, so there's the amendment on the screen. We've deleted the first part. Second part, recorded vote. Speaker, the amendment carries. The vote is 22 to 3. Thank you. So on the item is amended. Thank you. Oh, sorry. The referral motion. That's what I meant. On the referral motion, the mayor's referral motion, recorded vote. Yes, as amended. Recorded vote. Speaker, the motion to uh, refer the item carries. The vote is 17 to 8. Um, okay, is that it? Yes, before we recess, there's two urgent motions that we need to add, or three. Councillor Cressy. Yes, Speaker. This is uh, a liquor license matter that's required in order to uh, meet the application timeline. All in favor, show of hands, carried. Councillor Cressy? Uh, yes, Speaker. Uh, this is urgent in order to ensure that we have a full complement uh, of councillors for the upcoming Board of Health meeting and uh, with thanks to the Deputy Mayor for seconding it and uh, Councillor Bradford for his term uh, uh, on the Board of Health. All in favor, show of hands carried. Councillor Matlow? Madam Speaker, I move that 95 to 131 and 155 Beloyal Street zoning bylaw amendment application, uh, Ontario Land Tribunal hearing request for directions uh, uh, be considered uh, at this meeting, uh, given that the uh, the uh, the Alta uh, uh, hearing is scheduled for uh, the 25th. Okay, all in favor, show of hands, carried. We're recessed to six to Speaker, I uh, have an item that I need reopened. The clerk should uh, have it. Madam Speaker, sorry, can you just repeat what time we're coming back? 6.30. Councillor Fielding, we do yours when we come back. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. 
You're welcome.
is JL2519 on no fault grants for basement flooding damages. I will take the release of members' holds. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Oh, I'm, my apologies. Uh, Councillor McKelvey has the hold on MM3618, but I have a motion that I think resolves all outstanding issues. I'll leave it up to her. Um, Madam Speaker, sorry, I can release the hold to Councillor Layton for his motion. Okay, just a sec. Let me find it. Which item is it? M MM36.18, making immediate safety improvements to Avenue Road. Okay, just a sec. Let me find it. Okay, I have it. Yes. Okay, Councillor Layton. I have a motion. I have a motion that's been advanced, circulated. I, I might have a question on that, Madam Speaker. So it's not a quick item. Okay. Okay. Councillor Carroll. Hi. Um, I think I have a quick one, Madam Speaker, because it's a it's a very friendly amendment just to add to MM thirty six point two four. It's uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong's uh, uh, motion over our heads. Clerk should have my, my quick amendment. Okay, if we can put the amendment on the screen. I have, uh, I have learned over time that when we're requesting a report, if you really want something in there, you should ask for it up front rather than be disappointed when the report comes back and there's no mention of it. Um, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong mentions the associated property standards and public health and safety issues. I would very much like to include that they report back on including pool enclosure fencing as, uh, no, no, uh, including pool enclosure fencing, the city's bylaw in their report um, that, uh, that uh, they make a proposal to that effect. The, the wording there is not quite Pool enclosure fencing is already a part of the city's bylaw. I wanted to say, including in the report, along with public health, including compliance with the pool enclosure bylaw. Okay. Sorry, I, I hadn't seen the finished wording. I didn't realize it was not quite there. Okay, Deputy Mayor Min Wong, have you seen the amendment? I'm fine with it. Pardon? I'm fine with the amendment. Okay, great. So, okay, we're just going to update it. Okay, we're going to go to the next one until um, we're able to um, make that correction. Councillor McKelvey, quick item. I forgot to take my name off the speaker, speaker list. Okay, Count, Councillor Cressy. Uh, yes, Speaker, I have two. Uh, the first is MM36.51. That is the 2021 Board of Health resignation and appointment. Uh, MM3651. Yes, Speaker. If we can put that on the screen. Oh, I don't see it on my screen. Okay. All right. All in favor? Show of hands. Carried. Uh, and speaker, the, the other one I have is MM36.52. That's the limited liquor sale license member motion. Okay. On MM3652. 
Members motion. On favor? Carried. Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, new business. CC 36.8, 1460 Victoria Park Avenue. I believe staff have a motion prepared and ready. Vote adop adopting the confidential report. Okay, this is on CC 36.8, which is 1460 Victoria Park Avenue. The amendments on the screen. On favor, show of hands. Carried. Item is amended. On favor, carried. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher. That I may be having to reopen um, one item. That was a member's motion, 36.29, to add a property, but I'll know in shortly while we're here tonight. Thank you. Okay. Okay, on MM3624, the amendment, we've got that now. We'll put it on the screen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is that okay with the way you see it? Thank you very much. Okay. On the amendment, on favor, show of pants carried. Item is amended, on favor, carried. Now, Councillor Fillion, before the break, you had asked that you wanted to reopen an item? Uh, yes, I, I assume the clerk has something ready. It's one that we, um, I don't have the number in front of me, that we adopted yesterday. Sorry, that we, re we refused yesterday. So um, it's a um, it's a settlement uh, report which we turned down a settlement offer which we turned down yesterday, and there is a uh, new improved offer today. No, which no, is, no. Hold, hold on, uh, hold on, hold on. What, you're yeah. You just read what's there, please. Do not okay talk sure. about the closed okay. session. Good, sorry, thank you. Okay, it's on the screen. On favor, show of hands, carried. Madam Speaker, it's Councillor Wong Tam. I also need to reopen yeah, an just, item. Just one sec, please. Oh, sorry. Thank you, sorry, I, I thought we voted already. I apologize. Okay, so. Councillor Fillion, on the new amendment, it's on the screen. On favor, show of hands, carried. Item is amended, on favor, show of hands, carried. Now, Councillor Wong Tam, I know that you wanted to reopen item MM 3623. Uh, that is correct. The title local. is uh, Local Planning and yeah. the first parliament master plan. I do need to reopen that, Madam Speaker. Okay. Okay, the motion is on the screen. On favor, carried. Is there an amendment you wanna make? 
Uh, yes, Madam Speaker, I simply need to amend the uh, the motion so that it re reads instead of reporting to the Planning and Housing Committee on October 27th, we now have staff reporting to the Executive Committee on October 27th. Okay, the amendments on the screen. All in favor of the amendment? Show of hands, carried. Item is amended. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will now go to GL 2519, which is the no fault grant basement flooding. Councillor Carroll, you held the item down. I have some questions to staff. Questions to staff. Thank you. I, I'm assuming they're there. Uh, so the, one of the questions I have is uh, um, going back to look at the history of this. Uh, sadly, I remember it because I was here, <laughs> but, but going back to find it in the documents is a bit frustrating. We had a, a, an entirely different reporting and minuting format in, in 2006. And so what appears before us, it doesn't tell us um, how we dealt with the finances in, back in 2006 after the uh, August 19, 2005 storm. Uh, do staff recall uh, where the funds came from to, to offer that grant at that time? Uh, yes, uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, it's Ludi Geronimo here speaking. But sadly, you uh, were still here as well. <laughs> sadly, it was one of my first items. I <laughs> yes, the funding came from uh, the Toronto Water Reserve account. And, and we set up a separate uh, fund that had a, a cap limit to it. And we put in rules for criteria to process the applications. Um, and so that's how that was created at that time. It was specific to the of uh, August 19th, 2005. And it was limited in a cap pool amount, as well as then processing the applications that had to be in by a certain date. Right, but I wonder if I, I wonder if you remember because I couldn't find it contained in the in the link that's provided in the report. I'm wondering if you remember that that part of the reason that we were able able to do it, part of the 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 way they arrived at a cap, is because we were working for with a fixed amount because it was leftover funds from the old uh, North York no fault grant days. So That's there was the sum, it was, it was approaching $4 million, but it had been sitting there since amalgamation anyways. So it wasn't really, you know, from, from the last 12 months water bills per se. No, that's correct. It, it had come, it was about, it was about over $3 yes. million. And I'm fine. And the way it was a portion, it was a very complicated uh, Sorry, uh, Mr. D. Geronimo, I, someone has their, uh, their microphone on. I don't know who's got their microphone on. It sounds like we can hear their television. <laughs> yeah. There we go. I think it's gone. Thank okay. you. So, so going back to it, yes, there was uh, an order of magnitude of three million, three to four million dollar range. Yeah, yeah. Out, um, we put together a very complex formula that uh, did a calculation. There was a re uh, there was an um, um, an initial advance payment of a certain amount that went out in a check, and then there was a final reconciliation based right. on um, the uninsured portions. We had to go through an adjuster, make sure that they went through the insurance. And then eligible expenditures were considered, and then a, a second additional check was apportioned based on how much was left in the pot, based on how many people were eligible. So it was a very complicated formula, but we tried to maximize the claims that were uh, certified as as being applicable. Right, and so, um, uh, and it, but it was really tied to the to to the fact that those funds were still sitting there, and that's, so that's correct. Um, when you brought this report to committee this time, you you were recommending receipt of this report. Is it because you, you don't feel you have the same pot, the same opportunity sitting there waiting to be used so, for something? Yeah, so from a policy perspective, a grant program of this nature is, uh, is being given specifically to individuals. And when we uh, go out and set the rate and when we tell rate payers, you know, what they're paying for in the water bill, we, we had not factored in this type of, of no fault grant program. It's essentially giving money to some people that experienced uh, an insurance loss, primarily insurance loss, 
Um, and we have not put that into the rate model. So at the end of the day, what you have is other users, other rate payers are subsidizing that no fault grant. So that was one of the equity issues that we identified in the report. Compounding that is that there's a number of uh, water rate payers who would never be eligible for this no fault grant. Uh, certain buildings, commercial and uh, industrial, ones that without basements. So they're actually contributing to a, a small subgroup who would be eligible for the no fault grant. So from an equity mm -hmm. standpoint, we weren't recommending that. Uh, right. Also from a legal standpoint, we weren't recommending it in that there's no legal basis for the municipality uh, to provide such compensation for these types of, of uh, uh, catastrophic events. Okay, but I'm, I'm wondering how you would feel about the, the motion I'm gonna move. Are there, is there any legislative Im impediment if we were to, uh, uh, if we were to honor this report request, the, the councillor is simply asking for a report back on this and, and I think now is, is saying willing to be inclusive, uh, and also what would be the impact of being inclusive of people outside of Ward 5 that had this. That's um, is there any legislative impediment to, to also uh, in that report um, also providing suggestions of alternative source of funding other than the water rate? That's your last question. That's my last so question. Thank you. So, so there's nothing that would prevent that conversation uh, from occurring because the, the issue did come up a committee trying to determine um, you know, how, how do you compensate for these types of no fault situations? Should it come from a pay as you go rate based model that's designed to build the infrastructure and provide services? And this type of uh, grant compensation was never part of the mix. Can it come from a different pool because it is more property based? It is tied to storm events and, 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 and properties that are impacted. Um, so there's nothing that prevents you from looking at that. Council has full discretion to, to look at sources of funding for, for a grant type program. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Carroll to speak. Madam Speaker. So Madam Speaker, um, I have a, uh, a motion, I think uh, clerks will put it on there that that adds words to that effect to your report request. Um, that the reason I'm doing that uh, uh, through you to council, Madam Speaker, it's your motion, but but also to the rest of council. We have a challenge. If you if you read this report, you'll note that because pre-amalgamation, something called the no-fault grant existed, it wasn't ideal because it was sort of an easy out. Uh, there was a, a no-fault grant program in North York to deal with failure of their water infrastructure and, and consequently they didn't really delve deeply into what was causing basement flooding they didn't have a basement flooding mitigation program they just said here's a check and um you know we worked to move from the grant to an actual mitigation program that fixes basements um the reason the reason i moved that way back when was was i will never forget that standing knee deep in the basement of uh I'll never forget his name is Mr. Shamalian, and he had uh, he was a collector of uh, uh, religious uh, icons from the Armenian Orthodox Church, and they were all at risk in this flooded basement. And I was there helping them mop out and and uh, and uh, listening as they they uh, 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 were in grief about this. And he he actually said he was a longtime North York resident. I don't want another check. I want you to fix this. I want this to never happen to me again. And that was sort of the birth of the basement flooding mitigation program. But that takes time, as we know. It's going to take us 30 years to look at some of the places where we know we need to do something. And, and heaven knows we need to do climate change adaptation across the, the region anyway, um, because the extreme weather is going to keep coming. And each time there's truly extreme weather as there was in 1819 in these areas where the basement flooding program hasn't touched down yet to do it to do its biggest work we have another you know it generates another uh, uh request what about that old no fault grant thing i understand that i will never forget having you know i had 1800 people who had sewage uh, uh infiltrate their their basements and and a couple it went all the way up to the main floor uh, and 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 you want to offer something at those times for the things that insurance doesn't touch so at that time in 2006 using that old reserve um 
uh, staff came up with very tight criteria. It doesn't let you off the hook of having property insurance. It doesn't let you off the hook of pushing to, to, to get insurers to cover us for flooding as much as we possibly can. Uh, heaven knows that that may go uh, uh, extinct because of climate change, but, but uh, it doesn't let you off the hook. But it, it has stringent caps around it to be very fair. And, and consequently, um, we actually didn't spend the whole reserve. About 25% of those who we, we thought might want it actually went through the process and got funds. Um, but what I would like to do is if, if this is going to keep happening, it cannot siphon funds, in my view, away from the water rate, which is trying to do the actual basement flooding mitigation and, and the, the bigger adaptation projects that we have across our, our area of service. And so um, I'm hoping that, that when the report that Councillor Nunziata comes back, when that report comes back, that, that it includes suggestions of alternative or blended sources of funding so that we do not begin to offer a grant that stops us from doing the infrastructure work we need to do. Because as Mr. Shamalian said, I don't want to check. I want this to never happen to me again. Those are my comments, Madam Speaker. Thank you. So on the amendment, on favor, show of hands, carried. Item is amended on favor, show of hands, carried. Thank you, uh, Councillor Carroll, for that amendment. So we will now go to the, uh, the second timed item, which is MM 3636, Enhanced Tree Replacement Strategy. Councillor Grimes, you held the item down. Do you have questions? Yes, I do, Madam Speaker. Before you do, could you, I've asked the clerk, I sent a picture to the clerk. I'd like to throw that up for the uh, head of my colleagues so they know what we're talking about here. Before you start my time, throw the picture up so people can see. Grimes, questions. Is my picture, oh there, thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, yeah, so question, so uh, to staff, where did the request for the sidewalk come from? Um, this is a second street school on Dwight Avenue, and there's a row of uh, nine trees that the city uh, wants to take out for the sidewalk. Where did the request for the sidewalk come from? Thanks, Council Grimes. Uh, through the speaker, the, the request originally came from the school. Um, Transportation Services re received a request from the former trustee to install the sidewalk on Dwight. This uh, request came in about 2016. And Dwight yeah, Avenue is a, is, is a yeah. collector road and the city policy calls for sidewalks on both sides of collector roads. Right, so we, we had a meeting, a public meeting the other night and uh, people asked all the same questions. Do we look at alternatives? Do we look at moving that fence back from the school board? Do we look at that? Absolutely, we, we certainly looked for opportunities to not impact the trees. We looked at four options, a curbside sidewalk, reducing the width of the sidewalk to the minimum 1.5 meters. We looked at reducing the road width and we looked at putting the sidewalk on school property. And ultimately all of those options would have some impact on trees. And people have been taking these pictures of this stretch and showing it from above and ever. And it, and it looks like we can put a sidewalk on either side of those trees, but can we? We worked closely with Urban Forestry on this and um, they reviewed the application and determined that trees would not survive the impacts of construction and the various options I just described. Uh, we did look to minimize the impact on trees and, and came forward with um, the approach being removal of the trees and replacing them at three to one ratio. Right, and then they also, they asked, is any way we could weave the sidewalk through those trees, but we're gonna impact the reach regards. And, and I think when Forestry said this at the public meeting, that these trees would probably would die anyway, correct? That's right, and I, I know urban forestry staff may be able to add to that. They're there, yeah, it'd be great. Hi, Councillor. Uh, good uh, evening. Kim, I'm going to defer to Kim. Go for it. <laughs> Thanks, Janie. Uh, good evening. It's uh, Kim Statham, Acting Urban Forestry Director. Uh, yes, I can uh, expand on what Jacqueline uh, uh, said there that uh, we would not recommend construction uh, within the tree protection zone. Uh, we have advised that uh, the trees would not survive uh, that uh, kind of impact and that's why 
uh, removal and replacement was recommended. So they would not survive the impact of digging down to put the sidewalk on either side of those trees, and they wouldn't survive if we weaved in between them? That's correct. Okay. Then there is the other one that um, there is out there that we're, the, the reason we're going to widen these roads is Dwight and Birmingham because of the development at the Campbell Soup uh, development there. Any truth to that, that uh, we're widening the roads for that development? No, there isn't truth that we're widening the roads for development. Okay, so the school board, um, I, I talked to the principal of the school board and the, and the trustee were on the, or the, the trustee was on the call, but they're pretty adamant the safety uh, of the children, number one, the school wants it, the, the parents that had the safety meeting, they want, they want uh, to keep these trees at the, they want, sorry, they want the sidewalk, correct? There is community support from the school, certainly, um, to keep, to have a sidewalk on both sides, and it is a collector road, so that is council policy, that we would have a sidewalk on both sides. With support so since that meeting, is school. Story, we've got a, a petition now. It's, it's, I couldn't present it because it's not in the proper format, but we have, I think, 1,230-something names to uh, to um, narrow the road. And uh, did staff look at narrowing the road? Uh, we, we did look at narrowing the road as well as one of the options and found that it would still have impact on, on a number of the trees, um, and so it was not recommended. So if we narrowed the road, we're still going to lose trees. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So the plan right now as it stands, which I've kind of got on hold, is they would take the, these nine trees out and replace with 17, uh, I'd call them significant trees, is that correct? Um, Urban so Forestry can comment, go ahead, Jenny. I'll just quickly comment, that's correct, Councillor, three to, a three to one ratio with larger trees. Any idea what caliper trees would be, would be planted? Uh, so, so my understanding, Councillor, is that uh, the, the caliper trees would be 80 caliper trees, which is larger than the usual trees that we use for a replanting program. Okay, and then some of the questions that come up, and I'm sure my colleagues have the same questions. Uh, the, some of those trees that were planted there now are emerald ash. They, there was some question if they would survive the next five years or 10 years. Is anyone comment ask, on I'm that? I'm going to ask Kim to comment on that. Okay. Through the speaker, uh, yeah, I understand that the uh, the makeup, uh, the species makeup of the existing trees, uh, some do include ash, uh, which uh, uh, will be and and uh, have been affected by the emerald ash borer. Um, but we would still look to uh, a three to one replacement ratio, regardless of species. So that's my next last question. I know does the city have a standard? I know when someone takes a tree down their backyard or front yard, and and let's say forestry does agree with them. Uh, use it is a is a three to one ratio we usually ask for. Uh, that is uh, a typical replacement ratio uh, for city owned street trees. Okay, that okay, was okay. Great, those are my questions. I'll, I'll speak to this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's it for the questions. Councillor Grimes to speak. No, no, I have questions. I'm done okay, for questions. I don't see your name on the. Did you put your? Well, I see it on my screen. Oh, okay. I don't see it on my. Okay, sorry, um, Councillor. No, I don't no, see no, it. not at all, Speaker. This is a. It's hard to do these meetings. I appreciate. It. Yeah. No, it's for some reason it's not on my. Now it's the, on my screen, Councillor Perks. Okay. Question. Thank you. Uh, just you know, by way of introduction, I'm fine with most of what uh, is being asked for here, but I, I have some questions on Part uh, D. Um, is it city practice to take out ads in local newspapers and, and uh, solicit informational pieces door to door when we remove trees uh, from the public right of way? So through the speaker uh, to Council Perks, it's not uh, generally city policy as uh, has is outlined in the bylaw. We generally post notices and have an online process around some of these processes, but we don't generally take out ads in newspapers. Do you have a budget for this kind of thing? Uh, for this particular item, uh, we no, no, to... for, for, for buying ads to say that the city's removing trees and handing out flyers door to door to say the city's removing trees. Do you have Generally a for this, we wouldn't have a budget for this, but if, you know, if this was a road replacement or a sidewalk replacement, we would work with transportation if council directs us to include it in, in the budget for that particular project. Right. Okay. Um, just uh, off the top of your head, I mean, do, you know, how many trees would we remove in a year for reasons like this? Is it in the tens, hundreds, thousands? Just ballpark. 
It has to be speaker. I, I, I can't ballpark. I'd ask him to ballpark if, if you can do that, Kim. We won't hold you to it. <laughs> Through the speaker, uh, a ballpark of uh, the typical number of trees that we would uh, remove, uh, similar to this instance per year, uh, would be uh, um, in the low hundreds. In the low hundreds. Do you have a budget to put ads in newspapers for all hundred, all of those hundreds of trees? As Janie's, uh, sorry, through the speaker, as Janie uh, previously said, no, we do not. That is not uh, a practice of urban forestry uh, related okay. to tree removals. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, questions? Thanks, speaker. Um, the, the Campbell Soup factory to the north, that's just going through its site plan process. I think my question is for transportation. I would um, say, Ms. Hayward, um, I think that has a road widening in it, but, but could you explain what we mean by road widening? We're not actually widening the pavement surface. Um, and that's right next to this site. Um, just for clarity, I know some people have been communicating about this, and I, I hopefully that's helpful. Councillor, I apologize. I'm not familiar with the particulars of that development site because development okay. review is not in my team's role, but I think you may be referring to a right of way widening, right. um, which would be for the, the city right of way beyond what is existing uh, city property that's designated as um, as roadway, which encompasses both boulevard, sidewalk and road. Yeah, you, you mentioned it in to, to Councillor Grimes's questions. There, there's there's an idea out there that the road is being widened along this street in conjunction with that development, but that's not that's not correct. You don't have plans to make this a four lane road or a three lane road. No, Councillor, this is a, a road a state of good repair project, and because it is a collector, and we've had a, a request for a a sidewalk at this location, we're just looking to complete the sidewalk yeah. network. So, state of good repair, you're not looking to reconstruct this road, are you? This work is bundled with other state of good repair work in the neighborhood. Right. I, I think because uh, a, a number of councillors, I think, were written to um, about this particular issue. And one of the asks uh, buried in there was uh, was an idea that the, that the road could be narrowed. And basically, that's a reconstruction, right? When you when you narrow a road, you got to move the curbs in and all that kind of stuff. We we did look at the, the impacts of narrowing the road. Um, it would be involve um, shifting the center line, and it would involve um, changing the location of curbs um, and the and the crossfall of the road and drainage. Um, as as was mentioned in the earlier questions, that would also still involve impact on those trees. Understood. If I brought you a petition with a thousand signatures and said, "Could you reconstruct a road in my ward?" You know, whatever one trees or no trees on it, what would you do? Uh, the state good repair program is 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 governed by this, the condition of the roadway, and so road reconstruction right. is planned when it's needed, um, yeah. not based on petitions. Council. Okay. Yeah, we need to ask questions on Speaker. the item we have before us. It, it is uh, because I think part of the the push was to reconstruct this road with respect to these trees. And the the last point I would just make through a question, if I may ask, is that. Um, if the road was reconstructed, as was suggested, or narrowed, um, that would have a material impact on the budget uh, for road rehabilitation in the Etobicoke York District and probably affect all the wards. Has anyone suggested a road that they would bump down the list or not reconstruct and do this one as part of the process? No, there hasn't been a, another road suggested to remove from the program. Um, as I said, we did look at the uh, the option of narrowing the road, and and it still had impacts that were undesirable to the trees. And so, for that reason, we're not pursuing that recommendation. Understood. Thank you very much. That's all my questions. Okay. Thank you. Now, questions. If you uh, have any questions, I mean, sorry, speakers, you can put your name on the list. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and to Councilor Perks, I've changed my motion. I'm, I guess the staff will put my motion on this at my time. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, delete my recommendation. Ask this, I decide to remove two tall trees. Uh, sorry, is that the one? Sorry. Uh, Madam Speaker, I sent a new uh, 
a new motion to uh, the clerk. Do they have that? You stopped my time, restarted. It's on the screen. Uh, one second. Yeah, so sorry, instead of help, City Council direct the General Manager of Transfer Service to halt the tree removal of 12 city owned trees on Dwight Avenue until such time city staff can study the feasible of narrowing Dwight Avenue and attempt to accommodate the proposed new sidewalk and save the existing trees and report back to December 2nd, 2021, meeting of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee on the findings. Now, I did ask all these questions to staff that they have looked at. So a lot of this work has been done, but I think it's very important that us uh, as the city, when we're removing trees, that uh, we get hired to a higher standard. I think we have to get the correct information out there. This petition's gone out. There's a lot of incorrect information flying in the neighborhood. The neighbors are all right. I've talked to uh, Councilman Kelly about taking this back through committee. I think the staff have done a lot of work on this, but I do want to get the correct information out to the community as to why these, 12, these nine trees are being removed. Our neighborhood loves trees. If you look here, this is the Long Branch Tree Fest that just happened on the weekend. Uh, they want to ensure, you know, ensure that we have a 40% tree canopy in their neighborhood. I know a lot of your neighborhoods, uh, the trees are important. And I just think there's just so much information out there about taking these nine trees out. And my motion said, you know, I want to plant uh, 17, but I want to hold, hold the city to 3 to 1 ratio. Uh, I wanted 80 millimeter, uh, 80 millimeter trees to come out. But I just think the report is almost would be done because I know staff looked at a lot of this. But I just think it's very important us as a city that we get this information in a report and get it out to the community. I talked to the school trustee. They're not in favor of killing the sidewalk. I'm not in favor of killing the sidewalk, but I just think it's very important us, us as a city, get this information back in a report and uh, bring this back in, in December and uh, get the right information. So those are my comments and I hope you'll support my deferral and we'll bring this back and uh, get the correct information out to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Perks, did you have your name on the list? I took it back off after I saw the deferral motion. Okay, so on the um, on uh, the motion by Councillor Grimes. Recorded vote, please. Recorded vote. Councillor Carroll, will you enter your vote, please? Uh, yes, sorry, I accidentally turned off my CMP. I vote in the affirmative. Right. Thank you. Speaker, the motion carries. The vote is 20 to 1. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next item is T. Madam Speaker, can I do a quick release? Which which one? Um, CC 36.13. Okay. So you'd like to release it? Um, well, oh. there's some recommendations which I believe have been circulated. What's the title, please? It is uh, Bogart Avenue. It's a settlement report proposal, Bogart Avenue. Okay, it's on the screen. All in favor, show of hands, carried. 
Item is amended. All in favor, carry. Thank you. Councilor Wong Tam. Toronto and East York. Yes, thank you. 27.4 and 27.9, which you held down earlier this morning. Are you ready to release it? Uh, yes, Madam Speaker, and I don't have questions, just wanted to speak to it. Okay, we're on T27.4. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to move the, the supplementary report that was put forward by City Planning uh, to thank them for um, for all the work in reviewing this application. It is certainly not a, a straightforward one. And I do recognize that there were a number of uh, community opinions that emerge out of those discussions, including how do you incorporate um, new intensification uh, into a heritage, uh, uh, an area that has significant heritage assets that are abutting heritage properties. Um, and I wanna just thank city staff, uh, as well as the preservation board for their very careful uh, review of the application. Um, there is also, uh, Madam Speaker, I wanted to bring to your attention, not only are we receiving some new housing in the uh, in the building, but there's an opportunity for adaptive reuse of the existing heritage assets, including the um, the unlocking of a publicly owned, uh, sorry, a privately owned publicly accessible uh, space, which I think will be a welcome addition to the to the area. The other thing, Madam Speaker, that uh, I wanted to highlight is that originally we started with um, a, a modest number of affordable housing units, uh, only four, but after negotiation with the developer, and I want to thank them for their uh, their ability to, to work with us as well as the Housing Secretary, we've now expanded the on-site dedication to seven units, including affordable, sorry, including um, uh, sort of family-sized two and three bedroom units. Um, we did this without obviously the, the rapid housing initiative, but it, it was painstaking in, in, in order to pull it together. And Madam Speaker, one of the reasons why this report is coming so late is because it actually took that much time for the staff to get to the final detail. If we can find a way to do these type of Section 37 agreements faster, more consistently, I think, number one, the developers would welcome it. The community would also know in advance uh, of uh, of a final report and a supplementary report being being tabled at 7 p.m. on a uh, on a Monday night. Everyone would just have more idea of what's coming. So, Madam Speaker, I am supportive of this application as as it's revised with the height coming down, the density coming down, and better superior public realm, and of course the addition of affordable housing. My only request, and I hope that we can do it uh, in a way that is consistent. Uh, without having um, the the championship of the local councillor, I would just like to see it as part of deal standard, as part of how we should be considering and reframing um, new density as it comes in. Uh, it is in some ways our own version of inclusionary zoning. It shouldn't have been so difficult, but uh, but we made it happen. Uh, so thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to highlight that and also to thank the planning staff and the heritage uh, staff who were involved with this uh, this uh, this proposal, and of course to the St. Lawrence Neighborhood Association. Once again, they demonstrate that you can have a blend of the old and new, and you can also have affordable housing in excellent public realm. So thank you to them and to the to the to the applicant. Thank you. So on the uh, on the motion, on favor. Show of hands carried. Yeah, and what about T27-9? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to just move the, the additional stuff, supplementary reports from staff. Okay. Okay, we'll display it. Okay, it's on the screen. All in favor, show of hands, carry. All 
Our next item is MM365, Protecting Healthcare Workers. Councillor Ford, you held the item down. Do you have questions? Uh, I do have questions um, to, to staff, Madam Speaker. I believe the uh, Trump Police Service is in attendance for this item. Do we, do we have them? So do you have questions, Councillor Ford? I do. Um, I, I, I can go ahead if, if they're available. Um, okay. My understanding can that I just are... ask if they're here? I don't see anybody. Yeah. If, if you can please identify yourself. It was my understanding that uh, Deputy Chief Myron Dempsey was making himself available because the Chief couldn't. I don't. Is the Deputy Chief here? Councillor Ford, I don't believe that he's here. Um. Okay. I, I know it's I know it's late in the day on on the second day of council. Um, I, I, my, 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 my questions are for Toronto police as the motion is directed at them. Um, um, so, uh, if you'd like to move forward with the item, that that's okay with me. Um, or if you want to hold it down and do a couple other items, uh, I'll, I'll take your direction, Madam Speaker. Okay. So let's just hold it down to see if, uh, the deputy chief, uh, comes in the next few minutes. Okay, our Speaker, next Speaker, I have questions of other city staff and I'm prepared to go forward with those to give the deputy chief time. Okay, Councillor. Uh, Councillor, well, we have Councillor Fletcher first. Councillor Fletcher, do you have questions to staff? My, I, my camera is off a lot of the time to save the battery, so if uh, speaker, yeah, but I do also have a question if the deputy's coming. Okay, um, so we'll I think hold. I'd rather wait just yeah. to see what their response currently is and um, what steps businesses should be taking. Okay, so we'll hold it down then. Councillor Perks? Yes, I, I have questions of the city solicitor on this item. Okay. Thank you. So this item's in reference to uh, recent protests. Uh, do the police have any uh, pieces of legislation or tools under which they could have uh, protected members of the public and healthcare workers at those sites? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, yes, they do. Uh, everything, of course, depends on context, and um, the police would always be keeping the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in mind. However, uh, if protests cross a line so that there is hate speech, violence, threats, things of that nature, there are, there are offences that um, the police would, could enforce. And also, the police do have authority under the Trespass to Property Act, so if there were to be a, um, an, a trespass notice from a hospital, they could enforce that. So hate speech, threats, violence, and if there was a trespass notice, uh, and I believe that can be given verbally at the time, you can walk out and say you're trespassing, please leave, right? We tend to do them in writing when we need to do them, but uh, it, perhaps, yes. But if a, if a stranger came on my, my property and I said, yes. you're trespassing, please leave or I'll phone the police, that would be adequate, right? I would think so, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank I do have a question for city staff, Speaker. Would you rather if I ask that and then ask the other one after? It's Councillor Fletcher. How do you want to play this? Well, I don't know. I'm waiting for the deputy to come. So maybe you should wait until the deputy gets here and you can ask questions to the deputy and city staff together. Oh, hold on. I believe the deputy is on now. Good evening. Yes, uh, Myron Demke here. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go back then to Councillor Ford. Questions to the deputy? 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, good evening, Deputy. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, particularly, um, as we've seen in, in the media and in uh, some parts of our city, a lot of demonstrations outside uh, hospitals in a number of places, uh, but particularly most concerning hospitals. Um, and there's always, uh, you know, trial police have, have been uh, in attendance for those to keep, you know, public order. Um, I think maybe just to drive off my first question is just going off Councillor Perks's questions or uh, line of questions. Um, do, do you think um, it's important or from your opinion that Toronto police um, uh, be in attendance at these uh, protests that we've seen? Uh, thank you for that uh, question, Councillor. Um, particularly when it uh, relates to the hospitals, I take it you're asking, and I'll answer in that context for sure. Uh, so th I think the hospitals, particularly downtown, but hospitals in general are, are an essential service for us, uh, particularly during a pandemic, but at all times. And in fact, the hospital role is a critical uh, area of our city uh, that we're very conscious of maintaining public safety uh, in that area. Um, when it comes to the protests uh, and the potential that protests would disrupt access to health care, disrupt patient care, or um, uh, hospital staff's ability to uh, perform their critical function, um, uh, we have to ensure that uh, that isn't compromised and that the protests don't compromise that. And to that end, our presence is absolutely essential uh, when there are protests in the uh, in the downtown core related to the hospitals. And uh, to that point, uh, Deputy DemQ, um, how is Toronto Police balancing, um, uh, you know, uh, people going to and from the hospitals, whether it's uh, people, visitors, uh, staff, and maintaining public order with the multitude of uh, things you have to do uh, on site at one time? Well, I think there's, um... There's a couple aspects to your question, Councillor, and I'll try to unpack them as best as I can. Um, as it relates to the operational response to any given protest in and around the hospitals, I think first and foremost, it's important for everybody to know that we are very engaged with hospital staff, have been throughout the pandemic for a number of reasons, including uh, preparing for protests. Uh, we are in touch with their most senior leadership on a regular basis. We're in touch with their security. Uh, their own staff uh, operationally at the local divisional level on a regular basis. We also, of course, pay attention to uh, declarations of intentions to protest. And when we become aware of that, we, of course, engage in immediate communication with the impacted hospitals or the impacted area around the hospital. Uh, because, of course, you know, as much as hospitals are contained uh, significantly in the downtown core, there are hospitals throughout our city. Uh, so we are always prepared to engage with whatever division uh, a hospital is in. In the context of the downtown uh, hospital role, uh, our members are very proactive in that area, as I said, engaging with them. And then on the days of protest, we, of course, make sure that uh, access to the facilities is not compromised. We respect people's right to express themselves and to protest, uh, but it's done in a way that is peaceful and respectful of uh, other considerations. And in the case of the hospitals, we do not, um, we, we make sure that the services and access to the services is not compromised by the protests. So I, I don't know if that unpacked it sufficiently, Councillor. Yeah, uh, that was okay. And then my last, um, I guess my last question is how does the services existing priority response system um, deal with issues that may arise at local businesses, um, such as a, an anti-vaccination protest? So I, I, you know, those are, uh, we deploy our resources in the most efficient and effective manner we can. We have to be responsive to public safety needs on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour, frankly, minute to minute basis across the city. And as it relates to businesses, individual businesses, um, we will respond when there's a threat to public safety uh, in any context, including as it relates to issues around, um, you know, the vaccination or proof of vaccination. If those engagements escalate to uh, a point where there's a concern regarding public safety or community safety, then of course we would respond accordingly. 
Um, so our ability to respond organizationally as a priority response element is something we do day in and day out, hour to hour, minute by minute, frankly, uh, on all uh, spectrum of safety concerns. This is another potential element of safety concern is when those encounters in our communities that can be uh, challenging escalate to a point where there's a concern for public safety, then we would be a resource. Um, we, we, we reply in priority as we would to other public safety concerns. Thank you very much, Deputy. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Um, I have a question for uh, the city staff and then our deputy. And the first one is, what if there is a anti-vax protest called for a park? Of course, there's no permit. What steps would you take? And I guess that's for uh, Ms. Romoff or the deputy city manager or the city manager who I'm looking at with this picture. Uh, through, so I'm here uh, through the through speaker. Oh, you're there. To, uh, I yeah, can't I am. See you. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm just putting my video on. Uh, so you're correct, uh, through the speaker to Councillor Fletcher, uh, there are no permits that are issued for protests in, in parks or squares. Uh, and uh, I, I think there's a lot of work. I mean, the deputy uh, chief can probably respond as well that a lot of work that's done uh, on social media and the rest, trying to identify where some of these events take place. And then, uh, you know, the, 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 the Toronto police are really the lead in, in dealing with any of the activity that would, that would take place. So if it's in a park, since there's nothing there and you're advised with that, then do you get in touch directly with Toronto police? Uh, it could be either way. Quite often, Toronto Police have the same information that we do, uh, and it's it's not generally a surprise when when these events are are known. And I mean, the deputy chief can speak to it more specifically, but Toronto Police generally plans, uh, you know, for the events that are known. Um, yes, I guess I'm just asking if that's recorded and tracked. That you have made your you've officially said there is no permit. I, I'm not sure if it's officially uh, through the speaker recorded and tracked. I, I know our policy is that we do not issue permits for protests of any sort in any of so, our yeah. city facilities. Should you find out there's a protest in a park and you know there's not going to be a permit, would you advise, who would you advise in the police? I, I couldn't tell you specifically, uh, Councillor, it's quite often done at the field level when these things are, are discovered and, and uh, a lot of those conversations are just, uh, you know, the ongoing sort of discussions that happen in various parts of the city when these activities takes place. So now I will just go to the deputy who I can't see on there, but I know he's there somewhere. Um, and just, you've heard that question, deputy, that if there is a known protest. There are no permits for parks. And if there is anti-vaxxers are saying they're going to come to disrupt a business district or go into a park where there's a business district, what steps would we expect that Toronto police would take around that, please? Thank you, Councillor. And uh, I'll got my hand up if you can see me on the screen there. I can't, I can't uh, see all right. you, I'm sorry. Okay, um, I, will, uh, I would offer this as a reply. Um, one of the uh, uh, tenants uh, that we have uh, really worked hard to adhere to is to uh, consider things around people's uh, lawful um, right to express themselves and finding a balance between uh, their constitutional right of expression and our duty to maintain the peace and public safety. Uh, so we would certainly, we certainly are in touch with city staff when appropriate. Um, and support city staff in anything to do with what would be a city um, uh, area of consideration. Uh, but what we also do is prepare and uh, respond in accordance with what we believe may be uh, the threat, if there is any, or the safety concerns that may exist, particularly when protests go mobile or you know get into traffic or impede traffic, uh, that we wanna make sure that we do what we can to maintain the safety of all uh, during those protests. So a typical response would be a local divisional uh, engagement with our community response unit officers, particularly downtown who are extremely well trained in issues surrounding protests and managing uh, crowds and crowd dynamics. 
um, and we would do uh, an assessment if, if time permitted on what information is available uh, and whether we need to change our posture beyond what's available to us resource wise. Uh, we would plan accordingly based on the information and intelligence we had uh, with a view to making sure that things were as peaceful as possible, that there was no uh, violations of uh, criminal statutes and the like. But if there's no permit, then that's already a violation, isn't it? Well, that'd be something we would talk to city staff about and how the city staff would want to see that managed. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is a balance to strike um, with respect to people's charter right of expression. And, and we certainly have seen from time to time in the past months where uh, people's desire to express themselves um, took place. And we do what we can to make sure, ensure public safety uh, during those times. Thank you. Right, I did get the... Am I done? Oh, that yes, was your last Thank question. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, Deputy Chief. Earlier in your in, in your response to Councillor Ford, you said you have to, you're, you're looking to keep things peaceful and respectful. Um, the, the reports that I'm hearing, and, and, and I have a protest in, in Ward 11 every, every week on Saturday, goes in different directions, as I'm sure you know, but um, goes in different directions. The reports that we're getting is that it it passed, it it, it passed to harassment months ago, uh, and we have individuals shouting obscenities at children, um, standing beside businesses trying to force people off their uh, off their patios because they've been outspoken about vaccine mandates. Um, at what point, like, where is that line of respectful in your mind, I, or legally? Where we actually can intervene and uh, and and do something about the uh, uh, about the behavior of some of these protesters. Uh, well, let let me uh, uh, thank you for that, and let me say this. Um, uh, and if I if I use the term respectful, uh, I would prefer to focus on peaceful, because clearly our officers have been subjected to very disrespectful uh, behavior as of members of the public. Um, yet they show great restraint and maintain the peace um, and ensure public safety, which is our focus. Um, I would not condone or otherwise call uh, what you described, Mr. Layton, um, as, as something that uh, um, is respectful, um, the way you described it. What I would say is that our, our primary function is to maintain public safety and keep the peace. The expressions that take place during those moments are at times uh, difficult. Um, but our, our function is to ensure that hospital operations continue, that they're not impeded, and that the peace is maintained. And the reporting I have is that that has taken place, in fact, successfully. So, so can you give us an idea? And I asked for this statistic some time ago, and I haven't gotten an updated one, but how many charges have been laid for organizing these protests, uh, public health wise or otherwise, um, how many charges have been laid and and how is it that the same individuals that are charged end up back at these protests week after week after week? Like I, I know some have been charged and yet they, they, they continue to do the same behavior. What is it? What's wrong here? Well, I'm not going to uh, reflect on what's motivating people to behave repeatedly a certain way. Fair what, I will, uh, what I will say is that when we do have a lawful authority and it's appropriate to exercise that authority, we do so. Um, the, the fact is, is some of the charges evolved over time due to emergency measures. They may not all be the same in effect now. I'd have to get a list of the charges you are perhaps referencing uh, to better or more succinctly answer your question. Uh, but when there is um, concerns around public safety and concerns around the safety of the community uh, and or access to essential services, then our officers ex exercise the authorities available to them and take the appropriate steps given the circumstances they're facing. And do you have any, any data about how many um, organizers of these protests have been uh, have had charges laid against them over the last sort of year that they've escalated? I, I don't have that in front of me. That okay. may be something. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Cole, question.
Councillor Cole. Councillor Cole, turn off your video. Mike. Okay. Councillor Cole, can you hear me? Yes. Councillor Cole, turn your camera back on and unmute unmute your mic. Okay. Councillor Wong Tam, questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And uh, Councillor Cole, I could hear you. I'm not sure if anybody else could, just so you know. Um, through you, Madam Speaker, uh, and thank you very much, Officer, for joining us tonight. It's, uh, it's really great to have you here. I'm just curious to know, um, following up on actually Councillor Layton's uh, point of view, uh, especially his observations about the weekly protests, he and I actually share a boundary, uh, literally just right down the street off of Young. And, um, and so I'm just... Uh, trying to understand, because I've had numerous conversations with uh, the, the local leadership of 51 Division, who is exceptional to work with, um, but I, I'm, I'm perplexed on how the, the weekly protests can come in every Saturday, and what they've essentially do, done is terrorize the downtown neighborhood, including walking into shops, threatening uh, workers and, and, and shopkeepers, um, threatening customers, uh, yelling at them to remove their mask, and, and sometimes, you know, leading to, to physical altercation. Um, I'm just curious to know because what what I what the observations are from from community members is that they see the police standing by and, and sort of escorting them down the street, but not intervening, even when they see the line being drawn. So, can you explain to us when a police officer may determine it, it be their job to step in? to stop a physical altercation? Uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, frankly, uh, your question to me is, is a little bit difficult because it's dealing with a, an abstract without a specific, uh, you know, set of facts to review. Um, you know, the expectation I would have of police officers in Toronto is that uh, when a physical alter altercation is imminent, uh, that steps would be taken to preserve the peace. That is their function. Um, that is their purpose uh, in those times. So the expectation I'd have is that physical altercations uh, would be something that our police officers would be intervening and, um, and taking action on. So when an officer sees a physical altercation or at least escalating words and perhaps body language that 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 pretty much uh, dictates that the next move is somebody striking somebody or, or shoving someone or touching somebody. Is that when they intervene or do they do they intervene beforehand? Because I, we've heard a number of concerns, especially, you know, especially in the big shoppers drug marts, to be quite honest. Um, that, that that has been happening right inside the stores is that there's a group of individuals that will come in or, or one or two very loud and belligerent individuals come in and, and everything is disrupted. Um, can, can you, and, and it's also predictable because they're going into the same shops over and over again to the point that uh, even shop owners are having a hard time staffing because they're nervous about their employees or customers getting assaulted. Right. Right. Um, I, I, again, I, I think your example, um, just the way you were describing it, I think speaks to the difficulty of answering the question, which is, um, you know, assaulted behavior versus body language versus words. Uh, our officers are trained in how to manage these situations. They're trained in de-escalation. They're trained in dealing with things that are escalating. And I'd expect their response to be appropriate to the individual circumstances they're facing. Um, so when it is assaultive behavior, then I'd expect that there's something our officers are doing for sure to deal with assaultive behavior. Um, uh, you know, other than other than uh, the language used by people, as was referenced earlier, and how people communicate, um, you know, our officers have to exercise a great amount of restraint and composure. 
to make sure that they are abiding by uh, their legal obligations to maintain the peace uh, while striking a balance of ensuring people uh, in the case of protest have a, uh, the right to uh, express themselves um, uh, exercised. So I think the difficulty I have with, with being more specific uh, counselor is, uh, is assaultive behavior to me means assaultive behavior. And when there's assaultive behavior, I expect the police officers in Toronto would engage. Thank you. Uh, my final question is actually for yourself or even the city solicitor. Around um, uh, abortion clinics, there's oftentimes the safety zone that's established, so therefore you can't obstruct someone from walking into getting a me medical procedure or, or, um, uh, or, or medical service. Um, it, it is, is what is proposed right now, the, the motion that's on the floor, uh, how likely is it that, that you will come back uh, with uh, with some tools for us to to implement that will create these new safety zones uh, around the areas around, especially around healthcare uh, institutions. Last question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, we'll certainly have a look at at this if asked. I I do um, want to be clear at the outset, though, that this is the kind of thing that a provincial government has um, much better tools to implement than a municipal council does, and and in fact. Um, the, the zones that you're speaking of were put in place by the provincial government, as was the zone in Quebec around um, health care and educational institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Councillor Cole. Madam Speaker, Councillor Grimes, I can hear him very well. I think of the problems on your end, Madam Speaker. Yes, I, I can't hear a thing. You can all hear him. I think it might, the problem might be on your end. Who else can hear him? Yeah. Okay, well. Mike, just go ahead. We can't hear him on the live stream. Okay, well, I'm going to have to continue because, you know, yeah, there's not much I can do. Hmm? Yeah, we're going to um, look into the problem and hopefully we'll get back. Okay. Councillor Holiday, question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Maybe we can get Councillor Cole over the phone. We, we all can hear that he's quite eager to ask some questions from where we sit. Um, anyways, my, my question is for Deputy Demke. Um, the motion before us uh, in its written form here just says, uh, number one, says something about a rapid response protocol for addressing harassment and intimidation of frontline healthcare workers, small business owners, and on and on. My question is, does the words harassment and intimidation in this context, so protesters um, out demonstrating, do they does the, do those words have a specific meaning in law? And this just goes on uh, some of the discussion that we've had about um, police stepping in when it escalates to uh, a point of violence or assault. But do those words have a specific meaning? Um, especially for a call taker on 911 maybe that's trying to assess the situation. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so I'll, uh, yes, they can have a specific meaning in law. Um, I would defer of course to city legal um, for you know, more, but uh, for sure they can. Uh, harassment is, you know, found within the criminal code. Intimidation is found within the criminal code, uh, and I'm, I'm sure in other statutes. So, I think, uh, I think that's something I would defer for uh, legal counsel to, um, you know, delve into in more detail. But yes, they can have a meaning, a legal meaning. Had my mute there before we we go to legal. Um, could you just maybe give the comment, is there a protocol to deal with a telephone call where somebody says I'm being harassed? Like, like any call, uh, our dispatchers are trained to um, 
uh, ask questions of the caller to get to the facts and better understand what the call is about. Um, uh, as has happened even today, um, you know, the language used to describe a set of events can be different um, from individual to individual. Uh, so our call takers are trained to delve into the details with the caller to better understand what the call is about. Uh, so um, in, in all circumstances, this would also apply in these types that you're asking about. Okay, and then you would have a process to deal with those to, to connect that with the local response, right? You got the 911 center unpacking the issue verbally and then it, it, there's a process to go through. Downstream. Right, so they, so they effectively identify the nature of the call and then put it in a priority uh, and we have a prioritization process um, for, for the purpose of just, you know, ease of understanding what I mean by that. Obviously somebody who's been uh, shot and is bleeding is a very uh, clearly understood high priority. Um, something around um, uh, uh, lost property would be of a far lesser priority. So they, they, they certainly would take whatever information on any given call is provided and put it into that kind of framework. And then we would be dispatched accordingly. Okay, thank you. Uh, and maybe I'll follow up with city legal about those two words. So the, the installation or the, the, the position of those words in the motion are very, very, uh, very, very distinct, right? They, they, they identify two things um, in, the, in the context of a protest. Do you have any um, advice to counsel about how we might understand what those mean? Because I know, you know, harassment is a, is a, a fairly broad thing, right? You know, that, there's so many situations, but in this case, is that something that is um, workable or usable in this particular motion? You know, I would say um, that as a starting point, uh, they're, they're fine, those words. I, what, what I want to say, though, is in, in context, uh, the police, generally speaking, would allow a peaceful protest to continue. People have a right to peacefully protest. If the conduct of the protesters crossed a line, though, and elements of an offense were present, then the police as enforcement officers, seeing those elements could take steps to press charges. Um, and, and as you've heard, both harassment and intimidation uh, are under the criminal code offenses. So you would have to look to the, you know, the wording and determine whether the elements were there. Okay, but would it also be fair yeah, to thank say Thank you, that... Councillor Holliday, your time's up. Okay. Councillor right. Matlow. Thank you, Deputy. Um, uh, you're right. So, so rather than speak in the abstract, I want to give you a a particular uh, incident uh, that that I don't understand uh, why more action was taken, and I wonder what the police's protocol is in this circumstance. So, in August, um, restaurant owner Jen Ag um, reported that her restaurant, Rum Corner on Dundas at Grace had been repeatedly for weeks visited by protesters who harassed her and her customers. And this would go on for hours and hours and hours. These protesters were beating uh, drums and pans. They called her a Nazi. They called her a bigot. They called her all sorts of other just disgusting and, and you know, pejorative terms. And this is somebody who, like every restaurateur, was just trying to, you know, just struggle to survive given what everyone's been through the last couple of years. She complained uh, not only that the city uh, was, uh, in, in her view, at, initially was obtuse to, to, to what was going on, but she also complained that police were present but stood by and did nothing. So, you know, given that there were just so many repeated and such obvious incidents of harassment of both the, the the clientele and the restaurant owner what is the protocol for the police uh uh in those circumstances and 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 if you can just why why wouldn't why wouldn't that be why wouldn't that be the threshold thank you for that sir um 
sorry, I think. Uh, if, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Deputy, I'm having trouble like, hearing like you. I, I'd like to remind members of council, please ask questions on the members motion that we have before us, protecting healthcare workers. That please, because we're getting, about, just, talk, just ask questions on the motion you have before you. Thank you, Mike. I'm, I'm, speak, I'm asking a question very, very specifically on the motion. Okay. What you have before you, the health care workers. No, Madam Speaker, if, if you read the motion, it does yeah. include. Yeah. With all due respect, I have a question on the floor and I'd appreciate an answer if uh, the deputy is willing to. Uh, sorry, yes, um, uh, absolutely, I'll answer. Um, again, uh, without being on the ground, these are individual circumstances that the officers face. The expectation would be they would conduct an investigation given the totality of the information before them. Um, the issue of harassment, uh, criminal harassment charges, um, uh, you know, there are elements of that of offense that have to be available for investigators to form reasonable and probable grounds to effect an arrest. And if those elements are not there, they're not there. Uh, I'd expect it to be an investigation uh, by the local police uh, to determine if the elements of the offense are met uh, for an individual and if there are appropriate uh, opportunities to lay charges that the charges would be laid when appropriate. Um, the fact of people um, protesting out front of various uh, parts of the city, um, you know, the, again, it's, it's striking that balance of of people have a right to express themselves as they do in in uh, the square in front of City Hall on a regular basis. Um, and, and they do from time to time move around while they express themselves. And our job is to keep the peace uh, and to ensure public and community safety. And when it comes to the issues around harassment or criminal harassment, uh, there are elements of the offense that have to be met. Um, what you're describing, though, isn't isn't what I what I put before you. Uh, we understand if it's roaming, that might be a different context. Uh, uh, I understand. I, I I support people's ability to, uh, uh, you know, express their charter rights and express their opinions. I'm speaking about a very very specific uh, uh, incident where you know for weeks and weeks and weeks this restaurateur and her clients were inarguably, I mean, this video of it, uh, everyone's seen it, uh, were, were harassed and, and quite quite awfully. Uh, and uh, I don't understand just the threshold, the protocol for when, uh, when, when the police believe it's reasonable to intervene. And I just wonder if you can explain sort of what, why didn't that meet the test and, and what is the test? Well, I, I think one of the elements, uh, one of the offenses to consider is whether they, an individual, meets uh, uh, um, the criteria for grounds, for the officers to form the grounds to believe an offense took place regarding criminal harassment, for example. Um, and if those uh, grounds do not exist, if the individual circumstances of the event do not warrant that, uh, then there's, there's not a ton of available opportunities for the police to do something other than to do their lawfully obligated right, uh, lawfully obligated duty to keep the peace. So if somebody goes into a, to a, like goes to a restaurant and starts banging pans and calling people Nazis and, and like, that, that wouldn't be considered, uh, that, that wouldn't meet the test of, of intervention? That was your last question. Well, uh, uh, again, uh, there's, there's other available uh, legal perhaps mechanisms available depending on the circumstances. But you know, this is, uh, individual case by case based. And the expectation would be that on an individual case by case, the officers would conduct an appropriate assessment of the circumstances and respond appropriately. Uh, what, whatever the legal statutory framework that's available to them. Uh, and you know, we're talking about criminal harassment, there could be trespass to property, um, act uh, uh, statutory, uh, you know, things to consider. But those are all determined on a case by case basis on individual circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, 
through you um, to, I, I guess, um, Deputy Deputy Chief um, Demke, um, the the right to assemble is is obviously a sacred right, but the the charter uh, describes it as peaceful protest. W would you agree that that a protest can can continue as long as it's peaceful? Yes. So uh, I'm going to give you a scenario. Uh, back in May, there were a series of uh, uh, anti-Israel protests. Uh, they took over um, Dundas Square. Or a few days before, they took over uh, Nathan Phillips Square. I've been shown a number of videos where, where uh, there was the uh, call for the wiping out of the state of Israel with the genocide, uh, the killing of Jews. And then I was sent a series of videos in which um, a small group of Jewish people were uh, were attacked, um, and and I must say, regrettably, the complaints that I got that police were nearby, and didn't really know what to do, and that's sort of the trend in this whole discussion here is that when these things get out of control and 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 they can't be contained, and they're no longer peaceful protests, there seems to be a paralysis or a reluctance for officers to to get involved now i understand de-escalation but do you think uh, there has to be a whole reassessment of of how we handle um how we secure peaceful protests but how we handle a protest that 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 turn into violent mobs councillor thank you for that question uh, each and every time we have a significant event like that in the city, the Toronto Police do review the circumstances of their response, uh, our engagement with our partners in our communities, um, and we seek opportunities to make sure that we're uh, adjusting our ability to respond to events no. uh, as as they unfold. So yeah. sorry, I heard somebody somebody chiming in there, Councillor. Well, I just, um, I just so, uh, sorry. Uh, we need to stick to what we have before us. Please, we're gonna be here all night. Like, let's stick to the motion. Councillor Pastor. Uh, let's let the, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Let's let the officer finish and then I'll move on to other. Okay, sorry, uh, Deputy, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so we do, we do assess our response uh, to major events um both before and after the fact and uh and we assess uh you know how we responded what lessons are learned what operational lessons are learned um and the like so in the circumstances you're describing that certainly would be the case so the assessment okay. happens after major events sir is is the right point, so it, it in in this day and age i mean i we sent everything to police all the videos the pictures and and, and it was just a trove of evidence with people's images. Point of, point of order, Madam Speaker. To, okay. to my good friend, Councillor Costa. We're yeah, getting off topic. Councillor Grimes, point of order. I, I have been <clears throat> saying it all night. Okay, but it, we're getting off topic, to my yeah, friend. Councillor Ford sitting in the backyard in the dark. He's getting scared. we got to get this meeting over with. Thank you. Please, on the motion that we have before us. All right, I think my questions are done. Thank you. Thank you. I'll come over, Councillor Ford, if you need me, okay? If you're getting a little worried out there in the dark, I'll come over to help you. Councillor Cole, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy. Uh, one of these days we'll get back to real meetings, but we've got these virtual meetings, it seems, forever. Uh, but uh, I, I, you're in a tough spot, uh, so I'm not uh, going to think you're going to be able to solve all these problems because you can see uh, in my motion, I'm asking not only uh, to sit down with uh, city legal and sit down with the city manager, but also to sit down with, uh, you know, your uh, officers to see if there can be a way of better handling these unprecedented uh, violent protests that have occurred uh, in our city over the last number of months. You think that would be helpful? 
Counselor, I welcome a meeting with you anytime on any number of topics. Uh, and in all seriousness, I think anytime we can engage uh, in, a, in progressive dialogue um, in how we respond, um, then we, I would certainly participate in that. Yes, and uh, as uh, you all know, this has been the most unusual of times. I, I certainly have never seen hospitals under siege, uh, pharmacies, uh, you know, our nurses have been told not to come to work in their scrubs or uniforms because they might be attacked. I, I mean, have you ever seen uh, our hospitals or healthcare workers threatened as they have been in the last number of months? I think what's important uh, that I uh, frame in my response to your question, Councillor, is of course, um, you know, threats of any of the kind of that nature uh, broadly against a segment of our community that is delivering an essential service is not something that um, is the norm in our society, thankfully. Uh, but I think uh, the other part I, I would want to make sure is clearly understood is our engagement with hospital staff, um, both from a security perspective and their management and their uh, senior leadership uh, has been maintained throughout. Uh, we've been responsive to their concerns and their expressions as it relates to maintaining their operations. Um, so I think uh, I think to answer your question, it has to be I'd have to offer the, the broader context of of how we've responded uh, in being responsive to the needs of the hospital, given the circumstances. You know, this is again, this is second hand, but I've been told that uh... Repeatedly, these anti-vaxxers have gone into Women's College Hospital and uh, interrupted the uh, vaccination clinics there. The uh, officials inside the vaccination clinic phone the police and there's no response from the police. I, I don't have that information before me, Councillor, so I, I really can't comment on that. Another doctor told me that uh, surgeries had to be delayed at some of our uh, the uh, Toronto Health Network there because of the protest. Have you dealt with surgeries being delayed? Specific to protests, I have not understood that to have happened. Uh, the information I have that is our engagement has been um, robust um, and that we have um, uh, dealt with the protesters in, in an effective way. But that, and then there's another case where a, a, an ER doctor had to come outside of his uh, emergency room to basically, with a sign saying, please let me save lives. Okay. I mean, but Councillor Cole, I don't, can, I, I don't believe be the deputy normal? chief can answer that question. What's that? No, um, you're asking questions that the deputy chief would not have an answer for and giving you incidents okay. that happen at the okay, hospital. So you're, yeah. But if you want to just talk about your motion, because it would be difficult for That's the deputy chief. That's my motion, chief. It is to protect the healthcare workers, no, doctors you, and nurses. No, but you're asking the deputy chief if he's aware of incidents that have happened at the hospital. I don't believe right. he would have that answer. Okay, thank you. I'll move on to another question then. The other question is I've had you know, part of my motion talks about, uh, you know, like Councillor Matlow talked about uh, and Councillor Wong Tam about retail workers in pharmacies being stopped from working. I've had young uh, staff members at the submarine shop uh, on Dufferin uh, crying because uh, they were under threat from an anti-vaxxer who came into the submarine shop, pulled out all the cables, wires, pushed the staff members, and they called 911. The police did not come. Okay, that was your last question. Deputy? So I, I, I think, uh, Councillor, I, I don't necessarily understand completely what you're asking other than uh, to make a comment that uh, our calls are prioritized. And if, if a police officer did not come, um, in the moment that this happened, um, you know, our calls are taken into our call center, prioritized, and officers are dispatched uh, in accordance uh, with, uh, with, 
you know, the priorities that exist at the time in the city. Uh, so um, the specifics of a call we didn't get to, uh, there's any number of explanations why we wouldn't get to a call. Um, you know, uh, some of them being that uh, other priority calls may have come in and put those in queue. Thank you. Without again, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to speakers. Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Madam Speaker. And I'll, and I'll keep my comments uh, uh, relatively short as we're getting late into the night here. Um, but look, I, I want to thank uh, Councillor Cole and Councillor Carroll for putting this motion forward. I think it's a very uh, constructive motion. I think, um, you know, what we have seen as a council and the demonstrations with these anti-vaccination protests are, are um, ugling uh, at best uh, to just to categorize that. But you know what, the, these situations that are coming up is, is incredibly difficult situations. And, and we're hearing that from uh, the deputy chief in, in how trial police have been trying to uh, adapt and, and keep public safety for everyone. Um, and, and, you know, while there, there are these one-off stories, and, and there are many in them, you know, we are a, a city of, um, you know, three, four million people. Um, the, these things sadly will happen. And it doesn't make it right. But um, as one member of the trial police services board, um, I know we can update every month on this, and the service uh, has been working uh, around the clock uh, to effectively um, and with tight resources um, respond to these uh, these uh, the mass protests that are happening uh, across our city, particularly um, in the downtown. And I feel for the downtown communities. Um, and uh and the downtown councillors that have to deal with this because it, it is not right um and, and i can only imagine how challenging uh, that is um but uh, needless to say you know i'll, I'll kind of wrap my comments there but you know thank the officers for and the work they have done um in very difficult situations i have seen dozens and dozens of dozens of videos of whether it's police officers getting assaulted uh, members of the public getting assaulted, uh, children witnessing this. Um, it, it's a it's a sad state of affair, but uh, I do have the utmost faith um, uh, in the trial police service and and working to address these issues, um, and uh, definitely support uh, the motion. Looking at safety zones, I was going to actually amend the motion. I didn't have time to to request the provincial government to look at this. Um, but uh, it's something that uh, conversations need to have, uh, be had, and uh, I definitely support um, having them. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Pete. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, I've been struggling with this. I've been struggling with this a lot, particularly part two of the motion, which asks to look at safety zones. One of the things I'm mindful of is that there has been over the last few years a very live conversation about uh, what kind of protests get policed in which way. Uh, you'll recall shortly before, uh, two years ago, uh, we were very concerned about uh, how protests support uh, in reaction to the death of George Floyd and Regis Korczynski Paquette in my ward were policed. More recently, there's been concerned about how uh, encampments were policed. I think we run into a, a risk when city council starts saying this kind of protest is one we want the police to police and that one isn't. It is very deliberate, very deliberate in law that we establish standards of behavior in the criminal code and say these, these kinds of behaviors are not allowed at any protest. And it doesn't become a matter of politicians saying this kind of protest, that kind of protest, this individual, that individual. When you move the police and the state too close together, you get the phrase police state. 
I want to remind you also of the most recent time there has been a safety zone in the city of Toronto. It was during the G7, G20. How did that work out? How did Torontonians feel about that? How did the subsequent legal cases, what did, what did they teach us? I'm all for, all for this council asking the question, are you applying the same standard in all instances and asking the police service uh, to review how they've behaved in a variety of circumstances. But saying we should grant the police an additional power, I can't do, I can't go there. The city solicitor made it very clear where there is hate speech, where there are threats, where there is violence, or where there is trespass and the property owner calls the police, the police already have the tools to protect our healthcare workers, our healthcare institutions, and the people trying to access them. If they weren't adequately policed, that was a choice, and we need to understand how that choice was made. That's fair. But creating a new set of powers opens us to a very, very dangerous world. During the questioning of the deputy chief, the speaker had to intervene several times because members of council were saying, well, what about this other protest that I didn't approve of? What about the protest of queers against Israeli apartheid? I didn't approve of that protest. Why wasn't it more vigorously policed? Despite the fact that Toronto City staff said that those protests were within freedom of expression laws. We go down a dangerous road. We're also at a point where we're considering pilots right now to reduce the number of areas that we hand off to the police. The police tell us we give them too many jobs. So let's not go continuously saying, hey, do more, more and more, and we'll give you more and more and more and more powers. The powers that were necessary to deal with these protests already exist. The city solicitor told you that. So I can vote for parts one and three. I cannot vote for the second part. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Yeah, it's sort of ironic. <laughs> Here we are, we're deploying uh, uh, bylaw officers, police officers to enforce our public health rules in playgrounds uh, when people were using swings, yet we're uh, not able to have protection for doctors and nurses or people, uh, PSWs, uh, who are trying to deliver uh, vaccines is that what we're saying that we can't do that yet we can do it in playgrounds so i think there's a kind of a double standard here that we're applying and you know at least you take public health seriously or you don't and i think uh, the work of our doctors and nurses uh, is uh, an essential service the police agree with that so for us to say well now we've got to look at the whole constitutionality of protests and the you know, Plato's interpretation of what a real protest is, you know, we've got a dangerous situation here where there has been, day after day, there's been systematic intimidation, harassment, uh, denial of people's right to even work uh, as a result of these very aggressive, very... Uh, uh, unusual forms of protesters that we've never seen the likes of before. And if we look the other way and not ask the police and our legal team to look at ways where maybe the city could do something more to protect our frontline workers, especially our medical workers, what are we doing here? You know, because the public is really uh, frustrated. They say, why is this all going on? Uh, in our city, and nobody seems to be doing anything about it. Then they blame the police. And as we know, it's not, as Councillor Ford said, the police have an incredibly tough job. Incredibly tough job. It's not their fault, but we've got to sit down and try to deal with this new reality we see on our streets. As Councillor Layton said, Councillor Wong Tai, every Saturday they're doing this, you know, in a way to intimidate, harass, stop people from going about their peaceful business. As Councillor Madlow said, 
about what that restaurant owner had to go through day after day and nobody helped her. Nobody helped her. Talk about losing the confidence of people. And as I, I said, the case that really got me going is the young black workers up at the submarine shop that were in tears saying, why didn't they come? Why didn't the police come and help us? Why didn't they help us when this guy was pushing us around and calling us names and all this? And we called the police three or four times. Nobody came. Then I had the case on Young Street where the proprietor of a local coffee shop who was a COVID-19 survivor. He was on a ventilator for three months. He comes back to the coffee shop and he gets attacked by these anti-vaxxer protests. They ran right into his shop. He called the police 911 repeatedly. Nobody came. So are we to sit on our hands and say, oh, well, uh, this is... Uh, you know, Plato's interpretation of uh, free freedom of speech and uh, protest. We don't want to, uh, I, I think the people of Toronto want us to be reasonable and we always have been reasonable working with the police, trying to find way of protecting our frontline, especially our healthcare workers who don't deserve to be uh, stopped from going to work because they're wearing nurses outfits where the doctors have to come outside of hospitals and ask for protection so they can operate. This is what it has come to as we sit idly by and watch this go on week after week after week. I think we need to be intelligent and rational and find a way of improving uh, public protection and the protection especially of our healthcare workers who don't deserve to be uh, attacked by these very, very aggressive individuals who are above and beyond what we've ever seen before. That we, in Toronto's history, we've never seen our healthcare workers, our hospitals under siege. When have we ever seen this? It's about time we did something. And I'm saying, let's try and find a way of exploring ways of helping resolve this very, very dangerous situation that, uh, again, threatens the health and public health of people in Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Matlow to speak. Madam Speaker, before you begin my time, uh, I just have a point of order, uh, just a request. Would you ask uh, the deputy uh, before he goes away, or if you could spend the next several minutes making sure that that he he knows that his presence would be appreciated, to come back for MM thirty six point two five. And then if you'd be so kind to start my time again, because it's still running. Yeah, he's yeah. left the meeting. So Councillor Matlow, do you want to speak on this item? So uh, would you would you endeavor to, to either have him back or, or, or a representative of the TPS on that item? Councillor Matlow, do you want to speak on this item? Yes, but I'm making a request. Uh, yes, I understand you're staff. making a request. And I'm telling you that the deputy chief has left. I, I, I hear you. I'm just, uh, if, uh, Madam Speaker, I'm just making a request that if, that if he's not available, yeah. if we could endeavor to have a representative of the TPS. Uh, I'll get back. Uh, to, I'll get back to you. Do you want to speak That's on this asking. item? Do you want to speak on this I item, would, please? I, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm just trying to finish this sentence. A basic request. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, I would like to speak to, on okay, this go, item. Go um, ahead. So, go ahead. Thank you. So I want to begin by uh, thanking Councillor Cole for moving this forward. What he is moving, uh, I believe, reflects what the vast major majority of Torontonians um, have been thinking uh, for quite some time. Um, and I also think it's a very well-written motion. Um, if, if, if members you know, read it, uh, you'll see that Councillor Cole, I, th I think, was very thoughtful in how he approached this. Um, He's asking for a rapid response protocol for addressing harassment and intimidation of frontline healthcare workers, small business owners, and frontline retail employees. That's, that's why I was speaking to what Gen Ag's experience was. And what Councillor Cole is asking for is simply a real clarification and a real plan to address what is the threshold for intervention, how best to intervene, to make sure that retailers and healthcare workers alike, frontline workers, don't have to put up with this harassment. 
Councillor Cole is not saying that he doesn't believe in freedom of speech. He's not suggesting that there shouldn't be protests when peaceful protests uh, uh, come about. But he is asking us to support his request to protect those who should not be targeted with harassment. And I think that is a very reasonable request. He's also made it very clear that he's, when he's describing safe zones around healthcare facilities, that it's about of, uh, protecting these facilities from any delays from what he writes, regular and critical functioning of these facilities. There should not be uh, operations delayed. There should not be any uh, impediment for a nurse or a doctor or anybody working in a hospital from getting to work and doing their job to save lives. That is just the most reasonable request that anyone could make. And, you know, just, just a little while ago, we were, we were beating pots and pans, um, celebrating our frontline workers and our healthcare workers. And, um, you know, one way to really uh, stand by our commitment and our support for them, uh, along with celebrating them and beating pans and all these things that, that symbolically tell them that we've got their backs, is to request that if they are being targeted with harassment, that we still have their backs and that we won't allow that to happen. Um, but we need to understand what that what is that threshold? Because what, what Torontonians have experienced is that every weekend um, these protests happen. And again, it's not the protest, it's the behavior in the protest, the harassment, uh, the abuse of behavior towards individuals, whether they be walking down the street or in Jen Ag's case, to her in particular, calling her deplorable names, um, making it so difficult for somebody who's just trying to get their restaurant up and running again to deal with the reality of having people coming and harassing their clients, their customers. That's just not acceptable. So Councillor Cole's motion is, I believe, reflects what Torontonians want us to do. Uh, it asks for clarity about when the police, with all due respect, shouldn't just be standing there, but intervening to protect the peace. Because we saw videos of, of the police standing there and people have asked, like, why, why was that? So let's have clarity. Let's have a clear, a clear understanding of when that intervention takes place. And then lastly, um, the way that Councillor Cole wrote this is one of collaboration, of respect, and really focuses in on what Torontonians are expecting us to do. So again, congratulations, Councillor Cole, for I believe uh, representing a lot of people out there with this motion, and I and I do hope that we support his uh, his request. Thank you. Councillor Holiday to speak. Thank you, Speaker. I just want to take a moment to express my appreciation and gratitude for the work of the Toronto Police Service. Um, these are exceptionally difficult situations. I don't think we on this call or the general public, and I count myself in that, uh, we probably don't understand 1% of the amount of work that goes into uh, planning, policing, these type of activities that go on. Um, and the amount of information that's put into that and data that, that goes behind it. Um, but I think we can all uh, relate to at least a story or two, and I won't repeat them because I, they cast such a negative light of where we were in a crowd uh, where things were about to go bad really fast. Um, you know, think of things, um, big events where, where something bad happened. You know, you mix in uh, drugs or alcohol, or you mix in something that could be turned into a weapon. And it doesn't make the job easy. And I think uh, many members of the police have been doing this as a profession all their life. Um, they understand people. They understand these situations. Um, and I think we need to trust them on, on how they, they work through them uh, because of how these situations can change so quickly. You know, uh, the one thing I have heard in this call, it's not a crime to be obnoxious. Um, there are people that do awful things in this city. They say awful things. But at some point, they do cross the line, and they do become criminal in nature. 
And I really encourage people to call that in and put some trust into the system of response. Um, I think it's really important to make sure that um, we articulate exactly what's going on so that the, the police can assess the situation and get the right resource out there. Um, we all know from experience on any type of a service request like that, that it doesn't always work out, but I, I've always felt in situations um, like these, it's just like, and it's not on the same scale, but when you report somebody that's speeding in a location, you know, we'd love to see a police officer there, write them a ticket right on the spot. But I always take um, some positive um, thinking out of that, that, that the kind of individual that behaves obnoxiously, like some of these examples, is not the first time, it's not the last. Uh, but if enough people keep reporting it and getting the information to the police, eventually they are going to get caught and the price will be high when they're charged for, uh, you know, a crime. Um, so I just, maybe on my message is not only of gratitude for the people that work through this, but just um, people's patience. And um, I think they should do the best they can to use the system that we've got before us because, um, you know, it will add up to something over time and I hope they've got faith in it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Layton, to speak. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I, I think just picking up on one of uh, Councillor Holliday's points about that there, there's a line here between protest and harassment. Um, that uh, I appreciate a delicate one and, and one that may have different definitions for different people on this call based on our background from the deputy chief to to some of us but um look i i was born with a protest sign in my hand maybe some of you were as well uh it, my, my first protest was under 10 years old to 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 help close the commissioner street incinerator before we had blue boxes um went on to to, to protest with family and friends at queen's park at nathan phillips square consulates at company headquarters you name it right um, but this is, there was different. There's, there's, there's differences of opinion and there's a different stance. And then there's at where, where you don't see people, like you see people that are angry, that, that, um, are passionate, that, that are upset, but it doesn't cross that line to harass, randomly harassing people on the street for wearing a mask or yelling at kids in line to get vaccinated and using language in front of young children that uh, that certainly shouldn't be used by uh, uh, by anyone in our community. Um, there, it, it, there's a certain point in time when those individuals cross that line and and it seems to happen with regular and uh, uh, regularly with respect to these anti mask anti lockdown protests. I get calls on a weekly basis. Typically, it, the, the protests rotate around Ward 11, and I know that they, they touch on uh, Councillor Wong Tam's ward as well and Councillor Cressy's. Um, but regularly, of, uh, of threatening behavior, of harassing behavior, uh, and it's indiscriminate. Now, we heard from Councillor Matlow uh, where it was regularly targeting one business for uh, uh, for standing up and saying this is this is what I believe, and hurt her business when she was just trying to get it started back up. Fortunately, the community rose up and went and supported her all the same. Um, verging on dangerous, and and we've let it get to that point that these individuals feel emboldened to go that far because you know despite the fact that charges are late, those same individuals organizing the protest the week before are out at the next protest organizing it again and this is where it comes into play when it starts getting to the point that they're not only um not not only uh, putting themselves at risk by avoiding all public health measures and, and and vaccinations but in fact getting in the way of other people seeking support um we know that there are other times when this has been done around abortion clinics um i think that this is the bare minimum that we would never want to take away don't think that's the case here what we're doing 
is trying to limit the auxiliary damage that these individuals seem not to care about. And they seem to be just doing at, uh, uh, at their own uh, free will. And we have to, uh, at least looking out for some of our most vulnerable, in this case, those going into uh, the hospitals. I would say that earlier this week, there was a protest in front of a school. You know, my kids, I got two little kids in elementary school. I don't want them getting yelled at by anti-vaxxers when they're, when they're wearing their mask walking into their classroom. They shouldn't have to do that. We may have to take this further at some point, unfortunately. I hope that we don't. And I hope that it's quite clear from this, uh, the message that we're sending, uh, both those in bylaw enforcement and police enforcement as well, as, it, uh, as those uh, individuals coming out and harassing others for following public health measures. I hope it's quite clear that we're not gonna tolerate it anymore. Thank you, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'll be brief. Um, number one, I want to start off by commending the men and women of our police service, the great work they do on behalf of our city day in and day out. Councillor Holliday said a lot of uh, what I want to say, but I'll be supporting this motion. Um, I just kind of want to touch on some of the stuff that uh, Councillor Cole brought up and, and the, the poor two gentlemen at the, the Mr. Sub Shop. Um, you know, I invite anybody to call Chief Raymer or the deputy, the good deputy who's on there today, and go on a Friday night down to Councillor Layton, Councillor Cressy, or Councillor Long Tom's ward and go for a ride along. And you'll see those calls come in that the deputy talked about on the screen uh, in the police in the police car and they range a whole gamut of calls that come in so let's just take the two poor men that were getting harassed and at the sub but but let's say there's a domestic violence happening on that takes priority over that call they they take all those calls they put them in a sequence what is more prior to, you know what's the priority and we could have a thousand more officers on the street not that this council would uh, probably let that go through our, our, our massive police budget, but it's still not going to solve the problem. Like Councillor Holliday said, it's, you can't have a cop in every corner giving somebody a ticket. I get calls from my, my neighborhood saying, you know, I called 911. I was breaking into my car in three in the morning. I called, like, they're not there, but I've been out on three ride alongs uh, in the last few years. And I think every councillor should go for a ride along to see what these men and women go through. No one wants to see anybody harassed. I support anything we can do to, to stop that. But um, you know, it's a difficult job these, these uh, men and women have. And you look at this council, if, uh, the 26 of us were all uh, senior officers, we showed up to, uh, on a scene and how we would all handle that situation. You may have 26 different ways how, how, how you would handle it. Uh, Councillor Holliday may handle it different than Councillor Pasternak and Councillor Cole may handle it different than I would. So sometimes it's a call uh, on the scene, but uh, I, I think day in and day out, the men and women do a great job on our behalf. And Remember, these men and women are our neighbors, our friends. They're, they're just normal people like we are. That they just have to wear a uniform. So those are my comments, Madam Chair, but I'm happy to support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tan. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I do have a motion, if the clerk can please put that on the screen, if it's ready. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, and I apologize to the movers of the motion. I didn't have a chance to show it to you beforehand. Um, it was actually, um, I was inspired by some of the, uh, the words from our city solicitor that uh, we should probably engage the province in this process, especially um, as it pertains to recre uh, creating uh, safe access uh, zones around these uh, facilities, the healthcare facilities. Um, I'm not too sure exactly how quickly the province will act because I know they have to, they have to act and it's not like they haven't been asked, I suspect that they have. Um, so I don't also don't want to take away the energy that staff are going to put into uh, recommendation number two, which is to explore whether or not this could be done on our own. Um, I suspect it can because we as a city control and own and manage and operate all, this, all the roads and sidewalks. So somewhere um, within our limited uh, municipal tool box, I suspect we actually have one or two of those tools. Um, Madam Speaker, I just want to say very quickly, um, you know, I would generally agree with uh, Councillor Perks uh, on a whole host of things, um, and especially as it pertains to his concerns about perhaps um, uh, providing a little bit too much uh, reach uh, to the Toronto Police. Um, in this case, I, I'm actually um, going to, to side in, in a different way. Uh, I have seen um, really um, the most horrific uh, display of, uh, of, of, of almost um, terrorism, like mob 
style terrorism take over our downtown streets uh, every single weekend. And, and Madam Speaker, it is really difficult and jarring for the business owners as well as the healthcare uh, workers. And as someone of Asian descent, I can tell you that, you know, there are times within our community, the Chinese community in particular, um, you know, we do not always feel safe walking down um, the, uh, the, the streets with our mask. And, and yet we do it because we're following the health protocols. But there has been a, a very significant targeting uh, of violence and anti-Asian hate crimes. We've seen that rise of, of, of this, this group that has sometimes targeted uh, Asian people. So I want to make sure that we are at least doing everything we can to protect healthcare workers, doing everything we can to protect workers, shopkeepers. Um, and there should be, under no circumstances, should we um, be fooled in thinking that, uh, that we can just let this go. Um, and the reason being is because I don't think that the, um, the, 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 the mob is going to let it go. I don't even want to call them protesters anymore in some cases because I just don't think that they are protesters. Um, they have become, you know, they're, they're white supremacist mobs. And, um, and this is the problem that I'm seeing in the town core. It's not just the freedom of right and the freedom of assembly. It's that they are legitimately coming in, or they're illegitimately coming in, illegally coming in. And I believe they're terrorizing our downtown neighborhoods to the point that people have redirected their walking patterns. I have neighbors that won't leave their, their home in the afternoon. I know that there's certain places I can't push my baby stroller because I might be running into some, some group that is all jacked up on a lot of anger. And, uh, and I know I can't keep my family safe. And that means my neighbors aren't safe. It means my, my, my neighbors who are working in those stores aren't safe. Um, and, and we're hearing about this repeatedly. Um, so thank you very much. Okay, that's it for the speakers. One amendment, we'll put it on the screen. On favor, show of hands, carried on the item as speaker, amended. Speaker, speaker, I'm sorry, but with these with these virtual meetings, it's hard to get in in time. I would like a recorded vote, please. And on the main motion, I would like to split out separately. Okay. So on the amendment, recorded vote. The amendment carries, Speaker. The vote is 19 to 1. Motion. Councillor Perks is asked that we vote on 1 and 2 and 3 and, um, sorry, 1 and 3 and 2 separately. Uh, correct, Councillor Perks? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, so on the motion... Okay, we'll do two first. Recorded vote. Just stand by while we prepare the motion.
Speaker, the uh, part two of the item as amended carries. The vote is 19 to 1. Balance, did you want a recorded vote? Please. Recorded vote. Speaker, the balance of the item as amended carries unanimously. 20 in favor. Is MX MM 36.9, Councillor Holiday, you held the item down. Expanded use of automated speed enforcement. Thank you, Speaker. Questions of staff. Um, okay, just just one moment, Ms. please. Councillor Holliday, you also held down MM 3615, which is to do with speed enforcement as well. Would you like to um, deal with both of them at the same time? I was going to suggest that. My questions really are the same. Okay. So, Councillor Holliday, question, questions to staff. Thank you. Is Ms. Gray uh, available, please? I'm here. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, how many speed enforcement cameras are there in the city? Uh, we have 50. And how many schools? Words. Yep. How many schools do we have? I believe over 800. So by my math, that's uh, about f if it's it's three months per rotation per camera. That's correct. So would that be about four years to rotate all those schools? Uh, that sounds about right. So how come we don't have more cameras? Uh, that's a great question, uh, Deputy Mayor Holliday. Uh, we, the Automated Speed Enforcement Program actually has a lot of parts and pieces to it. Um, it's something that has uh, been authorized as a pilot by the province, and uh, they have authorized us to look at or add speed cameras only in certain areas, so community safety zones around schools. Um, and we also have some other component pieces uh, related to the court uh, and uh, our legal authority to be able to issue uh, tickets related to automated speed enforcement that have to be currently processed through the courts process. Uh, one of the things that uh, Susan Garasino and courts and others are working on right now is to try to get these uh, these um, tickets enforced via the administrative penalty system and we are working actively with the province on doing that. That is a, a pretty significant impact and, and a, a restrictor as to why we can't do more because we need to be able to process the tickets that are issued. So that's, so that's we... sort of the high level overview. So if we found you another, I don't know, $25 million to buy 25 cameras, I'm not saying they're a million bucks, but they're expensive. Um, there's more to it than just the cameras. That is we correct. Need the, we need all the back end infrastructure and that's being thought through. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and Deputy Mayor Holiday, there's also the, um, the Joint Processing Center. So we actually process automated enforcement tickets, both red light camera and automated speed enforcement uh, for the province, for the number of jurisdictions that have signed on to those programs. And we have a number of officers who, uh, who uh, do that review and write those tickets. So you said something about this being a pilot. Um, so the legislation is looking at this, like it's all, it's, it's being enabled by the province, right? It's not that all ours. So what's that relationship? 
Uh, they have authorized us to do uh, a pilot. Uh, they are um, planning on doing an assessment of that pilot. Uh, that review is still pending, and so they will um, they will look to see whether the implementation of the program has been done according to uh, the guidelines. And so we're very um, we're very focused on that, which is why we uh, we do a very specific review about the locations where we will place cameras. And we put them at schools. Why? We put them at schools because the purpose of the of the uh, legislation that the province authorized was to improve and increase safety for school age children and the community at school locations. Safer at School Zones school... Act is the name of the act. It's the Safer School Zones Act. School zones. OK, but but the, theoretically, I guess they could go into community safety zones, or at least that's what this motion is talking about. Is there any parameters to what a community safety zone is? There is. Community safety zones are explicitly set out, and uh, we've done a number of reports to uh, actually define the locations on, on a map of where those community safety zones are in relationship to schools. So it's, a very, specific, it's a very specific uh, uh, determination. Around, but if, but if we expand the definition, could we do something wild and crazy and say, you know, like the whole 416 is a community safety zone? Do we have that power as council? I think uh, there would be some uh, discussion with the province about the implementation of this particular act, the Safer School Zones Act, because I don't think that it's the entire 416 is in, in the uh, spirit of that. I think there right. would have to be an ongoing conversation with the province about expansion of the program to various locations, um, which we're not adverse to having, but I think we have a number of administrative items to get sorted first before we expand the program. And then they will come and do their review, and I think we can engage with them at that time about where we think other locations are where we want to enhance safety using this particular tool. So if we move the goalpost now on the pilot, uh, do you think that would be positively received or negatively received for all the people that are worried about you know, making this a success? We, we we think this is a very successful program. We've uh, we've gotten a lot of good feedback. We're trying very, very diligently to make sure that we are being quite clear and explicit about how it's being rolled out because we, we welcome the province's review and want, want to demonstrate that it's been uh, a very thorough and thoughtfully implemented program. Um, and so I, I think that they would want to complete that review uh, before we went back to them and asked for an expansion. I think we could certainly propose expansion of the program within school zones, but again, as I mentioned, the, the issue right now is getting the administrative penalty system in place so that we can facilitate that uh, without uh, impacting the courts. And finally, um, we've been pretty consistent all through this. This has all been about schools. The way the reports were written, the way that uh, announcements were made, um, really the public's understanding about this whole automated speed enforcement program. It's not necessarily photo radar at large. It was about school zones and the safety and the whole package that goes with the ASC, ASE equipment. Is that fair? a fair assertion about how we've made it to this point? Thank you. Last that question. Fair. Thank you. Councillor Cole, questions? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to uh, the Director of Transportation, uh, just, uh, it is, by the way, it is restricted just to schools. Uh, the legislation is pretty strict on that. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask, uh, how many cameras have we had stolen? I can't hear. The is am I? Can you hear me now? Yes, I yes, can. I can. Hear you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, there's been 169 uh, instances of what what's deemed mischief. Uh, some uh, has have been this, you know spray paint vandalism. Uh, there's been seven instances of theft. I mean, the, the the large balance of them are are vandalism. Uh, and there's been a number that have been t uh, tipped over as well. Um, as you know, Councillor Cole, the program itself is. Um, uh, is done in partnership with a vendor who is responsible to go back and correct those issues as soon as they come up. And we've actually had very good response uh, from the vendor to uh, correct those situations when they come forward. 
can't we make them more secure that they can't walk off with them? And uh, can't we put warning that these are uh, basically public safety devices that uh, vandalism will be treated seriously? Uh, I mean, this is incredible. 169 cases, you say, of vandalism? Yes, the bulk of which are, are you know, tagging. The bulk of which are tagging. So the those that have been impacted in other ways are, are less than 50 locations. But I would agree with you. It's still um, it's still a problem and, a, and an impact on safety uh, equipment. Um, certainly, they are large pieces of equipment. They're not something you would just topple over, you know, without having specific intent. Uh, you'd really have to want to do that to, to turn one of these things over. Uh, but it does happen with these types of programs. And what we found is the best uh, antidote is to just make sure that we're correcting the problem as quickly as possible to deter people from thinking that they're making a significant impact on the problem. The next question is, why aren't there more warning signs that you are approaching uh, a speed camera area? Through the speaker, there are a number of warning signs, and there are also warning signs that go up in advance of when the camera is actually sighted. So we have to put them up 90 days in advance that alert people to the fact that a speed camera will be deployed in that location. And then when we move them, we have to do the next rotation. So there, there are signs that demonstrate that they're there uh, before they go in uh, at an approach. We share that information with uh, with some of our, you know, the vendors who like Waze and those other vendors in Google who um, who do that work. Um, and uh, and they're also signed when they're operational to, to demonstrate to drivers that they're actually on and working. I don't know whether it's just me, but I, I just don't find them significantly signed on the road because uh, don't you think it would be a deterrent in itself if uh, people uh, knew they're entering uh, a speed camera zone? Yes, and, and we follow the province's requirements at or in advance of the locations of the speed, uh, speed camera. So the province's has dictated the sign and the location and the, the time frame duration by which we have to have them in place. So the 90 days that I mentioned previously. Yes, and the other thing is, uh, again, what do we say to people when they say, how come you took my camera away, bring it back? There are, there are a number of locations where, uh, according to the safety data that we've put together, that uh, are eager to have speed cameras. And so we've actually defined uh, a list in every ward, and we've worked with the ward counselor to do that. I also think, and what we've learned from the studies, is that there's a bit of a knock-on effect, so that uh, you still have uh, the effect. When the signs go up to let people know that speed cameras are coming in, it has some dampening effect, uh, as well as after they've been in that location. If there's a location that is particularly uh, troubling or difficult with speed impacts, we would potentially rotate back there again. So there's there's that option, but with only two cameras per ward, we have to be um, we have to be uh, very deliberate about how we deploy them. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lai. Thank you, Speaker, and through you to staff. Um, you mentioned that this is um, due because of the um, the a province project, safety, a safer school zone ads. Just wondered, wondered who is collecting, uh, are the city of Toronto is issuing the tickets. Are we collecting the fines and whose coffer would it be in, in the cities or in the province? Through the, uh, through the speaker to Councillor Lai, I'm actually going to ask Susan Garasino to answer that question uh, from courts, if she would. Yes. Uh, thank you for the question through the speaker to the councillor. Um, the uh, fine revenues are retained by the city. Um, there's a small portion of the fine revenue that's remitted to the province for victim fine pro victim witness programs, but the majority of the money is retained by the city to offset program cost. Do you have an idea how much uh, how much have we collected annually? Um, uh, this will be the first year, 2021. The cameras will be running for 12 months. So for uh, the first six months in the variance report, we, we, uh, we expected revenues approximately $11 million. We met that target for these types of offenses. That's uh, gross revenue. And a uh, year end, we're on target with the budget from these particular offenses uh, for $22 million. But so, again, it offsets program costs for the program. So how much net revenue do you think the city will collect over this uh, this initiative 
I don't, I don't have the full net revenue for this initiative, but I can get back to the council on that because we'd have to factor in all the cost for, uh, for all of the programs that support this initiative from transportation services to legal services and of course courts. And there's uh, several other uh, uh, costs that the city occurs for the court services program, such as buildings and uh, rent. Okay, my last question would be, there will not be any appealing mechanism on the ticket that they, the people received. Is that correct? No, under, uh, currently the regime is under the Provincial Offences Act and people have a right to dispute the charges. The, if they dispute the charges, they can ask for a meeting with the prosecutor, for example, or they can go right to trial. Um, and then if they're not happy with the trial, there's a series of post conviction interventions that uh, continue to work their way through the court system. The administrative penalty system, which council has requested the province to put in place as an option for these types of offenses. Uh, the city has moved their parking violations uh, out of the provincial offenses course and into administrative penalty system. And that's really demonstrated a better customer service and an operational value by removing things from the provincial court system. It gives the public less frustration because they can get uh, a clear decision made fairly quickly um, by city staff and they still have one right uh, to dispute that decision at the city's administrative penalty tribunal. So it's a, a faster system and eliminates a multiple post conviction interventions that increase time to trial for other more serious charges and the administrative penalty system will build capacity in the court system for processing more serious charges. Okay, thank you. Those are very detailed answers. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Those are my questions. Okay, I just want to remind members of council, like it's nine o'clock. So we want to finish this agenda. We have two items left. Okay, Councillor Ainsley, questions? Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, I, I just have one question. Uh, I'm going to start with Ms. Gray. I was just wondering mm -hmm. how we track um, injuries or deaths, um, how these cameras are preventing them. Do we have any, any comparatives yet or? Uh, through the speaker to Councillor Ainsley, thanks for the question. We're actually working with Sick Kids Hospital to do a, um, a an assessment of um, the efficacy of the uh, uh, automated speed enforcement cameras, and I believe we'll be coming back in December with a full report that will uh, will break down that data and will uh, will will give a little bit more detailed information than I could provide for you right at this moment. So that will be, I believe, in December we bring that report back. Okay. And is there any plan on the data being on the city's open data portal? Yes, I believe there is. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Holliday, you just want to move uh, the motion and no. then 30, pardon? <laughs> I, I would like to make a comment, Madam Speaker. I definitely don't want to move those motions. Okay, it's nine o'clock. Councillor Holliday, to speak. I understand. Okay. I, uh, we just- Thank you. Speak quickly. Thank you, Speaker. I will items. not be supporting these motions. I would only suggest that members of council look very carefully at what they say. Um, they are essentially photo radar. And in the questions um, with Ms. Gray, we've been reminded that this is a pilot project and changing the goalpost right now is not necessarily a helpful thing. I would be the first one to find ways to increase uh, more speed enforcement um, I would love to see a motion before us that proposes uh, more traffic officers. We've got great ones out in Etobicoke. Uh, we could use more help uh, and we all get the speeding complaints and I think there is room for a lot more enforcement. Uh, but I think if we were going to be investing in cameras, we've got a lot of schools that need to be looked after still. Um, perhaps we should learn to crawl before we can walk. Uh, and I do take note that some of these suggest even cameras on expressways. Um, places over 80 kilometers an hour. That is not what any of us had talked about. Uh, I will say that collectively. I'm sure others have got different ideas on where photo radar should be. Uh, but I do have a, a big worry about um, changing um, what we're doing, changing lanes, so to speak, at this point in time. I think we should stick with the plan. We should make sure that the system works. We should be looking after our school zones as the first priority. And there are plenty of ways to increase enforcement, uh, including having um, uh, officers out there on the street. 
And uh, I would just be really, really careful with what these things say and the message that council is sending uh, if we choose to support them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Madam Speaker, I planned on calling the question, but as Mayor Tory has added him, I am happy to let him have the last word. Okay, thank you. Mayor Tory. Mayor Tory, we can't hear you. We can hear him. We can hear him. I can't. Or maybe I'm cursed. We can hear him. You can but, hear the mayor. But we can't hear him. I can't hear him. Fix your system there. It, why don't you come and fix it, Councillor Cole? <laughs> Happy to take the chair, right, Madam Speaker. Rather than like. Let's have a real meeting. Room. Get rid of these virtual meetings. Yeah. Well, nobody's stopping you from coming to City Hall. You're welcome. Yeah, we want a real open. meeting, though. I can come to City Hall, but we need a meeting in City Hall, in the chamber. Okay, uh, Mayor, we're, we have to fix. <laughs> Mayor, if you can um, disconnect and then reconnect. We can all hear you, sir. We hear you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> what are we going to do? Say, Here, speak, sir, speak, speak, speak. We can hear you. Speak. No. Okay, but you stop, Madam please. Speaker, the mayor said to move on. We cannot hear in the council chambers. Hey, Madam Speaker, the mayor said you can move on. You just need someone to move the motion. What? He said to move on. The mayor said you can move on because you can't hear him. So you need just someone to move the motion. He said he can move on. The motion. Okay, on members motion 36, MM 36.9, Councillor Holiday. Recorded I'm vote. Yes, I was just going to say that. Recorded vote. Councillor Cole, it appears to us you've not received the vote. So could you state your vote, please? Yes, uh, in the affirmative. Councillor Peruzza, please, your vote. Speaker, the uh, item carries 16 to 4. Yes, uh, and the affirmative. On MM 3615, recorded vote.
Standby members, we're just The voting panel is now open. Councillor Cressy, your vote, please. In favor, thank you. Councillor Cole, how do you vote, sir? In favor. Speaker, the item carries 18 to 1. Okay, if I can ask the mayor if um, he could speak so uh, we can, uh, we know if it's working. Yeah, can you hear, I've logged back on. Can you hear me now, Speaker? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, we couldn't hear you. I know other members of council heard you, but not in the council chambers or on well, YouTube. It's, it's, sorry. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, Speaker? We, uh, yes? Speaker? Yes. Uh, the clerk has a reopening motion quickly that I would hope you could entertain to reopen and add one thing on 36.29. Yes, if we can uh, put that motion, Councillor Fletcher is asking that we reopen MM 36.29 on the planning application and building permit fees for Toronto Community Housing. Okay. Yes, thank you. It's on the screen, on favor. I move that, thank you. Okay carried and then add the other last other one other property there please okay there it is there thank On you the so screen, much 51 Diverton Avenue yes on favor show of hands carried item is amended on favor carried thank you thank you speaker Okay, our next item is MM 3625. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was prepared to release this to Councillor Layton to move his motion. Okay, just one sec. Okay, Councillor um, MM 3618. Yeah. Are there any questions to staff? Okay. On fa uh, we'll vote on the uh, Councillor McKelvey, McKelvey, did you have questions or do you want to speak? Uh, Councillor Layton has a motion to move. Okay, Count, uh, Councillor Layton. Let's put yes, Councillor Layton. Let's put Councillor Layton's motion on the screen so we can vote on it. The, the motion revises recommendation one to read: City Council requests the General Manager of Transportation Services to ensure the scope of work for the Avenue Road North of Bloor Street West evaluates. The Avenue Road Safety Coalition's complete streets concept and explores options to expedite uh, the implementation, including a pilot project. Uh, this motion, um, there's there's two 
I think, three contributing factors to this motion. One was a contractor of the cities that improperly installed their um, construction staging along Bloor Street, which prompted an outcry from the community because all of a sudden the lane abruptly ended with, uh, with the lanes merging into absolutely no warning in a very dangerous fashion. And then shortly after, um, it, or days after, at that location around the corner uh, with the university bike lane ends, there was a tragic incident which involved an 18 year old out for a bike ride, six o'clock by uh, in a 6 p.m. bike ride uh, just around the neighborhood, uh, and he was hit and killed. And um, the family would like some answers. The family would like to know if there's anything that we can do. Uh, and there is, and we know that. We know how to make our streets safer. It's not rocket science. Um, and our, our staff had previously been given um, a recommendation to examine this stretch. And what we're saying here is, can we expedite that work at all uh, to look at a very fast stretch of road in the downtown core that's surrounded by a growing neighborhood with tens of thousands of new units coming on, on stream, very narrow sidewalks along the sections of Avenue Road, particularly uh, north of Bloor on the west side, but also that stretch quite far north. Uh, it's a very dangerous section of road and we would like uh, staff to move quickly and uh, perhaps through by way of pilots like we've had a tendency to do in the past uh, in the past couple of years uh, on, on, on roads like these. Um, so we're hoping that uh, you'd see fit to um, have us ask to expedite it and um, see what we can do in the longer term on some of the other issues that contributed to uh, what was a very scary time at the corner of University and uh, and Avenue Road and recently. I would also add that um, the community on their own volition hired an architecture firm that put together a rather elaborate proposal for uh, for this section of road. They're under no um, they're under uh, no assumptions that we're going to be able to do this overnight, but they wanted to try to provide a vision uh, for the road. It's quite beautiful. It, 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 it changes what what reads now as kind of a highway through the downtown core into more of uh, an inviting space for 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 different users of the uh, of of the road and the uh, and the sidewalks, uh, but does maintain a uh, traffic movement through the intersection. We're not moving ahead or committing to that here. We would like city staff to evaluate that as part of the larger project that you have already uh, supported at council. So thank you very much for entertaining this. Okay. Well, um, we have questions for you, Councillor Fletcher. Three minutes. Councillor Fletcher. I just have, thank you. I just have one question for you, Councillor Layden. Um, have you had a chance to ask the uh, staff if, when they're contracting, that within the RFP or the tender, there's very clear instructions regarding roadworks, regarding where the pylons are going, and requirements to keep the road in a certain with with certain space, etc. Have you investigated that at all? You seem my, understand, my, my understanding is that there is, and, and this particular firm that was on Bloor Street, so un, unrelated to the, to, to the young man's death, um, but this particular firm was cited uh, for an infraction uh, and a breach of their contract. Um, I, I, it was years ago that we first started undertaking this proposal. I think it was a motion for me at, 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 in, in, at um, Environment and or uh, infrastructure uh, committee uh, years ago that started that. My understanding is that they're in there, um, but it's a it's a, an issue that persists. It happens around the city. Uh, have uh, you ever seen the wording? Just aren't. Have you seen I, the wording? Has the yeah, committee not, seen the wording that goes I, in the tender document? I have not. I, I have I have not seen the wording, but it looks it. It seems to me that my motion will cover that. Would you think that would come to I and E where? You would have oversight of what the wording looks like currently and if it is strong enough or clear enough or broad enough? The request is for that it come to i &E December 2nd. Yes, that's for Avenue year. Road. I'm talking about just generally now. So that the, the, the second, part, the second okay. part of the motion is, is, is more generally. We're okay. asking questions on clarification on of the motion. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, question on the motion, clarification, three minutes. Of course. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the Avenue Road Safety Coalition's requests, um, that's a separate um, 
list is one of the requests to change the traveled lanes into extended sidewalks? Yes. Okay, so it's a narrowing of lanes, just so members of council know, because we, we're not all familiar with uh, the, the, all of the, the requests from the coalition. Thank you. Yes. Councillor Matlow to speak. Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, Councillor Layton for moving the motion. Um, we're working very closely together, given that we share um, share border between uh, two parts of one community. And um, you know, even before the the tragic incident that Councillor Layton referred to, um, there have been conversations going on uh, for several years now with members of the community, whether it be residents. Uh, public schools, churches, retirement residents, um, you know, members of the community that have expressed great concern about the safety of Avenue Road. Any of us who are um, familiar with Avenue Road knows that uh, it really acts like a highway uh, 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 much, of, much of the day. Um, uh, people are speeding uh, routinely uh, down, down the hill. Uh, the sidewalks that uh, the councillor Layden referred to uh, are incredibly narrow, uh, and at times there are hydro poles actually in the middle of that that narrow sidewalk. Um, and um, so the community for a long time has been asking for uh, for something to change to make it safer. And in fact, there's even been discussions between you know community members. What does that look like? Uh, should there be bike lanes? Should there be wider sidewalks? What what is the answer? And that's why we've been working with our professional transportation staff to, to arrive at the best solution. Um, but it's taken a long time. And that's why the Avenue Road Safety Coalition, I believe, undertook um, to commission Brown and Story to come up with, you know, work with them on proposing a vision to really spur us into action. And I really appreciate that effort because I, I think it's really helpful. Um, the outcome obviously needs to be considered and discussed as a council, but we really do need city staff to continue to work with us along with the residents to address ongoing and very valid concerns. Um, so you know, I look forward to continuing that. And I want to thank Barbara Gray and 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 Michelle and, and all, all of their staff uh, for working with us uh, so well along with our community. And I look forward to uh, further conversations about exactly how we're going to make Avenue Road the safest road it can be as we have this council has many other streets throughout the city and you know people along avenue are just saying why not us you know what why have we not been why have, uh, why haven't our concerns being addressed as well as others and this is this is their opportunity and i really appreciate all of your support for that okay on the amendment on favor recorded vote recorded vote recorded vote Councillor Cole, how do you vote, sir? In the affirmative. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Speaker. The amendment carries. The vote is 17 to 2. Speaker, on a point of order, may I request a recorded vote on the clauses amended only on item number one?
Yeah, Councillor Holliday, we just voted on number one. We deleted it. Thank you. So it was voted on as amended. Thank you. No, the item item one we voted on, that was the amendment. Madam Speaker, my, my advice to you is you can't split out item number one to vote on it again because you just voted on item number one. So the next vote would be item as amended. So item as amended, recorded vote. Councillor Mantis, would you enter your vote, please? Councillor Mantis, would you please enter your vote? Councillor Cole, how do you vote, sir? Affirmative. Thank you. Speaker, the item is amended carries. The vote is 17 to 2. Okay. So we'll now go to MM 36.25. So, uh, if, I, if I may ask point of order, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, is it, do we have a, a member of the Toronto Police Service here to answer questions? No, we don't. We tried. They are not available because the motion did not mention the police board and their presence was not requested in advance, so they're not here. I did mention the police, though. Um, okay, I will proceed without them, but it would have been helpful to have them here. On the item. So I have questions. Councillor, Councillor Matlow, question. If you can put your name on yes. the screen. Oh, I, given that I held the item, I didn't realize I had to. Would you prefer that I do? Well, you should still put your name on the screen. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so through you to city staff, what is the, what is the protocol um, when engaging the Toronto Police Service on an action that, that, that may involve uh, violence? What is, the, what is the formal city protocol on that? So if I can, and speaker, you may want to hold uh, the councillor's time. So with us on this item, is uh, Tracy Cook and Tracy can speak to that specific question, but I just want members of the council to know Gord Tanner is here acting in Marianne Bedard's capacity as well as uh, Brad Ross in terms of anything that we've communicated to the media and obviously myself. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, M Mr. Murray, my time is still going. And, no, and it shouldn't be. I, I've asked yeah. if, if it's possible to hold it. I just want to make sure that everyone knows that staff are ready to answer all your questions. Yeah. So. Madam Speaker, so, would you mind just resetting that? Yeah. So, uh, Tracy, if you can answer the specific question that the Councillor raised. Certainly, thank you. Through you, Madam Speaker, uh, Councillor Matlow, our engagement with the Toronto Police Service is on an ongoing basis. Uh, in the case of the matter before you today, uh, we engaged the police to ensure public safety was maintained while city staff were undertaking the uh, activities they were tasked to do we do we have a protocol though we don't have a drafted protocol specifically we have ongoing engagement the toronto police service in this particular instance has been a member of our interdivisional steering committee dealing with encampments since may of last year 
I asked um, I asked uh, the deputy earlier on Councillor Cole's motion regarding the uh, anti-vax protests, uh, regarding sort of the threshold and sort of you know when when do we intervene and when do we not? So 